Good morning, everyone. Did I get your attention with that? Or <laughs> welcome to uh, welcome to our board of supervisors meeting, um, at our special meeting uh, for Tuesday, April second, twenty twenty four. We will have the uh, pledge to the flag by Supervisor Gustafson, please. Good morning. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to start right away with our 9 a.m. item is our fiscal year 2024-25 departmental budget presentations. Take it away, Daniel. Good morning, Chair Jones and members of the board. I'm Daniel Chatney with the County Executive Office. I'm pleased to be here uh, for day one of two days of department budget presentations for our fiscal year 24-25 budget process. So I heard a comment earlier this morning that was surprised that we were already at budget time. Um, but on this slide up here, we're just reminding everybody, this is really a year-round, almost a year-round process for, for the county and the county staff combined. As we start the, the, real, the development process in November every year with the Board of Supervisors budget workshop, immediately then we're creating our internal service fund budgets. We release our base budgets to departments early in January every year. And then but by March or the first week of March, all department budgets are submitted to the county executive office. Today, we're doing our department budget presentations. And then after tomorrow's presentations of the same, we will be meeting um, with the board members to review budget requests, finalize the recommended budget over the months of April and May, and then expect to come back before your board on June 11th for our public hearing to consider the fiscal year 24-25 recommended budget. And then two weeks later, we will bring back the budget for adoption on June 25th. Back on November 7th, we did our bu uh, budget workshop with the Board of Supervisors. The objectives out of that were the same um, as they were the previous year, but it was to fund current services, prepare for our increasing staffing needs to maintain our service levels, take care of the capital that we have, and then prepare for new capital needs. We asked the Board for direction to appropriate general fund transfers uh, as requested, to balance budgets to new revenue, to continue our pension funding strategy, continue the tiered budget submission process, and continue to set budgetary salary savings rates based on historical vacancy rates. So this is a, a slide just kind of uh, recapping our general fund, uh, fund balance. Um, you can see in fiscal year 22-23, we were at about 177 million. Uh, we are projecting in current fiscal year, fiscal year 23-24, to add about 20 million or so of fund balance to that. And that'll just be net revenues over expenditures based on our current projections. And then you'll see another drop off going into fiscal year 24-25 and what we're, what we're planning for the budget at that point, um, which would be the use of, designed use of fund balance for capital projects, et cetera. Uh, also, during the mid-year update, uh, we talked about the, the, the miscellaneous financial considerations that we are, are looking at and dealing with as, as far as putting forward this 24-25 budget. So again, inflationary pressures, uh, labor negotiations, our pension and OPEB, uh, long-term liabilities, our capital debt service, and cash contributions to capital projects, all while we're seeing a flattening of sales-related taxes. So at this point, we will go into kind of a preliminary view of the 24-25 working budget. And to do that is Dan Vick, um, who is on our budget team, is our budget administrator, is stepping in and stepping up to take over the rest of the presentation um, for the, the department overview for this morning.
Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Daniel Vick with the County Executive Office, and I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the fiscal year 24-25 department budget presentations and the department submitted budget. Um, as a note, the department submitted budget is also referred to uh, as the working budget all throughout this presentation and in the individual uh, department budget presentations because it is still a draft budget. And all budget figures for the working budget are as of March 1st, 2024. And so just to kick it off, starting in the second to the left column for county operating funds, the fiscal year 24-25 working budget was submitted at $1 billion, $75 million. This represents a $73.2 million increase over the current year, fisc uh, current year adopted budget. Um, the increase in county operating funds is primarily attributable to a $32 million increase in salaries and benefits, which is about uh, a 7.5% increase across all county operating funds. A $31 million increase in services and supplies, and that's going to be mostly professional service contracts. And then an $11 million increase in other financing uses, which is primarily going to be contributions from the general fund to other operating funds. Um, capital and run fu road fund budgets, uh, as of the department submitted budget, have decreased by $70.6 million. Um, these budgets are still, were still in development at that point in time, but any uh, decrease or increase in um, capital and road fund budgets is going to be due to timing of expenditures of major facilities and infrastructure projects. County proprietary funds. Um, were submitted at $186.5 million. This is a $22 million increase over the current year adopted budget. The increase in proprietary funds is primarily attributable to a $13 million increase in services and supplies, and that's gonna be mostly um, insurance premiums and um, expenses for anticipated settlements in the risk management department jail medical contracts and jail food services contracts. There is also a $3 million increase in salaries and benefits in proprietary funds and a $5 million increase in capital expenditures and that's mostly due to TARP bus purchases. Uh, county CSAs and special districts were submitted at just under $55 million. It's a nearly a $14 million increase over the current year adopted budget. Most of that increase is due to uh, the Placer One and Sunset Sewer Project that's fu funded by ARPA funds moving from the capital fund um, in this current year budget to a CSA budget. Okay, so for funded positions, um, as of March 1st, funded positions total 2,904 positions across the county. Uh, which is an increase of 35 positions from the current year adopted budget last June. Um, you can see the individual increases in each department listed in this table um, here, but as a reminder, all of these uh, position increases have been discussed with the board in the quarter one and quarter two allocation update, and will also be uh, gone over again in detail in the individual department budget presentations if you have any questions on those. So we want to talk a little bit about what's included in the department submitted budget as of March 1st. So the department submitted budget did include property tax growth assumed at 5%. We've updated our sales tax figures in the budget uh, per our most recent forecast. We've adjusted general fund contributions to other major operating funds in the county, primarily a contribution to the public safety fund that increased um, by $15 million for fiscal year 24-25. We've um, included all major adjustments known for existing contracts, such as the gathering in and indigent defense contracts, both of which reside in the general fund for fiscal year 24-25. We've included all personnel allocations through quarter two, approved by the board. We've adjusted personnel drivers for known MOU impacts, included existing debt service, primarily for the HHS building and the general fund 
and assumed the continuance of all other county operations. Um, just as a reminder, um, as of March 1st, the general fund was in a deficit fund balance position of $7 million that our office is working um, on still resolving through the budget process. So, Yeah, you can ask questions, questions as you go. Mm -hmm. What were the updated uh, numbers for uh, sales tax? Uh, this, I mean, as far as the percentage. The percentage? Well, for fiscal year 24 25, the sales tax figures were coming in relatively um, flat. Yeah. Assuming it doesn't get changed. Uh, I think it's down slightly. Supervisor Gustafson, we, we adjusted the public safety public safety sales tax down uh, because we are seeing that trend come to fruition. As far as regular sales tax, we've left that flat. Okay, so, so no growth. No problem. Right. Okay, as a reminder, a little bit about what's not included in the budget. Just as of March 1st, this is not a final budget yet. Um, we have not included uh, open space funding in the amount of $1.5 million. We have not included um, ma approved management salary adjustments that were about $830 estimated annually. We've removed um, a general fund reserve uh, for sick leave payouts um, that we just held in reserve in the general fund in case there was any uh, major large sick leave, ba sick leave balances that needed to be paid for departments for um, employees separating for the county. No uh, department supplemental requests have been considered or approved yet in uh, the department submitted budgets, and we have not adjusted the, the contingency amount that we include in the general fund, which is the 1.5% the of um, operating expenses that we, we keep in case of um, unanticipated impacts. Uh, as a reminder, um, in the mid-year update, we did offer the, the board a few alternatives to fund um, open space funding, um, such as utilizing year-end fund balance from the current year as a one-time contribution towards the open space fund, or um, just con canceling general fund reserves as projects or properties are identified for open space. And we can come back to the board at any time to do that as well. So as previously noted, we are working to resolve the $7 million uh, deficit as um, a priority in our office. Just, just kind of as frame of reference, um, a $7 million deficit is relatively small deficit for the general fund. The general fund expenditures are $440 million um, for fiscal year 24-25, so I don't want to raise too many alarm bells. but. Um, some of the potential adjustments that we're considering to resolve that deficit is updating our assumed property tax uh, growth rates to 6% for fiscal year 24-25. That would add an additional $2.4 uh, $2 million in um, general fund discretionary revenue sources. Um, we, we feel confident making that uh, adjustment because um, we're working with the assessor's office to monitor the tax assessment roll growth. And currently, so far in the fiscal year, it's trending about 1% lower than the previous fiscal year, which was about 7% growth. Uh, some other uh, potential adjustments that we're considering at this point in time is reducing major maintenance funding to facilities by $2 million. Uh, this is uh, related to the VFA study that you heard pr uh, previously. What, one of the reasons um, we're considering doing this, as you might recall, the general fund did give facilities an additional $5 million in the current year um, towards major maintenance for a total of $9 million. And so um, we feel pretty confident, or we've been working with facilities and identified that they can use uh, current year fund balance towards those projects to continue um, working on the major maintenance for fiscal year 24-25. Uh, the Assessor's Pro West software is included in the department's submitted budget. That amount is $930,000. Um, it's uh, a short-term uh, contract for that software, so it will be funded for uh, with general fund reserves. 
And then the remaining deficit we're expecting to make up with just adjustments to department expenditure and revenue budgets as we do their review. So after that preview of the high level um, overview for the department submitted budget, uh, we want to get a little bit into the department supplemental request that you'll be um, reviewing over the course of the next couple of days. So department sup supplemental request that you'll hear about total $16.6 .6 million for fiscal year 24-25, of which about $7.7 .7 million will be um, requested to be funded with additional general fund. The department supplemental request include a request for an additional 69 and a half funded FTEs countywide. And of the $16.6 .6 million, about $1.8 million would be one-time uh, funding request and $14.8 million would be ongoing requests that would be uh, included in all subsequent budgets moving forward. Uh, for the general fund component of those requests, about $1.4 million is one time in nature and $6.4 million would be ongoing. And um, so, you know, in light of the, the budget picture that we painted for you today, um, if you do have any supplemental requests that are priorities of the board or that you would like to give your feedback uh, on as we go through these presentations, we'd greatly appreciate it. Okay, and now I'll give you just a brief preview of uh, the format for the department slides that you'll be seeing in these presentations. Our office has worked to make the department uh, presentation slides uniform in nature to help facilitate the discussion on the budget. The first slide of which you'll be seeing is a departmental budget org structure. Uh, as a note, this is not a personnel org structure for the department. It's uh, simply just going to be the department's name, the cost centers of each department, and the programs for, for each cost center. So you can kind of see the budgets, overall budget structure for each department. The departments um, will give a slide to discuss their accomplishments um, achieved during the year using budgetary resources. Uh, they'll be able to detail the emerging issues and departmental priorities for the department that may impact this budget period and future budget periods moving forward and give a brief overview of their objectives and performance measures that might be uh, relevant or pertinent to the budget. The expenditure budget for each department will be broken out um, for you to see uh, by operating expenditure, expenditures and capital expenditures, so you can see the distinction between those two categories. And then um, the fiscal year 24-25 budget will also be compared, or revenue expense, spends, re revenues and expenditures for the fiscal year 24-25 budget will be compared to the current year adopted budget and prior two years of actuals, so you can see the overarching trend line um, for, for each department's budget. As a note, once again, these tables are still going to be uh, using working budget figures as of March 1st, uh, 2024, and some adjustments may have already been made to these department budgets subsequently. Following that table, the departments will detail their major variances that should kind of help explain that story in both expenditures and revenues. They'll give a, uh, a brief overview of their hi historical approved funded positions and talk about any changes in those positions over time. And then finally, um, go over each one of their supplemental requests for your review, if you have any feedback on those again. And that's it for me. Did you have any questions on any of that information? No. Great. No. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> While I'm still sitting here, I would just like to invite the first department up for their presentation. So we'll welcome Sheriff Wayne Wu uh, to present for the Placer County Sheriff's Office. Okay. Welcome, Sheriff. Good morning. Good morning.
Daniel, thank you for your time today. Um, pleasure to be here, kicking things off, I suppose, for what's going to be a long two days for all of you. Um, but I want to thank Daniel and his team, Amanda, everybody at the CEO's office that's not only helped us, you know, navigate this process, but, uh, you know, has helped us throughout the entire fiscal year to get us where we are today. So for... Uh, for our presentation, I'll turn it over to our administrative services manager, uh, Jerry Rogers, and then I'll take back over midway. So take it away, Jerry. All right. Good morning, board. Okay, here. Here we have the sheriff's office uh, budget, and under these, under the sheriff's office budget, we have seven cost centers, and they consist of the grant program, Tahoe operations, protection and prevention, administration, support services in Auburn Jail and the South Placer Jail. And under those cost centers uh, are roughly around a little over 40 programs uh, throughout those. And they are supported by the public safety uh, sales tax, AB 109 realignment, as well as uh, general fund contribution of which is 51% of discretionary revenue, which we share a portion of uh, that along with DA and probation. And then down at the bottom, you'll see the DMV special collections fund. That is a fiduciary, we're a fiduciary agent for that DMV collection fund, so historically it has been just unbalanced, and um, I'll make note of it in a couple other slides. And then new to the, uh, the structure here is the inmate welfare fund. So re uh, recently it was transitioned from a custodial uh, fund for, uh, down to a special revenue fund, and that was to realign with uh, AB, or I'm sorry, with Gatsby 84, and so for our fiduciary activities. And so I will move over here to the next one. And here we have operating expenditure budget for 194 million. That basically consists of 70% or 134 million is for salaries and benefits. And then we have about 25% or roughly around 48 million, which consists of A87 ISF charges, as well as uh, mm -hmm. services charges like WellPath and uh, Summit contracts for the corrections facility. And then which leaves about 5%, which is just under about $9 million for day-to-day -day operations. And then we have the capital expenditure budget, which is about $2.3 million. Of that consists of about $1.7 million for vehicle replacement and also mild out vehicles. That's due to the, uh, per the DSA MOU. And then also included in that is about $300,000 for grant-related communication equipment. And then also about $200,000 for uh, air ops equipment as well. And then here we have the revenue and expense comparison. As you can see in 23-24 adopted budget, it does show a little bit of a variance between uh, expenditures and revenue. We did submit a balanced budget, but because we have those two uh, special funds, those the, the DMV uh, collection fund and also the IWF, that's also included in this. And because historically it's been unbalanced, that's why it's a little bit um, off where expenditures are a little bit higher than revenues. And that goes for the same for 24-25. We did submit a balanced budget, uh, but because those are also included, that's why it's a little um, off on that one. And then the variance, the major variance that you can see between the 24 adopted budget to the 24-25 working budget is roughly around 17 million. And that pretty much consists of due to the salaries and benefits increases for the DSA and the uh, correction officer wage increases, and as well as the increased contracts for uh, WellPath. And here, as I mentioned, for the uh, major budget variances, this will kind of give you a little bit of a breakdown as to those uh, variances from the prior year. You can see about 13.4 million increase for salaries and benefits, and that was attributed to the DSA and the correctional officer wages. And then we have a 4.1 million increase for professional and special services health, which is the increase to WellPath contract for jail medical services. And then we have a $1.3 million uh, decrease to state aid public safety sales tax. And when you put those together, that's where you can see the $18.4 million increase from the contribution from the general fund, which is the portion of the 51% uh, percent of discretionary general fund revenue, which is allocated to the public safety. And here for the funded positions, major changes from 23-24 adopted to the 24-25 working there was one uh, FTE, which was the sheriff sergeant position, which will be mentioned later on in the presentation uh, due to the uh, fentanyl crisis. And I believe.
believe that concludes my presentation for Can budgetary purposes. Quick question? Yes, oh, please. yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, no, it's my, um, again, on sales tax, I'm just interested in any projections or thoughts moving forward on the public safety portion of the sales tax. Have you heard from your counterpart, Sheriff Wu, or others, um, as we look at this, what we can anticipate moving forward? Is this a trend we're going to continue to see? I know it's crystal balling, but. Yeah, I would probably defer to Daniel's team okay. and the county executive's office for that. Okay. I mean, we did okay. see a unique spike, I think, uh, through the pandemic. Right. And then I think you're starting to see the, the return to normalcy and, and the flattening out of those funds uh, with jurisdictions like Placer County who remained open for business during those times. Um, whether it continues to trend down or not, I, I, I or whether this is defer. A, you know, is it more stable now or not? Yeah. <clears throat> Supervisor Gustafson, and thank you, Sheriff. Um, your answer was spot on. You know, during COVID, we saw a spike, uh, a significant spike increase in revenue. Um, during those times, we uh, worked alongside the Sheriff's Office to preserve those funds in reserves, uh, which we're using um, today and, and throughout the last year or two and into the future for capital project needs uh, for the Sheriff's Office. Um, what we have seen is the reopening of some of the major sales tax uh, areas like Anaheim, San Diego, San Francisco, which is decreasing our share of the pooled sales tax. Right. So while sales tax receipts may stay on par where they have been, our share of it has decreased. Um, so until something switches in that dynamic of the county taking a higher share of direct sales tax revenue, I think we would expect to see our portion at least staying flat, but maybe a possible to continue slight decrease as well. So. Right. so this should be the final year of any downward trend and we should be stabilizing at least, it, as, unless there's a, yeah. Yeah, it, it, and that depends. Catastrophic. Yeah, that's all. That's all built on the allocation um, percentage that we're that we're given. So anything can cause an adjustment. CDTFA is now adjusting almost on a monthly basis now the the allocation percentages rather than just doing it once a year. So we're seeing these trends change monthly, um, slightly, um, you know, small smaller increases. But so I, I would expect that maybe the any decrease would be smaller. Mm -hmm. um, and not larger than it had been. So okay, sorry. Okay. Just trying to get a handle on where you know we knew this was coming, but how how much more could we see change? Okay, thank you. All right, um, I, I would like to add too that when uh, we did work with Daniel and his team through that time. Uh, we did, you know, start our capital asset replacement fund. We utilized it for capital improvement projects, and we really tried to focus on uh, one-time expenditures, knowing that it wasn't going to be a consistent revenue stream uh, when we saw those spikes. So I'll take back over and uh, go over I, some of our highlights and accomplishments over the last fiscal year. I think uh, one of the first ones I'd like to talk about is really our ability to uh, embrace and leverage technology uh, as a force multiplier to help keep Placer County safe. And that was uh, re really a regional collaboration with all of our police partners in uh, rolling out some technology with some companies, uh, Flock and Fusis. Um, with the regional partnership, we can share information uh, throughout each of our departments, which um, is nice when it comes to working together. Uh, as you know, criminals don't understand jurisdictional boundaries, so it's nice to be able to share that data with all of our criminal justice partners in the county. Um, and then the FUSIS technology really is going to help us leverage uh, standing up what would be right now almost like a real-time crime center in every patrol car that the deputies have at their fingertips. Some of the successes we've already had this fiscal year with rolling out this technology is um, multiple arrests of uh, the South American theft groups that have been targeting Placer County, specifically uh, areas of Granite Bay in the unincorporated areas of the county. And we're responsible for well over 30 uh, residential burglaries, totaling well over a million dollars in loss. Um, and thanks to this technology, we've been able to make multiple arrests of this international crime ring. Uh, we also had a homicide um, out at the uh, ACE Hardware Center 
off industrial that we were able to solve and have somebody in custody within hours of the incident occurring thanks to this technology. Uh, as many of you know, we stood up a real-time crime center for the World Cup to provide security. And during that incident, we did have a lost child and uh, the real-time crime center was able to locate and reunify that child within minutes of uh, receiving the call utilizing that technology. So that was pretty exciting. And then uh, we're in the final stages of finalizing some MOUs with all of the high schools within the unincorporated areas of the county that will tie in with that FUSIS platform um, and give our deputies access and real-time information as they respond to the scene, uh, heaven forbid if there's any kind of critical incident at any of our schools. Uh, so I'm really excited about those programs. And moving on, one of the other things that I'd like to highlight is, as you know, uh, we have a pretty robust vocational program uh, in our jails that we uh, will be improving and expanding upon over this next fiscal year. But during this current fiscal year, one of the uh, areas I'd like to highlight is our culinary program. Um, we started that from scratch with our vendor during the pandemic. Uh, it did not exist anywhere in the country. We've had a lot of success with that program to include uh, working with some businesses that want to be second chance employers. Some of you may have seen uh, a local restaurant in Rockland, Catherine's Beer Garden, who has partnered with us and um, has had some great success with some inmates coming out of that program and, and giving them the opportunity to turn their lives around. We've also uh, partnered with a company called Treo out of Sacramento. They're a large warehouse commercial um, culinary operation that provides foods to other businesses, hospitals, things like that. And they uh, have been doing interviews on site once these inmates receive the certification and, and having job offers um, before these inmates are released. So they have jobs lined up right when they get released from custody. One of the exciting things uh, looking forward for this next fiscal year is um, expanding on the inmate programs and adding a vocational uh, training manager or supervisor. That'll be a professional staff civilian position that we want to add within the sheriff's office as uh, I'll talk about in a little bit. Our 844 um, project, which was the 120 bed medium security job skill training center is slated to uh, be done in the spring of 2025. And uh, we really think having somebody uh, that's not an auxiliary assignment as a correctional officer that's just in charge of programming and really tracking recidivism rates and making sure we're being responsible with the programs and the resources uh, that have the most impact on, on these inmates and their future as they return to society. Um, the positive news for that is uh, we're going to pay for that uh, strictly out of the inmate welfare fund. So there shouldn't be any budgetary impact. Um, the inmate welfare fund is um, through profits we gain through the inmate phone services, food services, uh, other things like that. And we're going to turn around and put that money right back into the inmate education program. And so we'll try to add that position over this next upcoming fiscal year. And moving on, I'd, uh, another accomplishment I think it's worthy of calling out is, is really our, our recruitment and our hiring efforts over the last year. A lot of our success is thanks to your board and uh, finalizing some contracts with the Deputy Sheriff's Association and the correctional officers and, and making us competitive in the region, so thank you for that. Another uh, piece of technology that we brought on board is All-Star Talent and Recruitment Company, which is really a specialized uh, digital marketing company, uh, which is, uh, in my opinion, the future of where employment is. You know, gone are the days of the want ads in the newspaper. And uh, really, the success we've had with that program has exceeded all of our expectations, including the company's data that they've uh, utilized with other law enforcement agencies. Um, we've had a better turnaround with application rates I think, you know, dispatch, as you know, has been a position we've had a very difficult time hiring for, even getting applicants for. Um, they have what they call leads. Uh, we've had well over a thousand leads, and I think the conversion percentage into applications is around 27%. So we have hundreds of applicants for our dispatch position um, by utilizing this technology and not having to offer uh, hiring bonuses and some other things that you see some other jurisdictions. Uh, doing. So these two side-by-side -side snapshots are really about this time last year, 
compared to this time this year. So you can see the stark contrast. Uh, Deputy sheriffs, we were running 25 vacancies last year when we came for our budget hearing, and we're down to three now. Uh, correctional officers, 17, that's down to three. Administrative legal clerks were 13, it's down to eight. And then we currently have a lot of people in the hiring process. Uh, so you can see the deputy sheriff trainee numbers, and, and these numbers were as of a couple of weeks ago when we had to submit uh, them to the county executive's office to put the presentation together. But the deputy sheriff one, two, that one is really a deputy sheriff one who would have put themselves through the academy. So in 2023, we didn't have a single lateral applicant apply to the sheriff's office. Uh, much of that was due to contract disputes and other things. Um, I'm proud to say that so far year to date, um, you know, in early April, we've had eight laterals apply to the sheriff's office and we have three more applicants uh, in the queue at County HR just waiting to be certified and sent over to the sheriff's office for interviews. And um, our under sheriff uh, is scheduled to interview on top of these numbers, 11 uh, candidates next week to go to the academy as deputy sheriff trainee. So very proud of um, the progress we've made and how hard Jerry's team and, and the whole team at the office has worked to overcome some of these uh, staffing issues that we've had. Uh, moving on, another accomplishment highlight I'd like to talk about is our opioid response team. Here's some uh, current fentanyl statistics as of about a week or two ago. Uh, the bluish uh, line is the arrest that we've made uh, year over year. So you can see that trend line continue up. Now those are just arrests from sheriff's office personnel. It doesn't count other uh, police partners and it doesn't include some of our narcotics units or narcotics task forces. And then the red line is our overdose deaths year over year. So you can see we're trending to uh, still once again uh, increase year over year. Last year was 43. This year we're currently at 45 confirmed fentanyl overdoses and two cases are still pending, um, waiting for toxicology results. Yes, hey, Supervisor Gordon. I want to ask a quick question. Yeah. Um, thank you. And so the, the um, overdose death, that's countywide regardless of jurisdiction, but the the blue line is the sheriff's office arrests, correct? Correct. So if you added arrests from the PDs in our cities, that number's probably higher. Far higher, yes. Um, but that's really good news to see that number is not trending up. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I'm really excited about is our, our partnership with, uh, you know, District Attorney Geyer behind me and, and his office and his willingness to, uh, you know, prosecute these cases in a way maybe they hadn't been looked at or prosecuted in the past. Every one of those prosecutions has been the result of an investigation of one of our sheriff's detectives. And thanks to, uh, you know, Daniel and his team and your board's support, this coming uh, Saturday the 6th, we'll be going live with our opioid response team full time. That detective that's put the, together those cases, he's assigned to a narcotics task force. It's not his full time job to investigate these style of investigations with a fentanyl overdose and basically complete a homicide or a manslaughter type investigation and he's being pulled different directions and he does not have the resources or the capacity and time to dedicate uh, to these overdose investigations like we would like to see. So we'll have a couple of full-time bodies um, assigned there this Saturday. That was the one increase that you saw on our full-time employee allocations that have increased this fiscal year. And then we'll be reaching out. I know uh, District Attorney Geyer is going to add some resources, and some of our police partners have expressed some interest in adding some resources to this team as well. They've done a phenomenal job. And uh, I, I can say I just talked to one of our narcotics detectives within the last week or two. And specifically, they brought up not only this team um, and the opioid response team, but Placer County as a whole. Um, and talking to some confidential informants who had said they've talked to at least two known dealers from outside of our jurisdiction that have said they will refuse to uh, peddle this poison in our community because of uh, Placer County's approach, the resources that we've dedicated, and knowing that this team is in place and that they could be held accountable in a way that other jurisdictions are not. So very proud of our partnership with the District Attorney's Office and the impact we've had. In fact, as we speak right now, we have uh, NBC National News is at our office doing a story specifically on Placer County and how we've addressed the fentanyl crisis that's going to air nationwide. 
Unfortunately, fentanyl is not something that is just isolated to uh, our community. It's also uh, found its way in our correctional facilities. Um, so combating uh, in fentanyl in our corrections facilities has been a priority for us. Over this last fiscal year, we've deployed um, some narcotics detection devices called MX-908s, thanks to your board's support for that. And this allows our staff to test and get confirmed positive results for uh, fentanyl without having a handle and, and uh, the narcotics or open the packaging like uh, used to, we used to have to do back in the old days. Um, we've also had nine confirmed uh, overdoses of inmates within the facility over the last year that uh, were, their lives were saved by our staff and the deployment of Narcan. Our mail team and our correctional canines um, found over 600 pieces of incoming mail that were laced with fentanyl or other illegal narcotics. Uh, those have led to further investigations which resulted this last fiscal year in at least two convictions uh, thanks to the district attorney's office and they've forwarded over 200 uh, cases to our narcotics unit and our detective unit for further criminal investigation. So we're not just finding um, these pieces of mail coming in, destroying them, booking them into evidence. We're actually putting resources to it um, that this opioid response team will also be able to help with some of that and uh, try to hold people accountable who are uh, trying to smuggle uh, fentanyl into our correctional facility. I think the other arm that uh, should be mentioned is obviously the education component of our fentanyl strategy. Um, thanks to your support, we will be having uh, continuous funding for our Right Choice Program. Um, if you've never seen the Right Choice Program, it's kind of a scaled down version of maybe the every 15 minutes. It's targeted towards middle school uh, students. The Sheriff's Office has been running the program and partners with all of our criminal justice partners behind me who participate uh, since 2016. We, we do have um, a presentation coming up on April 26th. I would like to invite any of you members of your board or the county executive's office that would like to come out and observe to please you're more than welcome i think you'll be impressed and uh it does make a difference um, the district attorney and i were actually presenting at leadership loomis within the last couple of weeks and there was uh, an attendee when we talked about this program um, who remembered going through it and said what a difference it made in her life and the friend group that she ran with and how it had an impact and it kept her from experimenting with drugs as when she uh, went through the program in middle school. So we're pretty excited to continue that and get uh, some consistent funding streams for that program. Some of the emerging issues and challenges that I foresee us facing over the next fiscal year is obviously it's exciting, but it will be a challenge as well, and that is the completion of our 863-844 uh, jail housing unit additions. Uh, the 863 project, to refresh your recollection, is uh, the lease revenue bond with the state where uh, the county had a 10% match. This facility will be a 45-bed acute mental health facility. Uh, currently, uh, the last time we checked, I think it was maybe a six, eight weeks ago, 17% uh, of the inmate population is diagnosed with a serious mental illness. Um, we need a facility like this to open up in uh, our Placer County Jail to start to stabilize some of these inmates who are control problems. We'll also be looking at expanding our jail-based competency treatment program, and we're currently in uh, conversations and negotiations with the Department of State Hospitals to make that happen. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, the 844 project, which is that 120-bed medium security job skill training center, will be open potentially right now, target is spring of 2025. Um, one of the other challenges that we continue to face is the increase in Public Records Act requests that uh, overextend um, our staff at every level within the Sheriff's Office, but I would also argue overburdens uh, Karen's staff with the county council's office who has to review all of these public records act requests and the responses before they go out you can see the trend lines of what we've experienced i mean in 2018 we had 16 office-wide and if you looked at our year-to-date numbers and extrapolated and projected those out this current year we're uh, we're trending to break a thousand for the first time and uh I, I don't see them slowing down any soon. And, and the issue with us is those responses have become more and more complex as we've added 
body-worn cameras. Each patrol car has three cameras. So you have four video cameras of footage that has to be reviewed maybe for every single deputy on scene. Um, so an, an hour incident and request can turn into 80, 160 man hours to review, redact, and get released. And then I think our final challenge, which is not isolated to the sheriff's office, um, is the, really the West Placer ex expansion. You know, one of the things we've been currently in, in conversations with is our MOU with the California State University Sacramento campus, more uh, specifically the police department. Um, you know, that is their property. Um, and they have specific reporting requirements for types of crimes that have to be reported federally because they're it's a college-owned um, piece of property. So we have MOUs with them now, but as they continue to expand and open up that campus, we, this will most likely turn into a fee-for-service contract model. Um, I don't believe the university has any plans to staff their police department out there until they actually have on-campus housing and students actually living on campus. So uh, my guess is the sheriff's office will have to be the main service provider out there for quite a few years until, until they get to that point. And then obviously we need to continue and to hire and keep up with the population growth out there. I think what's unique with our office, I mentioned that the undersheriff has 11 deputy trainees coming in next week. Those trainees take on average of about 18 months to start the hiring process, go through the police academy, go through field training, go through jail training until they actually occupy a spot. And so, you know, my goal was I would love to see um, government and specifically the county and the sheriff's office be a little more proactive in hiring than waiting until uh, the revenue comes in after the houses have been built, the citizens have moved in, they finally pay their tax bill, and then it rolls in and then we start the 18 month hiring process and, and we're, we will already be behind the curve, in my opinion, potentially two to three years of where we should be of providing uh, public safety. I talked about 844 project and the needs of uh, or the um, job skill training center. The other thing that uh, I commissioned as soon as I took office was a needs assessment that I think is going to be crucial to the sheriff's office growth moving forward. As, as you know, the sheriff's office provides services, some specific to unincorporated areas and some are countywide. And I would argue that one of those that's countywide is uh, operation of the Placer County Jail. It's a cornerstone of the criminal justice system to have that accountability. And, you know, we've made decisions that maybe weren't always uh, data driven. So I've, we commissioned uh, with thanks to the county executive's office who split the costs, a needs assessment just to project corrections needs within the county, factoring in growth, crime rates, um, our federal consent decree and how many inmates we have to fed cap, what's going on with the criminal justice system so we can make sure that we have adequate bed space to keep that accountability that we have here in Placer County and, and, and keep our crime rates down. So I'm excited to see that report. I was hoping to have it before this meeting, but it uh, looks like it's gonna be done in May. And then finally, uh, our priorities and asks for this coming fiscal year. Uh, the first one is our AEDs or the external defibrillators. I think everybody pretty much knows what those are. The ones we have at the sheriff's office have uh, reached or exceeded their manufacturer warranty. Um, they haven't been replaced since we first got AEDs and began to deploy them. And that $220,000 ask not only replaces all the AEDs we have now, but it's my goal to put them in every patrol car. I think um, we've all seen instances where AEDs have been deployed even on a high school uh, sports field um, and saved someone's life. Um, and so I think it's important, we've never done it before, but to deploy these uh, life-saving measures in, in every patrol car we have. The next one is a West Placer substation. You know, there's been a lot of talk over the years about what the sheriff's footprint looks like out in West Placer as we continue to grow. We do have allocated um, land in the Santucci Justice Center, which is uh, our ultimate um, preference to land on, but I think that South Placer substation is maybe in the five to ten year capital improvement plan. Um, really, the way I see it, we don't have that kind of time 
Um, we're already built out. We're deploying over 60 staff and 8,000 square feet at our South Placer substation over across from Murray Lee's on, on Horseshoe Bar. And that is pretty much responsible from Newcastle all the way to the Sacramento County line. Um, we're all familiar with the, the traffic issues at 65 and 80. And as West Placer continues to grow, I, I don't have a locker space now at the South Placer substation. And as I continue to have to add staff as population increases, we really need to look at maybe a temporary landing spot, something that the sheriff's office can lease seven to 10 years by the county some time to where we don't feel that pressure to have to have a capital improvement project out at the Santucci Justice Center um, and, and get us a footprint out in the West Roseville area so our response times don't continue to go up and, and we have uh, some kind of visibility out there as the population and, and the expected urban service level uh, goes in. Surprisingly, uh, I thought commercial property would be really easy to find. I want to give a shout out to facility services and uh, real estate services who we've been working with for six to eight months. I realized that, and I guess it's a good thing, in Placer County, real uh, commercial real estate is not readily available. <laughs> and then when you look at our needs specific to the sheriff's office, most importantly, secure parking. Even at that uh, South Placer substation, our employees don't have secure parking for their personal vehicles. Um, they have to park in a different parking lot. The secure parking is extremely difficult to find. We do have a really good lead on uh, one landlord, one space that I think would um, get us an immediate fix. They'll allow secured parking. Um, and I think it's something the sheriff's office could easily uh, between the Luma station and that station reside in for a decade until the county is in a position to build something at the Santushi Justice Center and that's the cost you see there. The two additional deputy sheriffs, those are basically just math calculations that, again, in my opinion, will put us behind, but they're math calculations off of data we've received from CEDRA and uh, the building activity and the calculations used by CEDRA on the amount of population per household and the development agreements that the county made that the sheriff's office would provide 1.2 deputies per 1,000 residents. And so um, that it's actually a little higher than two, but we rounded down understanding that we are, uh, you know, the, the budget is tight this year. So um, that's what those two deputy sheriffs are. And then the last ask, probably the biggest ticket item, is um, to really add three sheriff's lieutenants to the organization. And I understand that that is um, a pretty large price tag, but I will say, I'm not proud to say, but I'll say that in my time, with the Placer County Sheriff's Office, our watch commander deployment model really has not changed um, in the 30 years I've been here. Watch commanders for us is a lieutenant level. That's a manager. Otherwise, a sergeant is a first line supervisor, not considered a manager. Um, the last time we changed it was when 2017, after uh, day shift went home at 4.30, 5 o'clock. We had no watch commander coverage or lieutenant oversight in any of our correctional facilities. In 2017, we obviously had our jail use of force issue that came up where we unfortunately had to arrest some of our employees. We used existing resources to make a modified swing shift and have watch commander coverage. In field operations, countywide, from approximately midnight to 1 a.m., you have zero management oversight from Tahoe all the way to the Sacramento County line. And if you total all of our stations, our correctional facilities, you might have 50 to 60 staff on duty during those times and not a single manager. I feel like uh, this is overdue for uh, an organization our size and a county our size. Um, it's a risk management issue. It's really when all of our uh, high liability and low frequency events happen. Uh, I, our last officer involved shooting happened during this time where there was no watch commander on. As far as I can remember, our last in custody deaths, several in custody deaths have all occurred during those hours when there's no management oversight. And then unfortunately, the sergeants that are on duty are usually the most junior inexperienced sergeants you have because we're a seniority based organization. And so when they're newly promoted, they go to night shift. And so you have no experience managers making decisions. What we are plan to do if we were to receive three additional lieutenant allocations or gradually chip away at it over multiple fiscal years is we would, we would make it a fixed post to where 
there will always be 24-7 coverage with some kind of watch commander countywide that could deploy to multiple divisions. They wouldn't be specific to the jail has 24-hour coverage or field operations has 24-hour coverage, but they would be responsible for the entire county. If something happened in Tahoe, they would take off and start driving to Tahoe to start assuming that incident command role and start making key decisions that need to be made. So. That pretty much covers our asks. I think in closing, I know there's a lot of um, competing demands this fiscal year, and um, there's a lot of requests on supplementals. Um, I also know that your board is, has a lot of competing priorities, and there's a lot of tough decisions to make when it comes to making the entire county function, and there's more things I admit, than public safety. But I appreciate your board's priority on public safety. But you know, one of the things that I really wanted to bring to your board's attention was some of the issues I discussed looking forward um, that I really factor in as growing pains um, you know, by adding this watch commander coverage 24 hours a day. Again, growing pains of potentially becoming you know, a county of 500,000 people. In fact, uh, the undersheriff and I have already been contacted by the organization of uh, major county sheriffs who represent all the biggest counties in the entire country to potentially join their organization this summer based off of, they have a cap of 500,000 people, but they look at how many staff we have and our geography and our growth projections. And they're asking us to join that organization early. So we're not sleepy little Placer County anymore. Um, and I think those are challenges. Um, my concern, quite frankly, is that, you know, there's a lot of competing, competing demands and sales tax and public safety sales tax going down. That doesn't just benefit us. That benefits other jurisdictions as well. And I know the board receives a lot of pressure um, and requests from either local municipalities that are struggling to provide for their public safety, smaller jurisdictions that want a bigger tax share revenue or annexation or special districts that are insolvent and, and need assistance. And I just um, want to thank your board for always prioritizing public safety and understand that um, you know, I know the sheriff's office and I think the district attorney will be getting up next and he has some things on his supplemental request that we're going to need to fill. We have a crime lab that I believe everybody in this room thinks is a key component and a key missing piece to the criminal justice system here. But maybe not this year, but next year we might potentially have to have some serious conversations about how that's staffed and funded and that um, we really prioritize funding our public safety here um, before we have to start trying to help out some of our neighbors. Not that I don't appreciate them and want to help them any way I can. So with that, I'll, I'll close my presentation and open up for any questions or comments or concerns from the board. Okay, Supervisor Landon. Um, I have a question going back to your uh, PRA slide because um, I'm sure this impacts departments across the county and not just yours. Do you know whether legislative fixes would be helpful with that or is, would it not be helpful? I, I think it would be helpful. I don't, I, I believe the legislative changes are what got us here, so I'm not <laughs> super confident we will get there. Okay. But yes, I think they would be helpful. I think um, even some minor legislative fixes to get us some cost recovery, even partial cost recovery, mm -hmm. uh, it, the dollar amount of man hours is extraordinary. And, and I think what you're seeing is um, clearing houses. One that comes to mind, I believe, is called Muckrock. Um, and these are nationwide clearing houses that will just blanket PRAs all across the state of California, specifically to law enforcement agencies asking about every use of force, um, every single thing they can, and then get the data, and they'll mill them out either to news sites or um, litigators for civil action of what they see could be potential litigation. So, um, you know, I have staff working hundreds of hours I think uh, through, through these to help people make a profit, and and I think the system is being abused uh, in a way outside of the legislative intent when they they made PRAs a lot easier to access and limited our ability to uh, get some cost recovery. Mm -hmm. Okay, well I just uh, wondered if maybe there are some creative ways since we have an assembly member who's an, a senator who are very supportive in this area and obviously have worked with our DA's office and you before so just kind of mulling that over in my mind. Um, and then I wanted to ask too, you kind of just mentioned hundreds of hours, but do you happen to know an estimate of what your staff has spent? 
I don't off the top of my head. We do track it though on every PRA. It's tra all the man hours are mm -hmm. tracked, so I could get that for you and, and follow up. Okay, thanks. And then just one other question: um, How many unfilled positions do you guys currently have? Do you know? <clears throat> As of today, uh, total or deputy sheriff? Um, yeah, I would say deputy sheriffs slash lieutenants. I don't know if you have any open right now that you're recruiting for. Uh, vacant counts currently right now are 70, but that's uh, agency wide. I don't have the uh, current breakdown. The breakdown. Okay. Yeah, yeah uh, it'd be super helpful maybe to see a breakdown. 70. 70. Mm -hmm. Vacant. 70 vacant positions. But um, as the sheriff mentioned, currently right now we have three deputy sheriff vacancies and, and three CO vacancies. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Supervisor Gore. Thank you, appreciate the presentation. Um, just a couple of questions. For the folks who are going through the academy, it's 18 months, is that a paid position? Are they being paid to go through the academy at that time? Yes, they're paid as a lower classification. It's called a deputy sheriff trainee. Um, so they're compensated. They start about a month before the academy starts. There's a pre-academy that occurs to, to prepare them. Then they go through the six-month academy. Upon graduation and getting sworn in, they're kind of automatically promoted to a deputy sheriff at that one at that point, and then they start the, the training process. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. And, you know, I appreciate you looking forward at all the growth that's happening in West Placer because we really do need to provide. Um, public safety for the communities that are growing out in West Roseville um, and so we're gonna have to figure out how we move forward with that um, so I appreciate you thinking about that and then another question and it goes back to the question about the gang um, robberies in Granite Bay mm -hmm. from South America mm -hmm. would those be people who are on visas or no uh, s not all of them. Some of them have crossed the border illegally. Um, what you're seeing, and this is not just a problem unique to Placer County, it's nationwide. Orange County has really felt the brunt of it over the last couple of years, but they're starting to make their way to Placer County. We've found uh, evidence where they've specifically searched our area for high-end neighborhoods. Granite Bay pops up, then they search houses and drive right to, uh, to them. Um, but a lot of them are on what are called tourist visas. I think law enforcement across the United States has asked the federal government and Director of Homeland Security to um, revoke that tourist visa process uh, specifically with Chile. That's where the majority of them, these are Chilean uh, organized crime, um, it, but so far we've had no success. But over this last year is the first time we've really seen um, this type of organized international theft groups hit Placer County. And I think we've made seven different arrests to date. Appreciate that. And then um, just uh, Supervisor Landon, to your point about the PRAs, I know that at um, California State Association of Counties, it's countywide everywhere those PRAs have gone up and they're always looking at like legislative fixes mm -hmm. um, to try to figure out what else can be done. But I think that's something that we probably do need to start highlighting because the amount of time for all of our departments and the public certainly has right to access information, but maybe even cost recovery uh, would be really helpful because the amount of time is just too much. Yeah. And it takes away from your needed services. Yeah, I would agree. Okay, Supervisor Holmes. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Wu. I appreciate your uh, presentation. Very thorough. Uh, last year, we were able to make an agreement with the Deputy Sheriff's Association at long overdue. Uh, were, was that increase uh, for those salaries, or is your budget able to absorb that without any additional funding from the county? Uh, we needed some additional funding for this current fiscal year because it wasn't programmed. Uh, part of it was, I think, but not the, the full extent of it. And then, um, which working with Daniel and his team, we were able to accomplish uh, for this fiscal year. Then next fiscal year, that uh, is kind of what uh, Jerry covered in the first couple of slides, which showed that increase in uh, that discretionary general fund that we were receiving, um, or at least that amount that came from that 51% discretionary general fund. Uh, but between our inmate health care contract and um, the salary adjustments that increased pretty much ate up all of uh, 
had to cover all of those things. So I, I, really looking forward, we're pretty much maintaining status quo right now at the sheriff's office and gonna be doing last year's business at kind of this coming year's new costs. We're, yeah, in, unless some of these supplemental requests were to come through, we're pretty much status quo with even with the revenue increases. If that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. That the salary increase has allowed you to recruit more deputies. Is that correct? Oh yes, it's been a noticeable increase, both uh, which is why I wanted to highlight that slide and in, in the correctional officer and deputy sheriff recruitment, and specifically the lateral recruitment, which is going to be key to us continuing to grow as an organization as the county grows and get in front of that. Uh, deficit that we were facing last year we we really i i, I want to have a hybrid of both i don't want to be too over reliant on any one classification i i also don't want to bring in all lateral deputy sheriffs because i think we'll lose the culture of the sheriff's office and who we are as as the sheriff's office and, and therefore placer county um, so i want to have a hybrid approach and and that we're bringing in laterals at a very measured pace um, but also that they're being indoctrinated with the Placer County way and our expectations. I expect no less. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Okay, Supervisor Gustafson. Thank you, and thank you, Sheriff and Jerry. Thanks for a great presentation, and most important, thanks for all you do to protect our residents. Um, I wanted to ask specifically about dispatch and your vacancies there. They're still very high, correct? They're still high, but we've actually turned in a corner. I, Jerry's sending me some numbers, but I have to admit I don't have my glasses and I can't read his handwriting that small. So Jerry, um, I know you. that in a April, we're gonna have six, um, six dispatchers in the training program okay. um, later this month. And that does not include the almost 300 applicants wow. that we've received through the All-Star Recruiting Program that will start to hit the testing cycle coming up in the next month. Uh, our office is hosting an open house invitation for all those folks that's going to help speak to them about the job expectations and help prepare them for the testing process. So I'm fairly confident, you know, it is a numbers game at some point that with uh, six in the training program and almost 300 applicants that are going to start the testing process in the next month, that we'll, we, the dispatch center will look better than it has in probably a decade in about maybe eight to 12 months. Well, I really appreciate the approach you've taken and going. I know it was a question, will it produce results? And yeah. certainly it looks like it has, that's great. Um, and then uh, you've given us two ideas for legislative policy advocacy that we could work on. Is there anything, anything else? Oh, I have all kinds of ideas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, make us earn our living up here. Yeah. So, no, uh, but you know, one of the things I would put uh, uh, on um, the board's radar is really some of, uh, I, I think, some potential exciting changes in criminal justice that could be coming over the next 12 months, which is why I'm excited about uh, this needs assessment, which really won't factor these two things in, but you know, going to the Supreme Court is uh, gonna be the Grants Pass case, um, which is gonna really look at that Martin v. Boise case when it comes to enforcing trespassing and homelessness on government property. Um, I mean, you're seeing people on both sides of the aisle, including our, our state's governor, get behind uh, this case, the state sheriffs, and I know the state district attorneys associations have filed amicus briefs behind it. Um, so I'm fairly optimistic on that, and then there will also be a ballot measure, most likely, that could be um, hitting the ballot in November to potentially um, undo parts of, of Proposition 47 and the impacts that that has had on the criminal justice system. Unfortunately for me, as the sheriff, uh, that will just create more demand. Uh, we need that accountability arm, but most county sheriffs, their jails are full of violent offenders. And most sheriffs are like me, they're under a federal consent decree and we're having to fed cap people on a regular basis when they're only in for property crimes. So if um, this ballot measure were to pass in November, uh, you know, there will be some probably correctional demand needs in order to make uh, some of these changes in the law successful and bring that accountability back for you know what are what are looked at as property crimes but I'm very optimistic on both of those issues that I think could could be game-changing for criminal justice um, and quality of life issues I think in communities across our state not just here moving forward over this next year great well thank you and keep us posted if you need us to to help in any way my pleasure thank you 
Okay. And I will add that um, at least this is looking better than last year <laughs> with, with the recruits and, and lateral transfers and, and such. And, and I'm amazed at the number of people that are applying for your dispatch after having taken the tour yeah. and see what dispatchers have to take care of. I was just, it was head spinning really, the, the responsibilities that your dispatchers have. So I want to say that you're, this is looking great. Keep up the good work and I appreciate all the explanations on personnel and staffing and requirements and everything. It gives us a much better idea moving forward, you know, in the way we think about our planning, planning for all of these um, challenges. Well, thank you, and once again, thanks to this board for your support for our office and public safety as a whole, and really uh, the decisions you made over the last, the, the course of this last year with the contract negotiations and, and things that occurred in our corrections division is a, really a key component on, on why we're here today. Okay, one more comment. I forgot to ask one question, and yes. I appreciate the information about the having watch commanders manage your level. Yes. 24-7, is what's typical in most sheriff's offices as far as staffing? It depends on size, but most organizations, our size, um, will have 24-hour watch commander coverage. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Yeah, you'll see smaller jurisdictions like, like we've been, you know, like I said, our, ours hasn't changed in the 30 years I've been here um, that do not or have a gap at some point. Um, and, and I think what this will, for me, it's not just the 24-hour coverage, but it makes it a fixed post by utilizing all our lieutenants across every division to where there will always be somebody on. So right now, even though we have swing shift watch commanders, if they take time off, go to training, nobody backfills them. That goes uncovered as well. So there's a lot, there's a lot more gaps than just maybe that midnight to 7 a.m., if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, we want to thank you both for your presentation and your time, and, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. It. Good luck over the next two days. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. Okay, so. So shall I announce we are going to be moving on to the district attorney's budget. Um, well, welcome and good morning, Morgan and staff. Try and make up a little time here. I see we're it's like that first airplane that starts late. You know, I have the whole That's rest right. of the day is behind. That's right. Well, it's all right. It'll, <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll be suffering the repercussions at the end of the day. I That's agree. right. Well, thank you and good morning, uh, Morgan Geyer, your district attorney. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I'm honored to have our Administrative and Fiscal Operations Manager, Kimi Yamanishi, here with me, uh, as well as Dave Tellman, our Chief Assistant, and some other members of our team that I'll introduce as we get into their sections as well. Um, but first, let me, let me echo some of the things that Sheriff Wu had said when he began. Uh, it truly is an honor to have the, the support of the Board, our Chief Executive's Office, uh, and, and our allied justice partners uh, that we collaborate with to, to help our mission. It really makes Placer County unique, our ability to, to collaborate and support one another, and I truly appreciate it. Um, this board has been incredibly supportive of all of our efforts that we've tried to, tried to accomplish over the last several years at the district attorney's office, and I can't thank Daniel and Amanda enough for their constant support and guidance uh, as we navigate through these issues um, budget-wise. So w with that, um, let's talk a little bit about the district attorney's office. Uh, I had once again tried to get Kimi Yamanishi to uh, deliver more of this presentation, um, but it uh, turns out only when it gets to the numbers uh, will she be doing any of the speaking. Uh, but uh, not much has changed to our cost centers. Um, we'll go through some of these in a little more detail when we get into, into some of the accomplishments, um, but our, our day job, our general um, criminal case determinations, our investigations division, our administrative and fiscal, our victim services, and our multidisciplinary interview center, um, our forensic um, child interviews. Um, these, I believe, were the same as last year, um, uh, included uh, in there as well, but not listed is our SART program, our sexual assault response team that is included in, uh, in here as well. 
Um, let's start with the fun stuff. Uh, I love nothing more than an opportunity to brag about the good things that our team uh, is doing at the district attorney's office. Um, some of the cases that make the newspapers are, are, are bread and butter, some of our violent crimes. Um, these are what we deal with day in and day out. Uh, as you can see, um, this is just a, a snapshot of some of the, the larger cases we've had, uh, cases that we've had um, that have um, either resolved or gone to trial. As you can see, we have a number of, of murders, a couple of sexual assaults. These are large prosecutions. Um, I, will, I will note that the Frank and Stubbs case was a life without parole um, sentence on a, on a child abuse case, which is pretty rare. Those are incredibly... Um, Graphic, those are as bad as it gets in order to obtain a sentence for a life without the possibility of parole on a case that does not involve a homicide. Um, it's only available in, in these sexual assault cases, and they are pretty intense. So uh, when we go through uh, the rest of uh, the presentation and I talk a little bit about some of the, the stressors and, uh, and, and wellness issues that, that come into the DA's office, it's cases like these that put, put a burden on just about everybody who works on these. Uh, we had a number of, of relatively high-profile, locally high-profile murder cases, um, the Bryant and Shade cases. Um, the Bryant case was prosecuted by Lisa Botwinick behind me. Um, it was a, a son who had murdered his father and attempted to murder his mother. Uh, Mr. Shade was a resident of Roseville who was murdered by a family member. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the first two are Dare uh, and Kabakungan, um, sort of echoing what Sheriff Wu had said. Um, the fentanyl crisis is continuing, and we, will con we are and have been continuing our efforts on aggressive prosecution. Uh, as I tell people that I speak to, um, our DA's office is doing things that this DA's office has never done before, and it's doing things that no DA's office has ever done before. Uh, and, the, and the fentanyl prosecution is um, a perfect example of that. Uh, Mr. Kabakungan was the first person in the state of California convicted of murder for providing fentanyl to someone who later died. Um, and Mr. Dare was um, the third. There have been three prosecutions uh, and convictions for murder in the state of California for fentanyl. Two of those have been in Placer County. Um, the other was in Riverside County. And we have a third case of ours that had started trial and then had a little bit of a hiccup and will be resuming trial in the next couple of weeks. Um, but these, uh, as you'll see, consistent with a theme uh, when we get into some of our challenges, these cases require a lot of work. Um, particularly our fentanyl cases, and, and as Sheriff Wu was indicating with his fentanyl response team, our fentanyl prosecutors, our major narcotics prosecutors, are involved more in these cases on the front end than most other cases. Um, traditionally, DA's offices tend to be a bit more reactive, meaning the investigation is done by the law enforcement agency, they submit the case to us, and we prosecute it from there. Fentanyl is different. It requires much more... Um, groundwork being done by the lawyers on the front end in these investigations, um, meaning our narcotics prosecutors are as much a member of, the, of that fentanyl team as, as uh, any of the law enforcement officers on there as well. Um, so when we get to, get to some of our issues that we are dealing with, we'll, we'll talk about that because it really is um, a, an enormous amount of, of man hours that go into um, these fentanyl prosecutions. And then um, one of the things I, I'm most proud of uh, in our office are our ability to handle the statewide issues that are thrust upon us through bad policy and bad legislation. Uh, we have uh, obviously talked about the fentanyl prosecution, but organized retail theft has been on the forefront of everyone's mind, been constant in the headlines, um, is something that affects every aspect of our quality of life in Placer and throughout the state. Um, this board was gracious enough to allow us to apply for grants um, to develop a team specifically designed to deal with organized retail theft. That came with a dedicated organized retail theft prosecutor, uh, a dedicated criminal investigator, and a crime analyst that will work with our frontline law enforcement to try and, and develop um, those areas that are prime targets and, and how much like Sheriff Wu was talking about with the real-time crime centers will allow our office to work and interface with our law enforcement agencies. Uh, it, it has been something that has caught the attention of, of the rest of the state. We are frequently asked by news organizations from across the state about why when it comes to fentanyl and organized retail theft, when they do their research, little old Placer County keeps coming up. Uh, and it's a source of great pride that, that we serve as 
much of a model for, for other states or for other counties and, and even other other jurisdictions. And then we continue to, to engage and, and even lead in environmental crime. Uh, we Our prosecutor is actively involved in a number of statewide lawsuits um, dealing with all sorts of environmental issues from uh, negligent storage of underground fuel tanks uh, to, to all of the other environmental crimes that we prosecute, as well as we build are building out our uh, circuit prosecutor program that this board graciously uh, authorized last year um, to allow us to have a dedicated prosecutor to work in conjunction with some of the smaller counties that do not have access to uh, prosecution services in their environmental crimes. So it is uh, something that continues to keep Placer County uh, DA's office leading the way. Our public uh, outreach, uh, the, one of the things I am I'm most proud of, um, spearheaded by Lisa Botwinick and Stephanie Herrera, who are seated be behind us, um, have really, you've, you've all heard me say this, so I won't spend too much time on it, but it is as important as the prosecution of our cases to spread awareness and education to reduce the amount of crime that occurs. If we can prevent victims, uh, then we have truly accomplished our mission. Uh, I, would, I would rather prevent uh, crimes from occurring than have to prosecute them on the back end. And the way we do that is to build the trust uh, and enhance the education of our community. And nowhere has that been more apparent than in our fentanyl campaign. That continues. Um, we have continued our efforts to provide our, um, our assemblies. As you can see, we, we were able to reach over 30,000 students. We are continuing to provide those assemblies to our middle schools. Uh, and we are um, continuing to spread the word. And, and I think one of the most impressive things about Placer County in general, not just our DA's office, but, but our ability to collaborate with people who have been affected by these tragedies. Um, you don't have to go very far in this county to learn the names and see the participation of our bereaved families who have lost people to fentanyl poisonings and overdoses who have become part of the mission to educate our community. And that's one thing I think that really separates us from a lot of other counties uh, and has really changed the face of victimization and trauma in Placer County. Um, you no longer have to or need to be silent. Um, you can be empowered and you can use that empowerment to help others and to keep others from being victims as well. And I think you'll see in the days to come with the advent of the Placer Justice Foundation and our Empower and Resilience Project through the DA's office, you will see even more of this sort of victim empowerment um, and collaboration among uh, some of our bereaved families, some of our um, folks that have been affected um, by crime, really using their voice to help partner with us and to help other people um, to either navigate that situation should they find themselves in it or to avoid it altogether. We continue with our criminal justice pathway field trips. Those are fantastic opportunities for uh, our juniors and seniors in high school to come get a front row view of the criminal justice system. They, they come to the DA's office. We have partnered with probation, the sheriff's office, and the courts to really give uh, students in forensic classes, government classes, uh, a front row view uh, even those who don't anticipate or ever have a desire to work in the criminal justice system find themselves being uh, moved by this program and, and uh, they will help shape the future of our criminal justice system and these programs are critically important. Um, and, and consistent with that, um, one of the things that our goal was with our, with our community outreach unit was to, was to be present. Um, we attend career fairs, we attend events. You will see the DA's office being a fixture at most of the community events that occur uh, throughout town. Uh, and we have volunteers in our office, those who aren't even assigned as part of their uh, assignment in our outreach unit, volunteering to be there. Um, it's, not, it won't, it's not surprising to find DA's at the, the mad walks or uh, any sort of uh, event that's going on uh, in our community. The DA's office is there to help spread awareness and build trust in our criminal justice system. And our Placer Protect is thriving. Um, we have our two resource fairs each year, um, the one in Maidu and the one in Tahoe. Um, in addition to the Protect fairs, we will have this year for the first time the inaugural Mental Health Resources Fair um, put on by our office and in collaboration with a lot of our justice partners and mental health service provider partners. Um, similar model to the Protect 
fair that will provide much needed mental health resources for those who, who participate. Um, we, you have, we have also seen the um, family and child services fair um, that occurred through our Placer MDIC, uh, and you'll see another one of those this year as well. So lots of things are happening in the, in the community outreach uh, space at the district attorney's office, um, and this is a space that, that a, not a lot of DA's offices operate in. Larger offices that have the ability to do it do, um, but offices our size typically don't have one as robust. So again, one of the things I'm, I'm incredibly proud of. We continue to collaborate with our criminal justice partners. Uh, our wonderful probation department uh, has partnered with us with our pre-file diversion program along with HHS. This is the program that is designed to identify those who have a one-off intersection with the criminal justice system, don't necessarily belong uh, in the criminal justice system, and is designed to identify those who, with no prior record, uh, this program was originally designed and is now being expanded, but originally designed with first-time uh, offenders who are charged with theft or arrested for theft to try and siphon them out of the system. For those of you that have heard the presentation on organized retail theft that I have given, um, you will know that it was hard to get this program up and running uh, because a majority of the people who were arrested for theft in Placer County, it was not their first time. Uh, and as Sheriff Wu was talking about potential changes with ballot measures, uh, one of the problems that we face in our organized retail theft space is that we have people repeat thieves who are uh, doing it over and over again and the consequences are not, we are not able to impose stricter consequences based on the number of times that they continue to do it. But this program has been a success. Anecdotally, we have some, we have some successes and we will continue to, to, uh, to build that out. Our fentanyl response and training, we have talked about that. I'm excited uh, for the sheriff's uh, response team. We are excited to participate in it. Uh, the detective that investigated the, the cases that we obtained those convictions on is phenomenal, uh, and him being allowed to continue that with the support uh, of a team is going to be, I think, a game changer for fentanyl here in Placer County. We have already made tremendous inroads, and I think this has uh, the recipe to be a, a phenomenal success, and we are excited to partner along with the sheriff's office uh, as part of that. We continue to uh, expand and um, highlight our collaborative courts. I've said this before, oftentimes um, the average citizen's uh, view of the criminal justice system is also often shaped by the collaborative courts. These are our rehabilitative courts, our drug treatment court, our mental health court, our veterans treatment court, our community court, which used to be known as the homeless court. Um, th those are the, the areas of the criminal justice system where we try and seek redemption and try and put people back on their feet. Uh, and we have worked diligently with our stakeholders um, to try and uh, educate and expand the, uh, the ways in which people get in and the ways in which people succeed in our collaborative courts. Our community prosecution unit, um, we, we have Lisa who supervises that. We have one prosecutor who uses it. M the, most of that of our pro community prosecution resources have been, have been devoted to uh, homelessness issues. Um, but over the next five years, it is part of our plan to continue to expand the community prosecution unit uh, and in hopes at one point to have prosecutors assigned to different geographic regions in our county to be available um, for the specific needs that occur in those, in those areas. Uh, we have continued to focus on increasing staffing based on community-driven crimes. I mentioned our organized retail theft. I mentioned those people uh, on that team that we have added. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the emerging issues and priorities. We continue to deal with understaffing. Uh, just as a little bit of context, when I first took over, we were critically understaffed. I think the second year of the, of this is going almost my fourth year as the district attorney here in Placer County. The second year I asked, and <laughs> thank you, I, I asked for and graciously received from this board an allotment of six prosecutors to help us bring us up to speed uh, with sort of the numbers that are similar throughout the county. Um, we were about 12 behind, and then um, last year we had not filled all six of those positions when I had submitted the budget, so we didn't ask for any more. Um, we since then did fill those positions. So we are at a point in time now where we are being faced with more and more demands on the criminal justice system. If, you, if I can use the, the example that Sheriff Wu gave, uh, in a PRA context, when you have a couple of police cars respond or sheriffs 
units respond to an incident, you have three or four deputies all wearing body board cameras. Maybe the incident only lasts an hour or two, but if you consider all of the amount of information that is generated for one case in that instance, maybe it's a relatively low level simple crime, but we now have hours and hours of body camera footage. We have hours and hours of, of technology, cell phone data, um, all of those sorts of things that increase the amount of time on each criminal case. The volume of cases is not increasing significantly. We're not dealing with exponentially more of certain kinds of crime. What we are dealing with is an exponential increase in the amount of time that each case takes. Uh, and when you compound that with changes that the legislature, well, I'll just say thrusts upon us, uh, it adds to the complexity of each case. Uh, in particular, and I think this year has highlighted it, there was the passage of a, of a statute that allowed for mental health diversion on just about all cases, except for a small um, exception. Every defendant is allowed to submit to the court uh, a doctor's report that says there was a mental health issue that contributed to this person's criminality and therefore they should be diverted from the criminal justice system. That usually results in a motion being filed by the defendant. It then needs to be responded to, researched and responded to, and oftentimes a court hearing where our prosecutors are having to cross-examine doctors. This is before we even get into the merits of the case. This is on just about every case now that is coming into our office requires a separate mental health component on each case. It is a relatively loose standard. We are successful in defeating many of these, but it all requires a lot of work to do. Uh, and trust me, if there are mental health issues that are severely driving someone's criminality, we are equipped to deal with that. Um, but unfortunately, what this law did was to allow for a lot more litigation on the front end, and it has created uh, quite a burden on our, particularly our felony units, where these are relatively serious cases, and we have to litigate these issues so that we can continue to hold someone responsible. The other the other demand that is being placed, I mentioned earlier on our staff, our our major narcotic unit, we have two prosecutors um, assigned to that unit that are um, primarily responsible for the prosecution of our major narcotics crimes. This, this unit, the special prosecutions, special prosecutions unit, also encompasses our human trafficking, our organized retail theft, and our post-conviction unit, meaning everything that happens after someone is convicted and all that litigation. We have one primarily dedicated narcotics prosecutor and a supervisor of that unit who also assists in the prosecution of these narcotics cases, and they're overwhelmed. Um, if you can imagine by seeing the slides just on the number of sheriff's arrests in Sheriff Wu's presentation, add in the rest of the uh, law enforcement agencies in our county, those all come to us. Um, all of those arrests, all of those investigations, as I said earlier, our narcotics prosecutors are generally involved in those prosecutions early on. It becomes an incredible burden, um, so one of the things will be uh, asking for is to add a position to that narcotics unit so that we can handle um, these these fentanyl cases. As I mentioned before, uh, actually, I'll, I'll leave that there for now. Um, another another issue, we're running out of room. We have a, uh, a temporary building that we are now, I think, 15, 16 years in, um, and we have, we are getting creative. Uh, our assessor, Matt Maynard, was gracious enough to allow us to have the space below um, our office on the first floor of the Santucci Justice Center, and we have now been in plans. Uh, we talked a little bit about this last year, but we have been in, in plans and, and have now actually finalized the plans to turn the downstairs of that area, what was the former assessor space, into our multidisciplinary interview center. It is in need of an upgrade. It is in need uh, of becoming more efficient, and, and it will allow us to add about 12 more offices in our DA's office where the MDIC center is now. So we are in the, in the process of, of doing that, but once we get to that point, we'll be all full up. I, I don't know what the solution to that is at this point, uh, and it's a little early to talk about it, but, but we had, for a period of time, we had lawyers that we were hiring um, being placed in cubicles, which you know, we don't do this job for, uh, for the pride, but it is, we would like to have our attorneys in, uh, in, in offices because they have a lot of stuff and they need uh, an area to be quiet and they have a lot of things that they need to discuss and work on that shouldn't be available to anybody who is walking by. Um, so keep that in mind. We are, we are running out of space in our office. Uh, 
Another issue that we are constantly faced with are the legislative and decisional impacts to our operations. The legislature, uh, they are busy. They like to keep us on our toes. Um, Post-conviction litigation, which I have talked about before, continues. Um, this last legislative cycle was not as bad as years before in terms of vast sweeping things, but we have a couple of things on the horizon that are coming to fruition that will severely impact um, our operations. I talked about the mental health diversion. Um, one of the other things I will, I will mention, we will effective January 1 of 2025, we will have to implement what is called race-blind charging. This was a pilot project that occurred in one county in California and then was passed statewide. It requires us on the vast majority of our, of our cases to have to review them twice. The first time we have to review that case completely redacted from any racial identifying information. And then we have to assess whether or not we would file that case. If we would file that case, we then unredact that information and we can look at it again. It's a way to try and remain race neutral. Um, frankly, it was a, a statute I don't think was necessary. Our prosecutors do what they do because they are sworn um, to uphold the, the, the Constitution and the laws of our state, and they do it because they have a strong moral compass. Um, but the legislature thought we needed an extra couple of layers um, to, to do our job um, so that they could prove that we were doing it for the right reasons. Somewhat insulting, but we're here nonetheless. So we have been working with a couple of different companies to try and figure out how that's going to be done. Because if you can imagine someone having with all of the reports, the thousands of reports we get every year, someone having to redact that with a pen and then make a second copy, it would be unworkable. So we will be trying to get creative on how we implement that. And then the following year, we will implement another statute that was uh, given to us by the legislature that requires us to report about 58 separate metrics of data that have never previously been um, captured before in district attorney's offices. And, it, and it's an incredible uh, lift to try and capture it and report that kind of data, everything from the number of cases in a particular lawyer's caseload to all of the reasons why cases are filed or rejected, things that that were never broadcast before to uh, on a statewide level will now become um, something that we have to record each year and, and we have to have a system in place to do that. So lots of changes on the horizon for the operations of the DA's offices that will, that will create a lot of hardships. Uh, and then as an example, uh, again, just as we've seen with our sexually violent predator, uh, the one that we've been dealing with uh, most recently, uh, Changes in the law as of January have created confusion and some, some issues um, that we have tried to navigate and do our best to educate our public and, and, and get engagement from everyone uh, on these issues. Um, our objectives, uh, objectives and performance measures, I don't think much has changed. Um, I will comment just on a couple of these, but I'll, I'll leave them to you to, to take a look at. We had uh, a major milestone with the uh, advancement and development of, of the crime lab thanks to this board with the execution of of the common interest agreement uh, between uh, our county and Sac State thank you very much for your dedication to that uh, and I will just point out we are still number five down there we are still in need of a service dog I am committed that this year we will have a service dog in our victim services unit but we were unable to obtain one last year so uh, I have said yes but we have to find the right person to be the handler and it comes with a lot of training and, and a lot of requirements but uh, for those of you that might be disappointed that it's still on our performance uh, measures as, as unachieved uh, hold, hold, hold on we're, we're gonna get there uh, all right, operating budget versus capital expenditures. All right, I'm gonna to toss it over to you. I'm gonna let Kimmy do a little bit of talking here just to go through some of our numbers. Thank you, Morgan. So for year 24-25 operating budget versus capital expenditures, we have an operating expenditure budget of $31 million. Capital expense budget is 135,000. This is the two vehicles that we ask in plus one radio total budget of $32 million, nearly $32 million. Sure. So next slide, uh, we have revenue and expense comparison. We are about the same, so 23-24 adopted budget was $31 million and we are Little increase of um, 32 millions nearly for 24-25 working budget. <clears throat> so 
the major budget variances, $2.1 million of increase for salaries and benefits. That includes five allocations approved in 23-24. Um, so those are five allocations, as Morgan mentioned, three allocations for ORT grant, one DDA for Cal EPA, EPS, excuse me, and also we got one investive um, in uh, IA for opioid grant. Also that $2.1 million includes salary increase for DDAA MOU that settled and also general wage increase. Next bullet point is $410,000 of decrease for A87 cost. The third bullet point is $735,000 of increase for other program for state aid. Those, like I mentioned, are T grants and Cal EPA grants. And we don't have that in here, but we also have um, $1.5 million of decrease that is due to uh, reclassification of uh, ledger account from the revenue ledger to the contra expense ledger. So that decreases that line of expenditures by $1.5 million. And then our snapshot of the last several years of our funded positions um, from 130 to 135, including the ORT, the EPA, and I think two of the unfunded positions from uh, the prosecutors from that six that we had gotten two years ago. Our supplemental requests, um, I'm going to go through these. I, I, having conversations with Daniel and Amanda, and obviously listening here today, I understand the challenges we face this year. Um, I'm going to tell you why we put these on here um, just very briefly and then do my best to try and prioritize uh, these as best we can. The investigative assistant is for our multidisciplinary interview center, um, and I wanted to give you the numbers just by example. Uh, in 2022, we did 228 forensic exams. Those are forensic interviews of children who are um, either have been maltreated, have been victims or witnesses of crimes. In 2023, that number increased to 285 um, forensic interviews. Um, and those are all done in the DA's office. We have a small staff there. Uh, the uh, forensic interviewers and the investigative assistants run, run the center, uh, and it is becoming more and more challenging um, with the increased number of um, interviews that we do. Um, as you can imagine, uh, and as you've heard with the advent of all of these new technologies that are affecting the criminal justice system, everything in our IT department is increasing. Uh, and we are, we have gone from a one person IT person when I started to an IT unit now, uh, and it needs to, to operate as a unit. Um, and, and that means we have to have uh, an IT supervisor uh, and a couple of levels of uh, of both management and IT support, uh, and we are, we are lacking that, and that is something we would like to try and build in. Um, as with um, everything else, our administrative and fiscal operations are expanding, um, which is why we, have, we started with um, very little, and now we have one of the best uh, administrative and fiscal teams, I think, anywhere around, uh, thanks to Kimmy and her team's efforts. Um, but adding some structure and some movement uh, within that unit is 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 important. Uh, hence the request for the uh, accountant senior, and the four deputy district attorneys. One of those is designed to handle nothing but those mental health diversions that I talked about. Right now, each lawyer in their caseload has to deal with these mental health diversion requests. The idea would be to add a lawyer to do just that. Um, it's inefficient because the lawyers have so many cases that they're working on. If we could funnel those into one lawyer that handles the mental health component of those cases to allow the lawyers to work on the substantive portion of those cases would be much more efficient uh, and much more cost effective. The second deputy district attorney would be for the narcotics unit. Um, our, as I said before, and I won't spend much time on it, but our, our major narcotics prosecutor is drowning. Um, he has the support of a supervisor who's doing more 
narcotics prosecuting than supervising uh, because it's just that busy. Um, and with the advent of the uh, fentanyl response team, it's only going to get busier. Uh, and this is something that is obviously a priority. Um, and to, to accommodate the increase in volume and complexity of the cases that are being handled by our felony units, um, the, the following two deputy district attorneys are for one. We have two felony teams to add, uh, to add a felony prosecutor to each of those teams to handle the volume. They are working too much. Um, the caseloads are too big per person. Um, they, are, they are too big comparatively around the state, and they're just too big for each of those lawyers. Um, and as I've said before, it's hard, to, it's hard to innovate when you're in triage mode, and we just are still short. Uh, so the, the narcotics prosecutor and the mental health uh, diversion prosecutor are critical um, because those are, each day, those are a drain on us. Um, so I, I, I understand the challenges this board faces this year. I understand the, the, the ambitiousness of, of a lot of the department's asks, including our own. So I, I appreciate your, your consideration for these. Um, but I will just say, um, we don't ask for things we don't need. Um, last year, we didn't ask for anything because um, we knew we hadn't filled the positions we'd asked for the year before. So um, we try and be good stewards of the public money, but we also need to operate the DA's office in the best way that we can in the most efficient way and in a way that reduces stress on everybody so that we're not um, constantly uh, risking burnout for a lot of our, for a lot of our staff. Um, so with that, um, I thank you very much for your time today. I truly appreciate the support of this board. It is, it is, uh, is it an honor to come before you uh, each year to do this uh, and say a few things about the good work that our team is doing. Um, while I get to be the, the face of the office, and I can hear Ryan Ronco saying, oh, there's a scary thought, um, <laughs> it, it is our team uh, that truly makes this DA's office what I truly believe is the best DA's office in, in the state, if not, if not the nation. And that is some of the people behind me and the people back at the office. So um, thank you for allowing us to do the good work that we do, and thank you for the support along the way. With that, I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Morgan. Supervisor Holmes. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Margaret. Uh, Morgan, thank you for your leadership uh, in our criminal justice system. It's much appreciated. Um, you've got these supplemental requests for additional staff members, and you talked about being crowded for space. Uh, where would you put these? <laughs> <laughs> Wherever we can fit them. Uh, but I never want our lack of space to override our need for people. Uh, okay. uh, <laughs> uh, but we are in the process of that construction. As, uh, I mean, we haven't started the construction yet, but once that's done, we'll have a little bit of breathing room because it does free up some space. Um, but in the meantime, it'll be tight. Yeah. Um, we'll have some folks in cubicles, and that's okay. Um, but better to have the people than, than not know where to put them than the other way around. Would you, you have any locations that you've been looking at that, uh, to uh, house these people? To we make sure that you have enough space for your to do the yeah. important work that you people we'll do. <laughs> Did somebody say the domes? No. No, no offense, but uh, okay. they need to be close to our central operations in Roseville. There we go. Um, we, we, we do have a few offices in our Auburn Justice Center office. The problem is most of the people that we need uh, have to be close to the Santucci Justice Center. It's just not feasible to ask people to drive back and forth for court appearances, and you need to be able to be close. Uh, so the satellite offices is difficult to do. We haven't started looking at that um, until we're absolutely out of space, um, but we haven't. We haven't started looking, but thank you. thank you. Okay, Supervisor Landon. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much to you and your team because you're amazing and you do such great work and just really appreciate that you are always looking for opportunities to be innovative and think outside the box and creative. So thank you for that. And then I have a question. Um, so with the Sheriff's Department having a, a target number of 1.2, deputies per 1,000 people. Is there anything that exists on the prosecution side of things for um, targeted prosecutors or targeted, I guess, maybe cases per prosecutor for when that growth is happening? There, there are and there have been attempts to try and correlate it. I mean, there is a sort of general population to prosecutor ratio. The problem is cases are all different, so it's hard to say 
you know, you may have a murder case and you may have a couple of theft cases and it's hard to say, you know, this case is going to take exponentially more time than the rest of the case. Um, so it's difficult because a lot of these are nuanced to sound like a total lawyer in your answer. Um, but I've, I've been trying so that I could give you a little bit more like a, a data driven uh, number that correlates to it. I, instead, what we look for is, okay, how, how are, and we all know as career prosecutors, okay, if you've got you know, 30 cases set for trial, that's too many. It needs to be down closer to 15 or 20. You may have 200 in your caseload, but, you know, in various stages, in this critical stage, that's way too many. And so we all kind of know what those are. Um, it just is hard to, to replicate that across the, across the state. But I'm, I'm, I'm working on trying to give you a better sort of number view of, of how many prosecutors we should have. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I think it was the, the I just did it, correlated it by population size. Uh, and there were most of the counties that were our size had 10 to 12 more than we did. Uh, and some of those that only had half our population had only two lawyers fewer than we did. Um, so those are the metrics that I've tried to use, uh, but I'll try and get some better scientific ones. Okay, thank you for that. I did hear when Sheriff Wu said that, I, I turned to Dave and said, I need numbers like that. That's a, that's a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Supervisor Gustafson. Thank you, and I'll echo uh, Supervisor Landon's comments and Supervisor Almas. You've done a great job, oh, and we really appreciate the team that it takes um, to protect our citizens and to prosecute those individuals. Um, I should re remember this, but I don't. Percentage of your budget that is general fund? I don't think I caught that, or I should know that, but. Um, based on the, uh, the actuals on 22-23, that was 61, 60%, 61%. Okay, general fund and then the Out of the state. total revenue. Okay. Thank you. And then, you know, a thought keeps coming up because we heard it with the sheriff as well as your presentation. Technology is wonderful, but it's placing this incredible burden. At the same time, technology should be trying to help us be more effective in our jobs. Do, have you seen any of, any? Oh, it, it, it yeah. absolutely, I, I yeah. didn't mean to no, cut you go off. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, and, and redirect me if I misunderstanding your question, but let's take body cams, for example. Mm -hmm. It'll ultimately help cases resolve mm -hmm. um, because the issues that you would ordinarily fight about in trial are clear one way or the other. The problem is it still takes all that time to get there. Right. Um, so it's not a time saver, but it is more efficient because ultimately what we're after is the truth of what happened on a particular instance. Okay. And anything, any piece of technology that gets us closer to the truth helps us ultimately in our mission, which is to do justice and to do the right thing. Right. The problem is the technology doesn't save us time because we still have to review those hours of body cam footage right. or we still, have to, we still have to analyze the cell phones or we have to still do the warrants to try and figure out what that truth is uh, and that still takes a lot of right. a lot of time and and on the on the fentanyl side of it those cases are so intensive in the in the digital forensics yes. that yeah. that even on the cases I mean as, as you've seen we've had how many fentanyl poisonings or overdose deaths and we've charged four total with murder which means there's a lot I mean that's probably the biggest variance of any crime type uh, I mean most of the residential burglaries that occur we prosecute most of them, but there's such a variation, and that's because we have prosecutors and detectives going through hours and hours of, of digital technology only to come to the conclusion that we're not going to be able to file this case. And no one ever knows, okay, it doesn't reflect on any number, but no one knows that somebody just spent 400 hours on a case that never saw the light of day, but that was the right thing to do because that's what justice demanded in that particular case, okay. if that answers yeah. your question. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Supervisor Gore. Uh, just one thing, thank you for the presentation and for the explanation of the changes and challenges with your uh, department. It's appreciated. Um, I did notice yesterday uh, a supervisor from another county was promoting um, information about one pill can kill. And I just so appreciate the fact that it started here with you and your team, with Lisa, with Stephanie, um, to see that not only locally but statewide is just something I think you all can be so proud of because clearly it's making a difference. And seeing the data that the sheriff showed earlier about fewer number of deaths in our county is, is just tremendous. And teaching our young people about this is just great. So I just 
Thank you. It really, really matters, and I know that that's above and beyond, but like you said, preventing it upstream is so important. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to thank you very much for all of that. I did want to point out, though, that I think you've increased your workload, fortunately for us, because now the fentanyl prosecutions, that's something we never really did prior to your term as our as our DA organized retail theft now on the on the rise in our prosecutions as well as the environmental crime and to the addition of our body cams with for the sheriff that has created another workload for you so I mean even from last year your presentation here on what you're responsible for doing and what you are doing has increased immensely I would say um, perhaps if you could capture some hours spent going through those videos whether you know you can it doesn't really matter to us whether it goes to court or it doesn't it's workload that has to be completed um anything like yeah, that that's that a you great can, point you know anything like that that you can help us capture as far as your duties and responsibilities because i know you're doing so much more even i think than last year it's it's incredible your your staff your team um, it's amazing the work that they that they can do, and 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 you get around, Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> I which, do, <laughs> which is a wonderful thing. As my wife says, it should be home a little more often, but <laughs> hey, it's a big benefit to Placer County, and we really appreciate that very much. We appreciate all of you back there, plus everyone else at the office that isn't here today. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you all very much. Good luck over the next day and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on. Probation. Um, welcome, Marshall. <laughs> Good, how are you? All right, well, good morning. It's good. always a pleasure to follow Morgan. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Anyway, Thank you. Um, <laughs> Chair Jones, members of the board, I'm Marshall Hopper, your chief probation officer. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. A couple of my staff here in the audience as well. Um, first off, I'd like to thank the board for your support um, over the years and your support and commitment to, to public safety and to our citizens. I also want to recognize our CEO's office. Daniel, thank you for your support. Amanda, um, it's been a pleasure to work with you over the last year, and I think we've accomplished some great things, so thank you for that as well. Um, I also wanted to make a couple brief comments. I think it's important to emphasize that all of our accomplishments here at the probation department are truly a direct result of our workforce, of our employees. Um, because our employees demonstrate their commitment and their ability to do the job on a daily basis in the office, in the field, and in the community working with the difficult population. So all of the accomplishments and things that we do would not be possible without their dedication. So thank you to all of my staff. I appreciate working for you. Um, now moving forward, Jeff's gonna pass out a brochure to give it to you guys. It's our 20, uh, 2023 annual report business summary. You can take a look at it whenever you have some time. Um, and uh, for anybody interested, there is a uh, copy out front and it will also be posted on our um, website later today. Now, looking at some of our cost areas, um, uh, really we're broken down into two, to simplify it, into two categories. Um, our adult services, you know, with our adult court, our alternative sentencing programs, our community supervision programs, and of course our prep or reentry programs as well. Um, in addition to our juvenile services, our early intervention programs, um, juvenile supervision, and of course, we do operate the juvenile detention facility, which is um, operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So primarily, um, our cost areas have basically remained the same um, as years past. Now, looking at some of our um, accomplishments, I um, wanted to emphasize over the last year that we've continued our outreach services with the unsheltered population. Um, enforcing court orders of the individuals that are on probation or supervision, but really connecting with people. 
connecting with them to provide them services and um, possible housing opportunities and to really get out in the community because we all know this is a um, high priority of everyone. Um, it's a significant priority and we are committed to doing our best to, to really continue our efforts there. In fact, just last year, our outreach team made over 6,300 contacts, um, each time engaging with people, making appropriate referrals, and trying to promote some positive change in that area. Now we also, um, I know everyone's familiar with our probation outreach vehicle. Um, we now, uh, the grant that went through last year, we, we were able to obtain additional grant funding and we've purchased a secondary vehicle. So now we have a full-size Sprinter van in addition to the probation outreach vehicle. It's currently in the process of getting um, all the bells and whistles set up on it so we can do some increased um, uh, uh, community contacts. So really between the, the larger vehicle and the primary areas and then the Sprinter van will increase our ability to really get throughout the county to connect and engage with this population. Now looking at our next item, our professional standards division, I think, I think it's important to note that uh, our professional standard division really is a the backbone of our organization. It is a division that is responsible for recruitment, background investigations, and training. And this plays a critical role within our organization and really helps to find the culture within our department. Because we all know that hiring qualified applicants and um, individuals truly makes a difference, not only in our ability to do our job as probation officers and a probation department, but really allows us to remain neutral and bring our balanced approach to the justice system and how we interact with people, how we support the court, and how we support all of our justice partners as well. Um, you know, I think that uh, the success really involves or revolves around that, and we're gonna continue to, to do our best to hire appropriate people. I think in the training area, I think it's important to note that this last year we completed over 10,000 hours of training um, in our department um, and from a wide range of topics. Um, but a couple that stand out are motivational interviewing, mental health, and de-escalation tactics. That really brings us to the key components of the justice system is really bringing a balanced approach to help people get to a better place and where they need to be. Because I think that providing a, a diverse range really brings that balance, and I think that it is, is, is a key component to our justice system in general. Now looking at our next item, and this is a kind of a continuing item that's been on, uh, on, on before, but really I think somebody had a question earlier about how do you, how, how do you measure um, a certain number of people with staff, that kind of a thing. This is really our crux of probation is our risk assessments, meaning that, that our staffing pattern for community supervision revolves around that risk assessment and our ability to have high risk caseloads at lower levels like 30 to 50 and then the medium risk caseloads and so forth. So the ability to continue a risk-based approach um, really emphasizes the importance of, of how we categorize this and we're very proud of that. I will note that we are one of the few probation departments in the state that actually supervises misdemeanors. Um, many don't. That's because I believe that a misdemeanor can be just as dangerous to our community as a felon because of the history. And that's where we get back into the risk score. You, just because you might be a person on probation for a misdemeanor doesn't mean that your risk assessment makes you a high risk to our community and a high risk to our citizens. So that's one of the, the categories that we're really um, emphasizing that we're focusing on and we're very, very proud of that. Um, and I think the next component really is our continued engagement um, because based on the risk assessment like we were talking about, um, we need to be able to keep seeing these individuals, um, making sure they're complying with the conditions of probation and doing what they're supposed to. And we made over 13,000 unannounced contacts last year. That means that we are out and about, you probably see our cars driving around town, checking up on people, but 13,000 is a pretty phenomenal number. Um, that means that, you know, on any given day in 2023, for example, that's over 50 unannounced contacts a day. 
That's 50 surprise visits. That's 50 probation searches. In fact, if we were to go figure out the math, there's probably been a dozen or two probation searches since I've been here sitting in this meeting this morning. So that's the crux of the supervision is to make sure that we are making sure they're held accountable for the conditions of probation, following court orders. But at the same time, each one of those contacts is an opportunity for a, a program, um, uh, assisting them in getting to a better place, services, mental health services, our partnerships with HHS. So the key component to that is that balanced approach of supervision, balancing the court orders, and providing them services as well. Now, in regards to some of our challenges, emerging issues, um, I think that we have to look at our pretrial services program. Uh, we were one of the second or third departments in the state of California that developed a pretrial program back in 2010, and a lot's changed since then. Uh, um, just recently, um, there was a grant that goes through the court process that we're involved in and designates us to perform pretrial services. And that kind of emerged in the last two years, I think it was. Um, so we've moved to over 700 people currently on our, our, our pretrial programs. And those are individuals that may have or would have been or have been released from, from our local jail. So this pretrial program provides a relief valve for the court so we can have a little bit of space in our, in our jail system, which we heard from our sheriff earlier. We know it's crowded. Um, so this is just one of those tools for our justice system to help alleviate that and help balance that. It also provides an opportunity for the individuals that are, that are pending court um, who have not been convicted yet, allowing them to participate, keep their jobs, keep um, being part of society while they're pending court and going through the process. But an important note here is our pretrial programs uh, have increased 40% over the last four years. Um, and in fact, our reports, every single court hearing that, a pre that those 700 people have, we do a report that goes to the court. It talks about what's their status, what programs are they in, have they seen us, that kind of a stuff, that kind of stuff. That's increased by 21% in the last year. So just this last year alone, we submitted over, uh, excuse me, just this last month, 750 pretrial reports a month just for this division. And what that's boiled down to is a, is a, is a difficult process, extreme burden on our clerical support staff and some of our probation officers who are actually submitting these reports now instead of relying on, on, on the support of our clerical staff because the, the, the demands just keep coming. Um, and I'll, spoiler alert, you'll see that at the end of our supplemental slide. Um, another emerging issue, I think, uh, really revolves around the closure of the Division of Juvenile Justice, DJJ. We talked about this last year. Um, this is uh, meaning that the individuals that were sentenced long-term historically used to go to the state-run facility. That's no longer an option for anybody, so now they come to our facility, very similar to parole realignment that we're all very familiar with. Um, looking in your brochure, you'll see that the average length of, of stay in our juvenile hall was 19 days. As you can see, that's changing because we now have uh, an individual sentenced to our juvenile hall for over four years. Um, this creates challenges. We're used to short-term um, opportunities for these kids to get in, get out, get back with their families, and now we have a long-term individual and several others that are pending court that will probably be long-term as well. Um, but we're going to continue to strive to do the best possible things that we can to keep these kids um, in a positive direction. For example, we've recently partnered with Sarah College, and we have four kids currently housed in our facility attending college, which I think is pretty cool. Um, a couple other uh, challenging or emerging issues. Um, one can't not think about the state deficit, the budget. Um, it's a point of everyone's conversation dealing with government and where it's at and where it will go. The probation department has several sources of revenue from the state, um, and there's always some question on the, the decreasing um, revenues coming in and how that will change and affect some of our programs. But in addition to that, to that you know, there's always been some uh, uh, numerous items of reform bills coming through, um, discussions at various groups of the Capitol, 
and consistently, and I think your uh, board supported us on a couple of them this last year, a couple of letters of opposition, regarding changing funding structures and how some of that money gets sent um, or, or diverted through the system. For example, our Juvenile Justice Crime Prevention Act money, our CCP dollars, um, there are some um, targeted areas regarding the structure of those funds. But I think it's important to recognize as we look at some of these issues, the changing of those funds could be a uh, emerging issue for all of us because some of those um, funds pay for things like the Crisis Resolution Center in Loomis. They pay for a portion of our Sheriff's Athletic League, Roseville Police Athletic League. They pay, they pay for part of our CASA program that have kids coming in, into our juvenile facilities. And they also pay for portions of our reentry program, including our prep services. So as those things, that's an emerging issue that's kind of like always on the radar, watching that to see when it might happen, if it's going to happen. Um, and I think that's a pretty significant item because it affects pretty, not only us, but really our entire justice system as well. And now, continuing our um, theme from last year, we can't uh, skip this section without talking about recruitment, retention, and succession planning. Um, I think uh, the revision of our professional standards unit that I talked about earlier, um, we made some great, um, some great accomplishments. In fact, uh, you know, We've really um, worked hard to, to get kind of over the, over the hump regarding our, our programs, our hiring staff, and our training. But in fact, this last year, we've hired 29 employees at the probation department. Um, these positions filled retirements, some vacant positions, a couple of the ones that we had, um, that, that we had previously. And um, we're really excited about this new process and we also brought in a couple other staff to sort of fill the gap there and really work at it differently. Um, we've also really focused on continuing our approach with um, our internal promotions. Um, I've always believed that to bring staff up through, through the organization, um, through our juvenile detention facility, as probation officers, the best that we can, and that really helps maintain the culture of, of, of our department and really helps us um, maintain the adaptive management approach that we're used to here, as well as our commitment to your board and our community. And looking here, we, we have um, our funded positions. Um, not much change. There was a couple changes last time, but a couple of those were increasing um, the uh, professional standards unit, um, a couple clerical staff, and an IT staff during that time period last year. Now, our, our uh, objectives and performance measures. Uh, this is a difficult slide for us um, because predicting this, I think, is pretty impossible, especially when you really look into it and realize that all these numbers really revolve around crime rates, arrest rates, and prosecution. And uh, that's, that's pretty difficult to, uh, to predict, so we do our best in that area. I, I um, continue to look at the numbers, but you will know, I think it's important to note that there's a couple items here, items two and three. Last year, the year before last, we went to a new case management system. You'll see a significant adjustment on there. Our new, our new system has the ability to truly capture things more efficiently and effectively, and so when we came across these numbers in our new case management system, we analyzed it and realized that these are the more accurate numbers. So we just did this, the asterisk at the bottom and updated it to kind of get it back up to where it needs to be instead of uh, the old system. So it's a positive. Now, I, I, I will note on, on one thing real quick, though, before we go in here. Numbers don't always tell the story. I, I, I've always emphasized um, uh, to many people the, the number as a meaning, but a lot of times it doesn't really portray the things that we do and the services that we provide. And speaking of services and programs, um, the numbers don't reflect the true outcomes uh, because it's hard to put a number on a life that's been changed forever. You, you can't really do that. Um, so when you have some time, I would encourage you to take a quick look at the, uh, the business summary. Uh, this year's highlights in that summary um, talks about one of our juvenile probationers' journey to success. There's also a letter from mom in there um, who was grateful beyond words. Um, 
You're going to have to just read it for yourself because it's a pretty amazing story. And I really think that that captures why we do what we do and, and the things that we do for our community. And I'm going to leave it at that and turn it over to our master financer, Jeff. Thank you, Chief Hopper. Uh, good morning, Chair Jones, Board, Mr. Chatney, Ms. Schwab. I'm Jeff Thompson. I have the privilege of being the Administrative and Fiscal Operations Manager for probation. Uh, as you can see, our proposed uh, operating budget for fiscal year 24-25 is a little more than $39 million, and we have no capital expenditures anticipated. The, this, uh, this slide here, um, we uh, regularly review operations and efficiencies to ensure public funds are spent prudently on the services we provide. Uh, and as this chart shows, you'll see that probation's uh, fiscal year 24-25 working budget is lower than the current fiscal year's budget, largely due to removal of one-time grant-funded projects. Here are the major budget uh, variances from year to year. Uh, Grant-funded one-time projects completed this year included implementation of court-ordered pretrial services, the Mobile Probation uh, Service Center, uh, that's the second vehicle that we, that we got, and some uh, juvenile detention facility renovations, which was the first time I believe in about 20-something years that that has been uh, updated, so it's, it's looking really good there. Uh, and you'll find more information about these in the uh, very professional business summary that uh, we handed out to you. And uh, let's see here, uh, probation does not have major one-time grant-funded projects anticipated for fiscal year 24 and 25, and uh, that's the, the largely why our budget has decreased by about a million dollars. You also see in the slide that um, salaries have increased as other departments have, and some you know decrease of A87 costs. And with that, I will turn it back to Chief Hopper. Great, and that brings us back to, to really our, our one item our supplemental item is to add a administrative legal clerk um, to um, our position allocations. Um, and that position will be specifically to handle those over 700 and something pretrial reports that we're doing on a, on a monthly basis. I will note that that grant that I mentioned earlier, um, uh, the money that goes through the court system, will fully fund that position and the court is on board with that. So there will be no additional cost to the county. It'll go through the grant through the court and be paid for by the court. So that is our presentation, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Marshall. And um, I mean, with you as well, just such great work and um, living within your means and doing just continually an amazing job at reaching out to people in the community who really need your services. So um, quick questions. Um, one, I was wondering when you talked about a shift having juveniles for long term mm -hmm. in your facility, um, are there similar requirements when it comes to mental health services for those kids like there are for adults in the jail? And if so, is that factored into kind of your long term plans? Yes, the hard part about that is um, prior to DJJ closing, we only averaged one to two kids sentenced to DJJ at any given time for the last 15 years or so. So in order to establish a you know, significant program for one kid, it's, it's not cost effective. And so what we've done with the money that we've, that we've received back from those commitments is um, utilize that in a fashion on an individual basis. Um, meaning that if we have an, uh, a kid in the hall that has these types of issues and needs, then we're going to hire out and bring somebody into the hall rather than hiring a, a whole counselor for one kid. Um, that way it's more cost effective. So that's kind of our plan. If, if that changes and we end up with, you know, a unit full of kids like this, then we're going to have to come back to the drawing board and really have a crafted plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And then on the SB 129 funds, mm -hmm. um, do you... Is that um, committed for a certain length of time, or is it expected to be in perpetuity? I know you said it's expected to be long term. Do you right now? Do you have a an idea on that? Um, I don't see that changing any any time soon. Okay. Um, I do know that you know in the event that it does, uh, we have retirements and people leaving all the time. We would be able to absorb that and make it work. But I don't see that being an issue at all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Supervisor Gore. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chief. Thanks. Appreciate the update. Um, to add some additional questions about the juvenile facility. So you said you used to have one to two kids at one time. What's what? How many people are using the beds now, and what's our maybe vacancy rate or occupancy? Can you give give us a sense of the number of folks you're serving kids? So the population in the hall um, ranges around 20, 15 to 20. Um, at any given time, the facility capacity is 78. So uh, we've, over the years, have shut down um, uh, a wing. That way we could, you know, um, maximize um, our costs and not have, you know, excessive costs that don't need to be there. Um, we're currently staffed for 32. So 32 is kind of our number that if, if we hit, if we hit, get up to 32 is when we have to open up a wing. So we have some flexibility and some room in there for these, commi these commitments that are, that'll, that'll, that'll be coming. But like I said, the, the, the interesting part about Placer County, and I know you're all, all familiar with, it, with the Smart Collaborative um, and the amazing work that we've done working with HHS. Um, we are one of the very few counties and we don't send a lot of kids um, to that avenue. And we also have a, a good portion of the kids that come through that are of significant crimes get transferred back to the county where they where they are from, where their parents are from, and a lot of times that's the Sacramento, that's, a, that's Sacramento County, because a lot of those kids come up here. So that's kind of working in in our advantage in in this area. But um, I think uh, overall there's capacity. Um, we're we're doing fine. Um, I don't see any issues at, at this point. And remind me, do you uh, contract out to any counties to provide those services for juveniles? Yes, we house. Um, four counties. We have Nevada, Amador, El Dorado, and there's one more I'm missing. Jeff knows. We're, we're looking to also contract with Plumas. Plumas. Plumas County. And is that because they don't have a facility or are they? Nevada County shut down their hall a okay. couple years ago, I believe. Um, and the other ones, don't, they don't have facilities. El Dorado does, but it's in Tahoe, so they, they use theirs sporadically with us. Um, the the law says they have to have a facility or access to a facility and so we charge them a daily rate for the kids that they bring to us great thank you um and i want to i have one question for daniel daniel i noticed um that the eight hundred seven thousand decrease in the transfer that um a87 costs some other departments um showed that as well i i think i saw that in either the da's or the sheriff's budget so why are their expenses lower for the <clears throat> do you, item? Supervisor Gore, do you want the short answer about cost plan A87 charges, or do you want me to take the rest of the afternoon? Short would be fine, <laughs> thank you. So cost plan is, is a cost that's derived basically from two years prior. So it, it fluctuates annually for a lot of departments. So <clears throat> they, we, we project the new year's cost based on two years actuals and then we readjust at the close of those years for the actual costs that were incurred. Then those roll forward into an, an account. But basically, it, the short answer would be in something like this, departments either used less of countywide services or the costs that were charged out were less. Thank you, that's <coughs> helpful. Um, and then just, um, yeah, I noticed a couple of your team members there. Um, and. I know there's been a lot of fo focus on the unhoused, the homeless, and thank you so much for all the work that you do. But as you were coming up, I'm thinking that about the fact that um, we, we see police officers or sheriffs and the tough work that they have. But your team has um, really challenging work as well, right? Because these are the folks either going into the criminal justice system now that we're seeing these pretrial needs and folks coming out. Um, and so I just really appreciate it because it's not easy, um, not an easy job at all, um, but your team does an excellent job and especially with looking at programs and making sure folks actually get trained so that they can actually get a job um, when they get out of the system. It, that's, it says a lot about how much work you all are doing because that makes a difference. It changes people's lives when they actually get the services they need and the mental health programs they need and then can actually have a new life um, outside the justice system. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Okay, Supervisor Holmes. Well, well said, uh, Supervisor Gard. Uh, you stole my <laughs> comments, but 
you know, over the last several years, I've worked closely with your department and you've done a lot of innovation and uh, your team is out in the community uh, all the time. I've watched them closely, been involved with them. It's really, really refreshing to see the work that the probation department does and your staff uh, does for our county. And I, I just have to say, you're, you're kind of like the unsung hero of our criminal justice system. So uh, anyway, I just want to thank you for all, all the work that you do and your staff. Well, thank you. I, I, I've often told the story like, you know, when they say, what does a probation officer do? And I said, well, after the police arrest them and the, you know, the prosecutor gets the sentence and then we try to fix them. It's kind of, that's what we do. <laughs> Thank you. Supervisor Gustafson. Uh, I can't, you've stole my thunder, so <laughs> thunder all the way around. Thank you, great applause to all the efforts uh, the probation department provides, and I especially wanted to call out the CHIPPER program. Yes. Near and dear to so many residents in our district anyway that uh, use those services and are so grateful. But again, um, the individuals that are going out, I hear from the, the residents how polite they are, how accommodating are, and you know, just tremendous opportunity for them to turn their lives around and get back into productive service to our community. So thank you for that. Great, thank you very much. And I would like to add a few things as well, um, because I think I've seen how your programs have expanded, just like the district mm -hmm. attorney's programs have. I mean, you've added another outreach vehicle, mm -hmm. so that's more, let's call it vehicle miles traveled. <laughs> Something none of us like to hear about, but it's good for you guys. <laughs> but it's good for you guys. And as well as your um, work with our homeless population, since we added the, the uh, temporary mobile shelter, you know, in the last year. Yes, certainly. And I think that's, 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 a, that's a great point. It's, it's a... It's a lot to, to take on, and we've got a good team. We have our, our new pr probation manager in charge of that team is Molly Ronco, and she's doing a, fa doing a fabulous job. So we're really proud of the work that she's doing and the opportunities that our team is taking care of. As we are as well proud of what you guys have done with that. And so I want to congratulate you on taking on more, more work, more responsibility, and shining through it. And um, you guys aren't really even asking for more staff here. It's a perfect situation. <laughs> it is a perfect situation. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much for your reports today and for your time. We really Thank appreciate you. it. Okay, so I believe we are ready for a short break. Um, you're going to be taking a 20 minute break. So, a little off schedule, but that's okay. You can shorten it, make it longer, whatever you want to do. Just flex. I think we probably could use 20. Don't you think? Can you guys use 20? Give us a chance to get more to drink and. Let's take a 20 minute. We'll shorten it up later this afternoon. Anyway, see you all back later in 20 minutes.
Microphone. Good afternoon. Welcome, welcome back from our little break. <laughs> good afternoon, Ryan. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Okay, I guess we were we're on to. Okay, clerk recorder elections with Ryan Ronco. Take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Jones and members of the board. We appreciate the opportunity to be able to come here today. I see it's no tie day, so I guess I'm gonna take this off. <laughs> this was Gentlemen are not wearing ties apparently today, so. It's kind of like there we casual, go. casual Friday. <laughs> exactly, I love it, it's fantastic. Uh, I am Ryan Ronco, your Registrar of Voters, Clerk Recorder Registrar of Voters. With me uh, are uh, Lisa Kramer, your Assistant County Clerk, Stephen I, our, uh, your Assistant Recorder Registrar, and Melissa G. Uh, our fiscal manager. Uh, I'd like to thank Lisa Holloway and the CEO's office for all of her help uh, getting us to this point, uh, preparing our uh, budget with us. And I'd also like to thank the hardworking team of the Placer County Clerk Recorder Elections Office. Uh, in the time since our last budget presentation, they have implemented a successful move to uh, our South Placer office and managed a lot of changes in the way we conduct elections here in Placer County. And they are amazing and we certainly appreciate working with them. Go to next slide, it says in my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, as the clerk recorder registrar, I guess it's not surprising that my office's budget is uh, spread across clerk services, elections, and recording services. Uh, however, uh, since I have a couple of minutes, I guess uh, 25, I'm gonna try to do with this faster though so we can get back on time. I'm gonna channel my inner Paul Harvey and tell you <laughs> the rest of the story uh, in our numbers. Uh, the recording division numbers are still pretty flat. Currently, we record around 300 property records uh, a day. Uh, we're slightly up from last year and roughly equivalent to the 250 documents a day that we would record uh, after the econ economic downturn in 2009. Uh, we, processed, uh, uh, we processed in this last year over 2,000 passport applications. Unlike the recorder's office, our clerk services uh, division has not experienced a slowdown. We uh, last year just fi filed just over 9,400 birth records and almost 5,000 death records in the office. We had just over 2,300 marriage license applications filed in our office last year, and we performed 746 in-office weddings. And I know this is the stat that you're all dying to hear about how many uh, rings we sold in the office last year. <laughs> uh, we sold uh, 83 uh, point of sale wedding rings in the office last year as well to those couples, those 746 uh, people getting married. And of course, there's the elections office. Uh, Placer County is currently the 18th largest uh, uh, county in California in terms of voter registration. And uh, as of the last Secretary of State report of registration, our county is the third highest, uh, has the third highest percentage of eligible residents who are actually registered to vote in the state. Just over 93% of our 
eligible residents are registered. And that's quite remarkable for a growing county like Placer. Uh, so we had a ton of accomplishments uh, this last fiscal year. I'll highlight a few of them for you. First off, we certified the 2024 presidential primary election results yesterday. Our turnout of 48% was just behind Sonoma County's turnout of 51% uh, for the highest turnout among counties over 150,000 registered voters. And it was 13 percentage points higher than the statewide average uh, turnout. Next, we completed the move to our South Placer Atherton building. But of course, uh, we have kept a team of clerk recorder folks here in Auburn to serve the central county region as well. And we've relearned quite a bit about how to operate in two locations since it's been since the year two, uh, 1997 when we've had an office split across two locations. But at that time, we were only about 900 yards away from each other. So it's a little bit easier to manage. So uh, we are relearning uh, how to work in a world where the offices are not in one, under one roof. Uh, thirdly, we installed our new uh, sorter for vote by mail envelopes. This machine has increased efficiency in ballot processing because it uses an integrated laser to cut the area away from our ballot envelopes that hides the signature on our vote by mail ballot envelopes. In the past, we'd employ a small army of people to sit there with uh, taking off perforated uh, tabs off of those envelopes. And so we've been able to really create some efficiencies there. And the last accomplishment I'll highlight was our transition to the Voters' Choice Act. Uh, the election itself was very successful. Uh, we were hoping for three outcomes by moving to the Voters' Choice Act style of conducting elections. More ballots in the count by the time we finished counting on election night, a faster end to the post-election post ballot counting, and an increase to in-person ballot counting. And we were able to achieve all three outcomes. For the uh, last few elections, as more people were using vote by mail ballots to vote, we were seeing only about 30 to 40% of our ballots counted by the end of election night, uh, leaving 60 to 70% of our ballots to count in the post-election period after election day. This election, we counted over half of our ballots by the end of election night, which gives our candidates and the public greater certainty in what the election outcomes are going to be. Additionally, we finished the count faster. For the last few election cycles, it would take us three weeks or more after election day to have nearly all of the ballots counted. Uh, this year, we had the vast majority of our ballots counted within the two weeks after the election. The last couple of weeks, we've just been adding some ballots here and there, not very much. Um, and then uh, finally, while there wasn't a huge change in voter behavior, we did see the in-person voter turnout increase from around 8% to 11% in this last election. Uh, that was primarily due to the vote by mail uh, voters scanning their ballots at the vote centers as opposed to just dropping off a vote by mail ballot and leaving it to be scan uh, scanned later. Uh, without those 8,000 or so people that took advantage of scanning their ballots at the vote center, um, we, our in-person turnout would have been about 6,300 voters or under 5% of our total voters. So we did accomplish our three goals by moving to VCA. So now we'll move on to uh, merging issues and departmental priorities. Uh, obviously, we've, uh, we've conducted, uh, or we, we, conducting the 2024 election uh, was listed as uh, uh, a concern. Obviously, that's gonna be a big part of what we do this year, or this coming fiscal year, is conducting that presidential election. It's only 217 days away. <sighs> Take a big sigh. Uh, I'm still smiling. Uh, next, we are preparing to replace our beloved, or at least beloved by the people that watch elections closely in Placer County, uh, online election tracker system. It needs an overhaul as the current application was developed over six years ago and needs a version upgrade. Uh, this upgrade will include better manageability by my IT uh, team and updated user experience for the candidates and the public. Uh, in addition uh, to the election tracker, the the entire Placer County Elections Office website is in sore need of redevelopment. The site was also conduct, uh, uh, created six years ago. And while it is a wonderful website design, all websites need makeovers eventually, including updated coding on the back end and ensuring the site needs, uh, meets all ADA requirements, which is necessary in my, uh, in my world. On the other side of the house, last year you approved our request to replace our current clerk recorder 
uh, data management system with a new vendor. We have been slowly working uh, with a vendor on a contract. We hope to start that project in the, uh, this summer and expect it, it, uh, for it to take 12 to 14 months to complete. So um, we uh, should hopefully be on the road to getting that finished uh, and eventually finished in about a year. And finally, your board has already approved our use of trust funds to bring outside help, bring in outside help to move 17,000 recorded maps to our new space saving so uh, storage system in the Atherton building. Uh, this entails removing each map from its old cabinet, carefully removing the current adhesive on the map, uh, those hanging strips that are attached to the maps, placing the map in a new mylar sleeve, checking and when necessary, updating the indexing information in our system for each map, and then filing it away in the new storage hangers. Um, so those are our emerging issues and, and our priorities. Uh, we're asking once again to, uh, or you asked us again to prepare some objectives and performance measures. Um, all of our performance me measurements fall under the innovative, integrated county services critical success factor in the county's list of uh, strategic plan priorities. I'm sure you've spent hours combing through uh, all of these spreadsheets, and so I won't really reiterate uh, much of this. You can see our objectives are to process recordings quickly, to maintain a clean voter roll, to conduct elections accurately and with transparency, and to increase access to our forms online. And I'll be honest, it's really hard to create meaningful measures of these objectives. These should be our objectives, and they are, but uh, to measure it, it's just in, the proof is in the pudding, right? Uh, however, we've done our best to create some measurements that uh, will capture if we've hit our objectives or not. And that's that slide. Um, I'm guessing that this slide is pretty self-explanatory. Our total budget is all in operating expenditures with a breakout of 54% in salaries and employee benefits, 40% in services and supplies, and 6% in A87 costs. And this slide is kind of ugly, but it's for pretty obvious. I'm not talking about the blue and the green. That's beautiful, but the slide itself is uh, not the greatest, but it's for obvious reasons. We had uh, a pretty big bump in expenses because of the cost of extra help that we need to, uh, to hire to conduct elections. Uh, temporary help expenses are much higher than, now than they were in previous elections, of course. And I'm not talking about the number of people because that actually did reduce, but the fact that we must pay the people we hire much more than what we used to pay our temp help. As for revenues, uh, they have been declining. Our revenues come primarily from recorded property documents, and people are just not making the number of transactions with us as they were when interest rates were lower. However, we do historically experience an increase in election office revenue every other year uh, when special districts, school districts, and cities reimburse us for election services for their general elections, and that bump will occur in this fiscal year coming up. Overall, we are forecasting about a $1.1 million increase in expenses for fiscal year 24-25 due to the presidential general election and our supplemental requests, although a portion of our supplemental requests will be paid for with uh, existing recorder trust funds. And here's a slide that goes more into detail about what I just said. An anticipated $990,000 increase in revenue for services rendered from the 2024 presidential general election. $200,000 increase in expenses for temporary staffing costs. $160,000 increase in service contract expenses. And $121,000 increase in expenses for the election website redesign and for the expenses associated with supporting the Auburn Satellite Office. And uh, we're not asking for any new positions this year, only to fill the currently funded positions that are vacant at this moment. And as far as supplemental requests go, we're looking to purchase some new equipment, $20,000 to replace document scanners, map scanners, and other uh, map plotters, and recording department uh, uh, equipment, and $200,000 with $150,000 of that to come from the recorder's office trust funds to purchase additional servers and storage arrays. So uh, that's it for my presentation. 
I got a little nervous when the sheriff came up. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for being here. Uh, Lisa, Steve, Melissa, and I are prepared to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Okay. Board members, questions? Yes, Supervisor Gustafson. Thank you. Uh, well, first off, compliments to the whole team. I mean, what an incredible year and all the transition that you've handled so smoothly. Thank you. Um, I was interested how many, because we've had kind of a variety of individuals provide testimony on concerns about election transparency and other things. Um, how many observers did you have during the course of this primary? I would say it was lower than in previous years. I would say around 50 to 60 people came in. We did have some groups that I'm counting as just one kind of body. Um, uh, but uh, not as many people that came up to the counter saying, I just don't know if I can trust this. And where we then spur of the moment say to that person, if you have a moment, we'll take you back. We would love to show you around and, and explain what we do to protect the vote. Uh, fewer of those people, more um, scheduled visits or recurring uh, visits, people that came multiple times to watch different uh, activities. Um, but uh, it's always great and uh, always a great time for me to tell people we really encourage that and we are more than happy to have mm. people come by to uh, see what we do, ask their questions, and hopefully walk away with a better understanding and a and appreciation of the uh, protections that we have in place for the vote. Well, the individuals, you know, when I was there, um, the individuals, the staff, the incredible work, and and uh, you know, the the new facility and the transparency that provides as well. But I did direct a few who question, uh, you know, integrity, election integrity, and uh, to come by. And I don't know if they took me up on it, but I'm glad to hear that some did mm -hmm. and that your staff is so welcoming and transparent about everything they do and full of energy on uh, election day that's appreciate for sure it. thank you so much for all the compliments i really appreciate yeah those. but Great tremendous stuff. tremendous efforts and and work so thank you thank you and was this was the number one election for candidates for county supervisors that's in right. Many yeah, years, I believe. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think we had just about as many uh, back in boy, it was 2012-ish or something. It was when uh, there were quite a number of candidates also in District Five that year. Yeah, and uh, and it's yeah, it's it was it was quite a number of candidates. We uh, yeah. uh, we appreciated it though because it makes things a little bit more exciting, especially when, um, if you'll forgive the term, the top of the ticket, uh, the the presidential contest didn't really have the same type of draw because right. a lot of people saw that as decided. So it was nice to have uh, some contested races in the supervisorial area so that it could drive some more turnout. No, it's it's great part of the dem democratic process. So right. thank you. You bet. Thank you. Okay. Um, Supervisor Holmes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I think in 2012 there was three Johnsons in a right. <laughs> that is correct. That's right. Yeah, thank you for the correction. Yeah, 2012. That's right. Yeah. So it was a little confusing to yeah. the voters. Uh, um, you said there's 11% of the electorate actually went to the voting centers? Yes. I'm surprised. I would think that, you know, people that are afraid about their ballots not being counted, that they would take them to the voting centers and process them there. Right. But I guess it's just too much trouble, so they can just drop them off. And actually, on election night, uh, when I was going back and forth from my home, the line was lined up to put them in the box outside of the. So anyhow, I was just surprised about that. So do you expect that to raise? Yes, yeah. we do. Um, not because I, again, I, I would agree with you. I think that here, I don't know if it's because of Placer County or because of our transparency or just because people became accustomed to it, but. Before the pandemic, we had almost 83%, I think we had 83% of our voters signed up as permanent vote by mail voters. And yeah. then the law changed to create universal vote by mail mm -hmm. and more people jumped on the bandwagon. Yeah. So I think people trust it here, uh, despite what we hear in, in certain circles and, and all that. But uh, what we've been seeing is a number of voters taking the convenience of the vote by mail ballot but also wanting to turn it in on the last day on election day. 
And I think a lot of voters don't understand that those ballots don't get counted on election day. Right. If you're just dropping it off in a box or dropping it off in my office uh, or at a vote center, those are not being counted that evening. So this turn to vote centers allowed for people to take that vote by mail ballot, check in as if they were a poll voter, mm -hmm. and open that envelope so that they could have their ballot scanned right there in front of them. Yeah. And the satisfaction of seeing that happen in front of you, I think will only increase. And I think more voters will take advantage of that, which also conversely reduces the amount of ballots that we have to count post-election. Mm -hmm. So I think it also increases people's feeling that, oh, okay, more ballots are now in the system, so more ballots are being, are, have been counted. So it's a win-win really for all of us. I don't think that people are afraid of their vote by mail ballots not being counted, hopefully not, because they tr feel like they can trust us. But I do think that seeing it counted and the added benefit of us not having to count it after the election mm -hmm. is a huge win for everybody. Right. I voted by mail for years. And the main reason I do is to make sure my wife votes for me. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. There you go. <clears throat> Supervisor Landon. Uh, no questions. I just wanted to say I'm so excited that you guys are redoing your website. Oh, I good. feel like it's maybe, and this is no offense to you personally, mm -hmm. Ryan, but it's yes. like the online version of the domes, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited for you to be like, you know, more 21st century. It's, Even though I know it's only six years old. But anyway. It's, <laughs> I, I know, I'm sorry. I take that with the love that was intended. That's right. Thank you so much. It is time. And uh, there are uh, features that we could incorporate that we need to incorporate. And we are, we're looking forward to that. And uh, Steve will be working closely with all of you to uh, make sure that we hear what you see out there and that we can incorporate the same in ours. Thank you. So Ryan, I guess I will add on to all of that <clears throat> is that I think the voting centers were a huge success. Thank you. And I know I told a lot of people who inquired about them is how exciting it was that we can vote, take your ballot out, and vote right then and there. And I think people were amazed because I was hearing back from folks like, wow, we could do that now. So many people wait to the last minute to drop their mail-in ballots off, you know, either up there were at the elections office. But that was, that was really, really um, a great thing that we did with the community and everybody. Thank you so much. I'll, may I add just a second uh, on that? The, uh, we had, um, in raw numbers, it was around 15,000 uh, voters who went into a vote center and, and cast a ballot that way. Uh, and I mentioned 8,000 or so that actually took their ballot out of the envelope and, and, and were able to count it there. About 63, 6,400 that uh, requested a traditional day of election polling place ballot. But the, the, as far as the breakdown, um, in when they came, mm -hmm. uh, we want to get out to voters to let them know that these places are open, uh, some of them as, as early as 11 days, before, well, actually 10 days before the election, or 11 days if you count election day. Uh, we had about 4,000 of our voters of the 15,000 vote in the days before the election, and 11,000 show up on election day. Mm -hmm. And while that's great, and we want everybody to participate, uh, we're, we're mindful of the fact that come November, mm -hmm. those will be some significant lines. And so we're incorporating some ideas on how to be able to uh, service people that want to just bring their vote by mail ballot uh, with a special line, like an express 15 items or less line, right? <laughs> uh, and we're, we're hoping to be able to incorporate that for November um, and take some of the pressure off the other uh, stations that need to check voters in. And uh, we hope to be able to be ready for what should be roughly double the amount of people who participated this election participating in November. So that there, you know, there will be lines. We're, that's unavoidable. But we want to try to make sure that people know we're, we're addressing what we see or some concerns and making it better for November. Right, Thank right. You. So in addition to that, I wanted to mention the folks that did go to the elections office to watch counting of ballots. And the reports that I got back where they were very happy with the service that you provided, that you kind of did some hand-holding and 
you know, and helping people with, with that. And so. Well, I am single, so yeah, I'll grab <laughs> a lot of a lot, okay. a lot of oh. hand holding you did for everyone, <laughs> and a lot of compliments really on everything. Um, I think it was great. This is going to be a preview, though, of November. That now that people realize, those of us that did that, you know, had our ballots counted right then and there, word is going to spread. So you're right, a whole bunch more mail and ballot folks are going to be coming there to have their votes counted. Absolutely, and so we want to be ready for that. So, and we appreciate hearing all these great stories. We are, um, we're, we want to constantly improve and. Uh, hearing feedback uh, about what we're doing right also helps us. So we appreciate that. And uh, thank you very much for that. We do think that the vote centers were, uh, um, w went very well. We know internally some of the things that we want to fix and make better too, but, uh, but really it was a very, it was successful. And we're, uh, we have to tip our cap to not just these people that are here in front of you, but the people that are uh, that are the staff of the clerk recorder elections office uh, were just dynamic. They they saw issues, they thought of solutions, they worked just as hard as any of the people that are in front of you today uh, to make sure that that was a successful election. So thank you. Yes, and I agree. I think <clears throat> personally, I need to thank all of your staff behind the scene. Yeah. They've all been extremely helpful, and I'm sure as well to the other candidates. You know that ran have been running and will continue to run the services is, is is wonderful and you've been very helpful to all of us but i still have more questions thank you <laughs> no <laughs> off, off scene offline yes absolutely <laughs> madam chair i had one more comment if i could if you're done um i just i was negligent and and you know the old adage about the postal service neither rain nor snow nor sleet well those election workers at the voter centers in tahoe over that weekend Oh my gosh, and hats off to them. And one of my sons did go and vote on one of those days. I mm -hmm. said, oh, you should go down today. I bet they're not busy. And they applauded him when he walked in the door. <laughs> and you know, I just, I think it is amazing the dedication that that took. And you know, our county is diverse. And so thank you for the efforts there. Absolutely, you're so welcome. Thank you for mentioning that because I should have probably mentioned that it was, such an exciting time with all that snow falling and uh we were we were nervous right that things wouldn't open but every vote center did open uh and uh even the alta center which was dealing with fallen trees and uh no power but thankfully uh because this is a community that conducts an election not just my office but the sheriff's office oes uh libraries uh all, everybody it just jumps in and helps us be able to conduct elections. We did have um, a generator on uh, standby there at that location so we could be able to power that up. We had sheriff's office giving us, uh, um, uh, uh, ferrying us to locations, our people, so that they could be there on time to service people. And of course, the people of Tahoe are so hardy. They were not going to let that snow stop them from getting there <laughs> to work. So we did have a problem getting ballots over the hill. And so some of our ballots did have to spend the night in jail. Uh, I don't know if you know that, but I, our, I knew that, but I don't know if they all knew that. We, we had some ballots because of Donner Pass just being so snowed over uh, that we could not get the ballots over the hill. Sheriff's office thought it was just a little too dangerous to do that. And so we literally put the jail, the ballots behind bars for the evening and I uh, kept them there until we could be able to safely get over the hill, collect them and bring them back. And it, we have a picture of them literally sitting in jail. Uh, you know, but it was great. And just the partnerships that we have, we're just very blessed here in Placer County. To, they, everybody realizes how important this job is and they know that I can't do it all by myself. And so we're lucky to have everybody jump in and help. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ryan, for your report. And thank you to all your team that's here, as well as your team that's behind the scenes that have been of service to all of us. Thank you and so much, Chair Jones. Appreciate you it. Bet, you bet. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the assessor's office. Welcome, Matt. <laughs> There you go. Take the computer. Did Somebody Ryan leave his phone? phone? Ryan, is that your phone? I was just going to listen in on you. Well, we'll.
we'll turn the volume up for you. <laughs> good, good afternoon and welcome. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Yes. You guys have you guys have made it. I no. No, I've heard that is to give me the so wearable nice. thing. Yeah, leave it on. It looks great. <laughs> Would you like me to take it off? <laughs> hey. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, allowing us to be here, uh, Madam Chair and members of the board. It's always great to uh, see you. Um, we have a little presentation here to go over our budgets, and I know that you've had a very busy day and have another one tomorrow. Um, so I will try to get right into it. Uh, it's always very difficult to follow uh, the incomparable Ryan Ronco, um, but I will do my best to, to do that. Um, so first, I'd just like to go over uh, our office is split up into five different um, divisions, really. Um, uh, the bulk of the work is done in our appraisal and assessment um, teams, but we do have the um, support groups as well that also play a major part in our office. And some of our accomplishments um, in the last year that uh, we're, we're really proud of. Um, we actually, the last tax roll was the first time that Plaster County exceeded the $100 billion mark. Um, so that just shows how much our county continues to grow. Um, and that we are not, as you've heard from other uh, people, we're not a small county anymore. And, and we're starting to really face some of the issues and, and problems and challenges um, that some of the larger counties do have. Um, the other thing that we've been, we began working with ProWest and Associates um, to remap the county. Uh, we, we went before your board last year and, and received approval to actually remap the entirety of Placer County from the ground up from scratch. Um, so that, that is looking at creating the most accurate and detailed maps um, that would be available. Um, it, it, it really was time to upgrade our GIS abilities in Placer County. Um, and it, it was also imperative that we get ahead of this growth that we all know is coming to the West Placer area. The most accurate maps will really aid everybody with that um, development and growth from the constituents that we have out in the public and the development community um, to our staff here in Placer County as well. The other thing that we'd like to talk about is we also launched the property tax portal. So this was an idea accelerator winner from uh, a little while ago that somebody in my office <clears throat> had presented um, and actually won with, and it's a collaborative effort between uh, my office, the tax collector's office, and the auditor's office um, to create kind of a one-stop shop for everybody uh, to, to come and, and answer all of their questions or take care of all of their property tax needs. And it has taken some time to put that together. We did soft launch that um, in January, February. We haven't done um, a major announcement yet because we wanted to put it out there and try to see how it's working um, and uh, if there's any issues that we need to address before we start hammering it with everybody. Um, but this allows people to, to do the common things that they often go to all of our websites for, whether it's looking for property information or whether they want to pay their tax bill online. Um, there's, there's just a lot of different things that they can do all under one link instead of having to jump between our offices, which as I, I, I don't know about you, but that's very um, frustrating for me when I have to go do that um, with, with some of the other uh, state offices, I guess. Um, so we're, we're very happy with that. Moving on to some of the emerging issues and our priorities. Um, the big thing that is overreaching to all assessors' offices in every county in the state is the administration of the recently enacted Proposition 19. Um, so that's the inter-county base year transfer law, as well as the intergenerational transfers of, of property between family members. Um, it's, it's created a huge administrative burden on every assessor's office in the state, but ours, I think, is actually impacted the most as far as value. So there are other counties that have more Proposition 19 uh, requests than we do, like LA, obviously. Um, but they have 
uh, the vast majority is taking the base year value out of their county. Um, and so they're getting to enroll full market value on a purchase price um, when a property transfers in their county. In our county, um, people are bringing their low base year values into Placer County when they buy new homes here um, because people want to live uh, in Placer County. So uh, they're leaving some of the other counties and they are bringing those low values with them here. So um, I do have some numbers to kind of share with you because I figured that you would probably be interested in that. Um, so the, the Proposition 19 law went into effect April 1st of 2021. Um, the, the majority of it anyways. There was another portion that, that went active in, in February of 21. Um, but since inception, we have had 2,269 people use a Prop 19 um, exclusion tr on their transfer. But of those 2,269, 59 of them um, have taken um, their values out of Placer County. So the rest of that is people that are bringing their lower base year values into Placer County. And so that has impacted us quite a bit um, as far as uh, value on the tax roll. So we're showing a deficit since inception of $677 million um, and change off the property tax roll. So it, we are feeling it. Um, it, 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 it's not, devastating because we are able to offset some of that with some of the new growth construction that we've seen um, in the South Placer area. But um, it is a huge administrative burden on my office to the point that we've had to create a separate division that just does Proposition 19s. So um, there are five counties that the majority of people that are coming into our county um, so they are from Sacramento, Santa Clara, Contra Costa, Alameda, and San Mateo counties. Those are the top five. So people, people want to live in Placer County and with the new you know, work from home abilities and some of the offices actually closing, they're able to do that and so they'd, they'd rather work from home in Placer. Um, so another thing that we continue to to be challenged with is just the amount of assessment activity in the South Placer area. Um, they're, they're growing at a huge rate um, and that does put a big burden on our office as we have to assess, um, we have to process the, um, the splits of the maps, uh, the, the parcel splits, we have to process the transfers of the lots, we have to process the new constructions of the homes and then the ultimate sales of those homes into the secondary market. And so each one of those phases is something that we have to be, uh, that we touch um, and have to put a value on at those different phases. And the third thing that is going to be a challenge for us um, is the ongoing mapping project. So this is a, a four year project of that remap I talked about. It is gonna strain our resources and we're going to have to have some staff that dedicate some of their time to this project um, we're in the, the planning phases right now, so it's very difficult um, to, um, to, to, to know exactly what that's going to do uh, or how that's going to impact us and how many people, um, but we do know that that is something that uh, we do need to plan for. And moving on to the next slide are some of our objective and our performance measures. Um, the objective number one, uh, it's always going to be our number one objective because uh, that is what I am statutorily required to do and, and that is to, to accurately and timely complete the annual and supplemental property tax rolls. Um, so that's, that's the majority of, uh, that's why we exist. <laughs> so that is always going to be something that, that is our target is to get that done timely so that we don't have things go um, fall, fall uh, behind on that. Uh, the, the second thing we have is the expansion and modernization of GIS mapping systems. We've talked about that. That is an ongoing thing that we're going to be tracking. And we're always looking to um, enhance our customer service and our web presence um, and allowing access to the public. Um, we've, we've created a lot of forms. We've, we're continuing to update uh, those forms so people can sign them electronically. Um, and so it also, as, as, as Mr. Ronco mentioned, it is kind of hard to kind of put a uh, measure or, or what are some of the measure 
points that you would do on that, um, but um, they are on the slide. I won't, I won't put you to sleep with them as well <laughs> um, for tracking those as they go by. Uh, moving into more of the actual dollars and cents behind the budget, I, I wanted to take a minute and uh, introduce uh, Ashley Gabriel, who's my administrative and fiscal officer, and um, she'll be able to go over uh, some of those things for you, and um, we'll, I will turn it over to Ashley. Hello. Good afternoon. New with this. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, so on this slide, our operating um, expenditures budget is um, 19 million. 709,000, um, 80 percent of that is our salaries and benefits, um, with 18 percent of it being our services and supplies um, operating expenses there, and then we have about 2 percent in our A87 costs, and no capital expenditures. Um, our revenue and expense comparison, uh, we have, you can see our revenues remain Flat. I'm happy to report that as of today, um, our actuals are higher than our budgeted, so that's good for this year. But you know, with the fluctuating real estate market, it's hard to see ahead of ahead of time to see what we're going to be looking at for 24-25. And then our major variances: we have our 938 increase in our professional and special services for our IT, and majority of that is due to our um, contract with ProWest for our mapping project. And then we also have a million decrease um, for the assessment and tax collection fees revenue. Again, that's just due to our fluctuating real estate market. Uh, for 24-25, we're sticking at 87 um, employees. And right now we have three vacancies that we're hoping to fill with this next year. And we're happy to say that we have no supplemental requests for 24-25. Thank you for that, Ashley. Uh, is there, if we would love to take any questions if you have them. Okay, board members. <clears throat> Supervisor Gustafson, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Matt, great job. Ashley, thank you. Um, it's nice not to have a supplemental request. Takes one. We get to check one box. <laughs> Are we the first? Or <laughs> today, the first. first today. Um, but I did have a, a question, if you don't mind going back to the revenue and expense chart. Because your revenues are, how are those derived? That, that you're actually down below where you were in 21-22. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll try my best to, to answer that. Uh, the revenue that we actually, you know, the revenue that we get is actually a reimbursement of administrative costs right. to administer the supplemental role and, and tax okay. role. And so that does fluctuate very much with the real estate market. And so, you know, the, the 22 and 23 years uh, were a, a big boom um, as far as the real estate market in Placer County. And then this last year, um, it's it has slowed and that's the interest rates have gone up people just simply they don't want to sell their home mm -hmm. um, Because they have a lower interest rate loan already on the home that they own and if they were to sell that and buy a new home They would have to uh, take on that that interest rate at a much higher rate So we've seen a, a slow as far as like secondary and third, you know uh, sell uh, sales of, of existing homes, but the the new home builds are holding fairly strong but, but that's why there's that. That fluctuation that doesn't seem to trend with anything no. else and, other and than, I guess, the real estate market. So right. now I understand. And, and it's also, I, I think, you know, I think I mentioned this last year, but uh, it's not good for us to charge people to tax them. So, so we, don't <laughs> have, uh, we don't have expenses that we, that we pass on to the public to actually assess them. Uh, we figure they're probably paying enough in property taxes as it, as it is. Great. Well, with the uh, additional workload and not to have any supplemental requests again this year, I just uh, appreciate that. But um, I know that, that that Prop 19 is, and, and just the number of questions we respond to it, I'm sure other uh, offices do as well with constituents trying to use it, trying to figure out a way to use it. How can we take advantage of it? And uh, it's significant impact and it will continue on and grow so and, and that is the problem with prop 19 or I guess challenge with prop 19 is 
um, you know, there's the initial savings when the base year value is transferred, but then in every subsequent year, it, it just exponentially right. increases and we have to track every one of those until the Prop 19 is no longer, uh, the property is no longer eligible for the Prop 19, which, which could be in, into perpetuity. Right, because it could continue as a generational property, right? Correct. Well, it's a significant impact, and I don't know if any other counties or other assessor's offices are talking about this with the legislature. Was it anticipated to make this profound an impact? And well, and that was the the law did pass, and that it took some time. Um, it passed with no administrative uh, rules um, of how it would be implemented. It was the idea was passed, it was voted on, it narrowly uh, was voted in um, by the citizens of, of the state of California. And then they were kind of like, okay, now we have this thing, how are we gonna actually administer it? And that's usually a, a, a challenging way to actually pass laws, is, has been my experience. Um, and then that just gets forced on to uh, the Board of Equalization uh, and the assessor's offices to try to figure out what makes sense. And so there's been different iterations of, okay, here are the rules of how we're going to do this. And then as soon as they get those published, people go, well, what about this case? And what about this? And this is a weird one. And you didn't think about this and then they go back to the drawing board and come up with some new rules and then again it's well, yeah but you still haven't addressed this or this one and so it is a, a evolving and constantly changing way um, that we're trying to deal with these um, strange transfers that you know every one of them is unique and so to try to put them all in the box is is what everyone is finding has been very challenging well I really appreciate your staff's um, support and diligence in trying to respond to these issues that come up and you know your professionalism in dealing with it because it's a unintended consequence right of somebody's grand idea but we earlier today talked a little bit with the sheriff about some legislative issues that we should consider uh, weighing in on at times uh, and if this is another one if you hear of some efforts in other areas where we could weigh in let us know to help support you yeah thank you uh, and I will definitely do that um, I know that the California Assessors Association has um, you know is always concerned with this and is trying to come up with kind of a united effort as well to to address some of the, the challenges we're all facing um, it's you know that the, the one thing I would like to say is um, you know, my, the staff in my office, uh, the way that they have handled this challenge has just been um, amazing to watch. Um, and so there's no way that we could have done this without the amazing people that we have in that office. It's definitely not me. I mean, it's, it's our staff. Um, so I want to give a huge thank you to them. Well, they deserve it. Thank you. And your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Sup Supervisor Gore. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate uh, your presentation. And just a quick question for you about vacancies. You said you have three vacancies. I'm curious as to um, what those positions are. I know everyone's struggling with hiring um, higher level folks, actually probably any level folks. It's a challenge. So I'm just curious what the position openings you have are. Thank you, Ashley uh, had this for me, so that was it's very nice. Uh, we have a, a vacant uh, IT technician uh, position, and that's after a, a retirement, uh, an appraiser, one, two, which is an entry-level appraiser position, and uh, my chief deputy assessor who retired. Um, so that's a, that's a big hole yeah. uh, that we currently have. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, I guess it's my turn then. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you very much <coughs> for your presentation. Um, going back to Prop 19, our favorite subject, how many times can uh, a party transfer their tax base? Is it Each person can do it three times in okay. their life. And so if you are a married couple, you can do it six times. <laughs> we get so, six. so that six. means for each person in a marriage, both the husband and wife gets three times to transfer that. That's kind of crazy. Wow. Yeah. So you, yeah, essentially you can get your, you know, there, there, there are requirements um, with age and things, but you know, after 55, your base, your base value is basically your base value forever. And, and I mean, unless you move seven times. I, there's some people that do that, I guess. 
I can't imagine trying to move. I look at the stuff I have in my house and I no yeah. Do not tell my husband that. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, or me. Wow, I can move? It's kind of amazing, though, really, that people can come up from the Bay Area and have a lower tax base than you would get here in a new home, probably primarily because they've been down there 30, 40 or more years. Yes, it's, it's very common that they're selling their homes down there at a huge gain um, and then transferring that low base up here. Um, and they can buy a, a substantial home um, up here. Um, right, and get that lower tax Very easily base. qualify because of how much they were able to sell their initial home for. Is there a limit to how much uh, you can sell? There isn't. Your there isn't a limit, but it's um, it's it's a very complicated. Uh, it'd be very complicated to try to explain it. Right. But, but you basically anything that's over and above gets added on to the base that you are transferring. Okay. Okay. Well, that's clear as mud. But <laughs> and we have to track that difference too, forever, and report that. Uh it's That's amazing to me. So this Prop 19 has created an extra burden for you to keep track of absolutely these things, and the and the GIS mapping is the other thing that I was curious about. How long is the total duration from start to finish to, to doing all the maps in the entire county? I believe that the estimate is four years. <laughs> so because there's there are so many uh, assessor's parcel maps that have to be redrawn and remapped. We're, right now, we've actually just finished uh, phase one, which is the uh, figuring out the uh, requirements for the project. So that's getting our, our hands on all of the recorded documents um, that the county has in its possession that we have. Um, anything that we might be able to find from the federal government or the state government as far as uh, points on the map that are good points that everyone th has agreed that this is a, a very accurate point. And we have completed that, and so now they're beginning to actually map the first area, which would be a pilot area. So they've tried to find an area in the county that they thought would be a great representation that has a little bit of everything, and then we'll have to figure out, as issues come up, how we're going to address that. And then that would be the standard that we're going to um, work across the entire the entirety of the project. So do you think, <clears throat> since you're just starting the mapping part, you've done all the pre-planning for it, it's going to take about four years from now? I believe so, yes. Okay. So That's you're... hopefully faster, but <laughs> and, and hopefully not longer. Well, Matt, I say you're doing a great job as the, as the department chair. Well, thank and you. and um, in light of all that extra work from Prop 19 and the GIS remapping, you too have taken on an extra load like several of the other departments. So um, good luck with that. And we would like to thank you all for your presentation and your time. I have one real quick last question. Okay. Um, does this, it applies within the county too, right? You can, tran Prop 19, you can, uh, you can transfer within the county, not just inter-county, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Thanks. Yeah, they changed the law so that you can transfer it to any county in the state. Before there was, before you had to actually, the Board of Supervisors had to approve um, that you would accept people bringing in their base share values. Um, and Placer County was not a participating county at that time. Because I think, and that was a one time only deal formerly before this law. Yes. Yeah, yeah. one time. You could only transfer one time. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you again. Thank you very much. And have a great afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, moving on to our next. We're going to have the treasurer tax collector. Welcome, Tristan. <laughs> all right, Madam Chair, is there switching out? Yes. I might note that all of our electeds are wearing red ties. <laughs> that and Andy's power back there ties. too. <laughs> That's right. You guys, the powerhouse of. Uh, County operations, right? <laughs> Without you guys, we wouldn't operate. Hmm? It'd be better if we had <laughs> planned that, but apparently not. Yeah. Daniel, you're missing out on your tie today. I wouldn't say I'm missing out. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair, Good afternoon. Honorable Board. Uh, thank you for having us. Tristan Butcher, Placer County Treasurer Tax Collector. Uh, we're going to walk you through our bu budget presentation. Uh, let me start by saying thank you to the CEO's office for working with us on putting this presentation together and providing some of the information, and we will just kind of cruise on through it. 
Uh, here is a breakdown of the office. Uh, our major divisions, Treasury cash flow, uh, obviously making sure that there's enough funds available for not just the county, but the school district, special districts, fire districts, to meet all of their obligations. Uh, bond administration for uh, the county, uh, also our JPAs that have um, issued bonds, and then CFDs throughout the county. Uh, investments, that's where we're investing the funds in the county treasury um, to provide a suitable rate of return uh, to the constituents in the treasury. Tax collection, obviously you guys understand property tax collection. And then revenue services. This is new for 24-25, uh, and we will get into that in just a little bit. There's a, I guess, a sixth bubble here that we're not really including, uh, but it's really special districts and JPAs. Um, we do a lot of work with them. We're involved with them on all, a lot of different levels, um, and so they do take up uh, some time in the office, and we do have staff that work directly with them regularly. Our accomplishments for the past year, um, we managed the property tax volume of a $1.3 billion tax charge, uh, over 235,000 bills. Uh, there shouldn't be a dollar sign there. Uh, that's 235,000 printed bills uh, that we have mailed out. That includes supplemental and secured um, that went out and, and our unsecured bills. Uh, we manage all as aspects of the Treasury portfolio. This past year, our high point was $2.7 billion. As we head into the property tax due date on April 10th, uh, we're looking at probably surpassing $3 billion. Um, we launched our new user-friendly website. I know that sounds odd, but from the tax collector's um, point of view, the goal is to make it as easy as possible for taxpayers to pay their property tax bill. So we limited it as many clicks as possible, so that way that the taxpayers can get to pay their bill without having to sort through our website. Um, we also developed and deployed an online annual debt disclosure training. Uh, we previewed that last year. We launched it uh, to um, people throughout the county, different uh, financial uh, management members throughout the county, and they were able to take their annual debt disclosure training with the help of HR online at their leisure. So that way it's a little bit more flexible. This year, we are going to be launching it for the board members as the time uh, during board meetings has now uh, had such a premium that we feel that it's easier and more beneficial for you guys to be able to take that uh, at your leisure when it's better for you. And so that way that we're not taking up time during board meetings and making it a little easier to get the training done. Um, since you're all busy, it provides a little bit more flexibility. Emerging issues and departmental priorities. Um, so we'll circle back to the revenue services. Uh, the internal audit division of the auditor's office completed an internal audit. They made a recommendation to the CEO and myself uh, to transfer the revenue services division under the treasurer tax collector's office. Um, in the entire state, we were the only county that had our TOT collection outside of the treasurer tax collector's office. Um, so we're feel, we feel like we're aligning it with the other treasurer tax collectors. We're providing uh, revenue services the opportunity to be able to communicate with other tra uh, treasurer tax collectors, um, share resources, and um, it should provide uh, uh, a stronger office and give employees more of an opportunity to move up within the same field. Uh, so in the long term, I think that this is going to be very beneficial to both the Revenue Services Division and the Treasurer Tax Collector's Office. We also have possible county lease financings that are coming up. Uh, maybe the Crime Lab, Burton Creek, they look like they're on the horizon. We also have enhanced infrastructure finance district formation. Uh, that's coming before your board next week, I believe, as a, for your consideration. And if that moves forward, that will be uh, an increase in workload in my office to help pull that stuff together along with CEDRA and the CEO's office. We also have the development of major CFDs. Uh, like everybody else has talked about, growth here in Placer County, it's growing everywhere. And um, 
we have the BOLD program, which handles the majority of infill CFDs, um, but the major projects are being taken in-house, and they're either starting in CEDRA or they're starting in the Treasurer Tax Collector's Office, uh, and we kind of work with the different departments to bring them through the formation process and before they come to your board. Uh, so as these projects kick off, uh, Placer Commerce Center had its first meeting last week. Placer One, I think, is scheduled in a few weeks to start the kickoff process of forming these CFDs. Objectives and performance measures. Um, our objective, ensuring the responsible collection, management, and investment of public funds. Uh, that strategic plan priority of the board is the prudent and comprehensive financial planning. Uh, the performance measures, these are all statutory requirements uh, that are required by the office uh, for my position. So we either meet or exceed all of those targets. Our operating expenditures budget makes up the majority of it. We have no capital expenditures budget required for this year or requests. A revenue and expense comparison. Uh, you can see that our expenses are growing. We'll go over that in just a little bit. Uh, revenues are staying pretty flat overall. Uh, you see a little bit of a, uh, a jump up in 22-23 uh, where we actually increased and that was due to the new um, short-term rentals business licenses that were required that year. Last year those were no longer required. So you see a dip in our projected revenues of 23, 24. I think we are outpacing our current revenue projection. Um, and we're looking for a modest increase in revenue projection for next year. Uh, $550,000 increase, uh, our other fees and charges, $440,000 increase salary and employee benefits, just like everyone else. And then an $80,000 increase to our A87 charges. Staffing, this is a little bit misleading just in the sense that uh, it looks like we lost two positions from 22-23 through 23-24. Those were empower positions from um, the program and during the wind down, those positions were not filled. We just closed out those positions. Um, so we've been holding steady at 32 positions. We have four vacancies currently. We have no supplemental requests for the fiscal year 24-25. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Board members, questions? Supervisor Gore. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Tristan. Um, first of all, I want to say thank <coughs> you. Um, actually, wrong department. But I do have um, <laughs> one quick question, and that is, um, and I don't know if we've moved forward with this, you know, California State Association of Counties has that opportunity where um, people can pay their tax bill online at a much reduced rate. Um, and didn't know if we've had an opportunity to talk through the issues we had with those folks and look at implementing that that program if it makes so sense. So I'm still talking with uh, I believe it's Chase over there, and um, they're still running in the same issues that they have been. Uh, they haven't been able to make any headway on that. And once those issues are resolved, that might be something we can offer. But at this point, it's been about a year, and they still haven't been able to, to fix those issues. Um, would you have a, ch a chance offline, maybe share with me what those are? Sure. I'd like to be able to sure. maybe sure. approach it from a different way. That would yep. be helpful. Okay. Great. Sounds Thank good. You, Tristan. Supervisor Landon. Thank you. I have one kind of random question. Sure. So uh, do you see um, blockchain or crypto, anything in that realm being in the future of the treasurer's office? Um, maybe in the far, far distant future when things have changed greatly. But at this point, I, I don't see it. They fluctuate so quickly, their, their values, if we accepted it, say, today in a tax payment based on a certain value, it could change before we have a chance to exchange it into dollars. Um, so I don't, I don't see that currently. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Gustafson. Um, thank you. And thanks for the great work. It's a pleasure working with your office and getting all the answers I need like that. Thank you. Um, 
I agree, you know, and support, fully support the transition of the TOT revenues to you. It, it was never clear why we had two different departments, you know, collecting tax dollars, and it was hard to track, you know, calling different departments for sales tax data and then transient occupancy tax data, trying to put together that full picture. So it makes a lot of sense, and I'm sure it will do well under your leadership. Um, I know we got rid of Empower for certain projects, but we have had interest from some homeowners at looking at uh, home hardening opportunities or other types of opportunities that, you know, financing could help people stay in their homes longer because they can't control the insurance rates and some of the burden of replacing roofs and some of the other work. I don't know if there's other methodology or, or thoughts behind that, if other counties are doing that. Um, uh, I know we have unique circumstances always in Placer with so many people living in the WUI and, and needing those services, but I'd be open to hearing about that in the sure. future. Not to put more workload on you, but maybe you'd get a couple positions back if you needed them, um, just so that we could um, consider whether that is uh, something that might make sense. Definitely something I, I can circle back with you on. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and so I'm curious, as far as our residents paying their taxes, are their property taxes? Do we have a delinquency rate, or how's how is that going with the? We're not seeing anything that's out of the norm. Um, just a reminder: property tax due date April 10th coming up <laughs> yep Thanks. throwing it out there <laughs> thank you heads are due the 15th pay your property tax on april 10th so you don't get a penalty um we're not noticing anything out of the norm at this point uh we did uh, the the state started a program during uh covid that was um, a property tax assistance program where they actually helped people pay their their payments for property taxes that were way behind because of COVID. Uh, it's something we really pushed really hard through the office to get out to people that were having a tough time. It's been very successful for the county uh, to keep people current on their payments. That program is, is expected to come to a close in the next month or two. Um, so at this point, our delinquency rate hasn't changed. Okay, so I was thinking that um, it, regarding the incentive program, it's, is that something we don't really need because we don't need to incentivize people to be timely with their taxes, paying their taxes, or? Uh, wh which part is that? That, that incentive that Bonnie was talking about where you could get a discounted rate for paying your taxes online or, or anything like that. That was actually, that's a monthly payment installment. Oh, okay, instead plan, of. Plan, instead of just biannual. making the two payments. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, you could also put it in your house escrow. Yeah, and that, that's what we commonly see, right? That's, yeah. a, that's a large majority of those um, payments are done through their escrow. That's the easy no-brainer method. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, I think that uh, you guys are also suffering from some additional workload on, on you guys as well, and we appreciate your being able to charge through it. And, yeah. and uh, that's part of what I think is really good about the way we're, we've planned this this year. So we know about workloads and, and everything and how, how you're dealing with it. And, and that. We're busy, just like everybody else. We're bouncing all over the place. Um, we're working to fill vacancies. We're restructuring where we need to restructure with inside of the office. Um, we've got some legislative challenges coming uh, that are working their way through the Senate that could restructure a portion of the uh, land sales. So um, we're trying to be as proactive as possible in the office um, to make sure that we're able to, to accomplish right. those. What ways are they looking to restructure land sales? Just curious. So chapter eight, uh, which is a, a land sale where we would be selling to a nonprofit uh, organization. Uh, they're looking at making it so that we have to go through a chapter seven typical land sale, which has an increased costs uh, to the land sale, and then you'd be able to go through the chapter eight. And then there's some other things that they're looking at doing with the chapter eights where we would actually have to take any of the excess proceeds that aren't claimed and transfer them directly to the state. Well, that's a whole bunch of extra steps. <laughs> there's a few things there. So uh, we've got our challenges and we're working our way through them. 
trying to be proactive. Well, thank you very much for your time and your presentation, and thanks to all your staff as well, thank because you. now you have also a, a big engine behind you. We do. Keeping I'm the keeping the very coming. thankful for the staff, and I I failed to mention Katie Kale is our administrative fiscal operations manager. Yes, two, and she handles all of the budget, and so. Well, thank thank you for that. <laughs> thanks again, Tristan. All right, have a great you guys. afternoon. Okay, so we are <clears throat> ready for you, Andy. <laughs> Auditor controller, welcome. So we're not, let me see. There you Good go. afternoon, okay, Chairwoman Jones. Down the chairs, we haven't had that microphone on all day. I don't Members of the board, Karen, Daniel, Andy Sisk, your county auditor controller, uh, thank you for allowing me time to present uh, our budget. Uh, I always like to refer to our department as the non-sexy department because we're just <laughs> numbers driven. Uh, it's a very boring budget, and if you just go back to last year, it's almost like a replay of last year's budget. So with further ado, I will jump right into it. Uh, we can maybe jump to the next slide. It talks about the two cost centers that are in my office. Uh, we've got the Auditor Controllers Cost Center, uh, and we also have the Workday Support Org. Um, for those that, oh. thank you. There we go. Tristan doesn't have any supplemental requests. <laughs> uh, so the Auditor Controllers uh, budget uh, basically is funded by the general fund. Uh, then we've got the Workday Support Organization, which is an internal service fund where we charge our costs out to all the users. And I want to reinforce that we also charge our special districts and JPAs about 5 to 10 percent of the support organization's costs. Some of our accomplishments, um, and they're lengthy uh, this last year. Uh, again, we attended and continued the outreach to colleges and universities. Uh, we attended career fairs at William Jessup University, California State University, Sacramento. Uh, we were going to go to University of Nevada, Reno, but it snowed, so we weren't able to get up <laughs> over the summit uh, to do UNR, but they've got a good a, a business administration program there. Uh, we've been out and had meetings with Sierra College. We've been talking to their faculty. Uh, we're going to need a little more assistance from HR to kind of push forward maybe some kind of internship program with Sierra College and a partnership with them. Uh, to continue to build on some of the work I'm doing at Sac State. Uh, we attended the Meet the Firms event. This is where accounting students get a chance to meet firms, and usually it's the accounting firms, but they get an opportunity not only to talk to counties, but the State Controller's Office, Franchise Tax Board, to name a few. I also had the opportunity to speak twice to the Beta Alpha Psi group and the Accounting Society. So getting my foot in the door and talking to students a little bit more about what we do in Placer County, and more importantly, what we do in the accounting area, not just in my office, but we talk about accounting countywide. If you don't get up on a position in my office, you can go work for the sheriff, because they need accountants. I think I saw Morgan had a need for a senior accountant at the district attorney's office earlier today. Uh, and then we also participated in Youth and Government. Uh, that's a program that's being sponsored by HR. Uh, Placer High School uh, was the high school chosen. We did two tours. And we actually concluded the tour in the treasurer's vault. Uh, so we included Tristan in the, the tour that was done with the students. And I think they uh, got a little kick out of getting into the vault and seeing uh, what was in the vault uh, in the treasurer tax collector's office. Uh, we work very closely with the treasurer tax collector's office, probably why we all dress the same, right? Um, <laughs> we provided extensive education and training to our county users. Uh, I took the leadership role, provided four individual sessions on governmental accounting, budgeting, and reporting and workday. I also did a special training uh, with HHS to talk about revenue and expenditure recognition. I also rolled that same class out to all county uh, uh, employees on revenue and expenditure recognition. My staff are also taking a leadership role. I got my general accounting manager who's providing year-end uh, supplier contract roll forward. And you may think, what is all that about? Well, that's just rolling the contracts over from fiscal year to fiscal year. Once you're entered to a contract and you don't expend all the funds, you roll that contract into the next fiscal year. So we provided some training on that process because it's a very time-consuming, tedious process, but very important because you've got to get the numbers right. 
I have my financial reporting team that's going to be providing some specialized training on capital assets at the end of April. Capital assets are things like equipment, land, buildings, construction and progress. And then along with our external auditors and myself and my internal audit manager, we conducted some single audit training. Uh, the third bullet, successful financial internal audits. Uh, we're definitely proud of the fact that we're now 22 years running of excellence in financial reporting for our audit annual comprehensive financial report. Uh, we're also proud that we get the uh, achievement of excellence for Western Placer Waste Management Authority. I'll be making a presentation on Thursday to that JPA board to talk about that accomplishment. Uh, we've conducted a number of, I think, successful internal audits. Uh, one of which you just heard about uh, was the wrapping up of revenue services and the recommendation that revenue services division move in to the treasurer tax collector's office. Uh, we also did some extensive audits in, with the purchasing department. Uh, some of the outcomes of that, I think, will come to fruition in fiscal 25-26. Uh, that's a little teaser, but we'll see how that plays out over the course of this fiscal year. There's also been a number of department head changes, so internal audits is very involved with the DPW department head change, the CEDRA department head change, and more recently, the HR department change. So that keeps internal audits pretty busy. And last but not least, uh, we provide outstanding customer service to the public, our special districts, and JPAs. Uh, I thought I'd take an opportunity to share some of the training I do with some of my staff. I know last year I got in front of the board and talked about dependent special districts and e independent special districts. Well, now I'm going to take it a step further and talk about what's the difference between an independent special district and a JPA. So with an independent special district, you have a separate governing body that's elected by the public. JPAs are different because they're not elected boards. They are appointed by other bodies, and you must have two government entities to form a JPA. And many of you know, because you serve on some of those JPAs, uh, but please keep in mind, JPAs are not elected. They are appointed by members of the city councils or your board of supervisors, and you assign them to work or to be on the board of that JPA. I thank my staff all the time. Uh, they, again, provide excellent service, and I know what really resonates with them is when they get that type of acknowledgement. So thank you, Supervisor Gore, for the email you sent uh, to my financial reporting manager on the job well done for Golden Sierra Job Training Agency. That's just one sliver of the great work that my team does. Uh, I know I don't have my AFO here, Leanna Lipsmeyer, does a great job putting our budgets together for both the Workday Support Org and the Auditor Controller's Office. And I have to, of course, mention my assistant auditor controller, Nicole Howard. They're just very shy. They don't want to come present with me, so they'll let me do all the heavy lifting. So that's our accomplishments. Emerging issues, department priorities. Uh, the number one priority for me right now is returning the county to a low-risk auditing status. And this is why we and I am getting out training departments. We continue to have material weaknesses um, in our financial statements, and so anytime there's a material weakness, it triggers us into this high-risk oddity status. Uh, there's only so much I can do, but I am doing all I can do to, again, try to educate, train our users so that we don't miss material misstatements in our audited financial statements. When the auditors give an opinion, they are given an opinion, the financial statements are free of material misstatement. So that is our primary goal. If you sit on the Placer Conservation Authority Board, you will notice they are a high-risk auditee, but for a different reason. They, this is the first time they've had a single audit, actually the first time they've been audited as a JPA, but they had federal grant funding. So if it's the first time you've ever been audited with a federal grant program, you're automatically deemed high-risk by the federal government, just as an FYI. Keeping up with the demand for accounting and auditing services from county departments, special districts, and JPAs. Uh, this is why last year we had two supplemental requests to try to keep up with the workload that keeps coming our way. LESWA, Western Placer Waste, Placer Conservation Authority, now SSV EMS, which is Sierra Sacramento Valley Emergency Medical Services. Supervisor Holmes sits on that JPA board. Why are these JPAs important? They all must keep their money in the county treasury unless they decide to do what Pioneer Community Energy did and hire their own treasurer. So because they're in the treasury, indirectly, I'm impacted because then I must cut their checks, their warrants. 
This is what's happening with our fire districts. We are now bringing in South Placer Fire, Placer Hills Fire, Newcastle Fire, and we're currently working with Forest Hill Fire to bring them all into the county treasury as well, and then conversely, they'll be using the Workday application. Then we've got a, our cemetery districts, and uh, our cemetery districts are struggling. Um, they don't have a lot of resources, and one area they struggle is to find auditors. Uh, Tahoe City Cemetery still cannot find a firm to do their audit. Uh, Colfax Cemetery, I was the one that did their last five-year audit through June 30, 2019. They're going to need another five-year audit for, through June 30, 2024, and I'm sure Nancy Hagman's going to come knocking on my door saying, Andy, could you do our audit again? But that takes away resources from my internal audit division where we'd like to be going out and auditing departments. But this is the reality of it. I am going to work with our new CPA firm. We have a new CPA firm uh, starting with us in May. And I'm going to see if they could tackle Tahoe City Cemetery so I don't have to go out and do their audit. But if I can't get them to do it, then I will have to go out and do their audit because pursuant to government code, I need to make sure they're audited every year or in intervals as defined by government code 26909. Employee recruitment and retention. Oh, we're doing much better in this area. We still have a couple vacant positions to fill. Uh, we're constantly looking at the job specs. Uh, I've been taking a leadership role being a subject matter expert for many of these job specs, starting with the executive secretary that got converted to an executive assistant. I'm finally looking at supervising account and auditor. Uh, we've been looking at our analyst series, primarily in the Workday Support Org, but also could we have analyst positions in the auditor controller's office and we now have a property tax analyst and we're doing a study in the payroll division along the same lines. I know the next step for classification and comp studies, I know we just did managers and that came before your board recently. I know the next wave will be our professional staff, which I have a vested interest in because that's senior accountants, accountants, senior auditors, um, and I'm hoping that we will outsource that work as opposed to keeping that work in-house because I know the management comp study, classification study was done in-house I think it would be better use of our resources to outsource that work. But that'll be a decision our new HR director will need to make. Last, uh, succession planning. Um, continuity of operations is really important to me. Uh, I've said it before, I think we're one of the model departments that really pride ourselves on succession planning. This is why I'm asking for certain positions below my manager so when my managers do decide to retire, we've got someone that can step in. And I think our office is viewed as experts. Uh, people come to our office because of the expertise, whether it's Nicole Howard, who's the expert on the TEEP, which is a travel employee expense policy. Uh, we get bombarded with questions. Property taxes, it goes without saying. It's a very complicated process. Uh, people come to us and rely on our expertise in that area. The work continues to get more complex. It's more analytical. Uh, Heard Morgan talking earlier, I kind of wrote this down. Uh, things take more time, things are more complex. I, I can't agree more, and I, and I don't have any supplemental requests. I mean, I know he's asking for some deputy district attorneys, you have the sheriff asking for lieutenants. Uh, I just know the work continues to flow up the pyramid, up the org chart, and it flows up to my level. And, uh, and I, why I enjoy my work and I enjoy doing things, I also want to be able to take time off. Um, so again, Succession planning is very important, and that's what we're seeing. Even though we have technology, it's made us more efficient, it requires more analysis of the data, so you don't have people punching in things that you did in the early 2000s, late 90s, where you're doing key punching and, and looking at paper. Now those positions are at a higher level, require more analytical type skills, which is why we're looking at having more analysts in our office. People want immediate answers. I mean, it's just amazing you get an email, you get a request, and it's like, can you respond to me like right away? And if you don't respond within 30 minutes, they're calling somebody else in my office trying to get an answer. Uh, but that's the world we live in. I will close, um, again, thanking the board for the two positions I received last year. I know as I move forward to the slides, because these are just a bunch of numbers, yeah, my, you know, my whole budget is salary driven. So the increase in salaries is primarily as a result of the two positions 
the, the board granted to me last year. And then we also have an increase in our audit services contract going out to bid for a new audit firm. Uh, as I mentioned, we're a high risk auditee, so there's more federal grant programs that need to be audited. So that's the reason for the increases there. And then our positions are at 58. They were at 58 and 23, 24. So uh, this is just the way the budgetary process is kind of working right now. But we did fill those two positions, and they're both filled and actively working on special districts and JPAs. And it's great to have a dedicated internal audit manager as well, because that took up some workload off of myself and Nicole. Um, and last but not least, I, I do want to thank the board for recognizing the importance of having uh, the CPA designation for elected officials. Uh, this is something, uh, and I wish my prior boss could, she's watching, uh, 20 years in the making, we've been trying to, to get the elected officials pay for CPA incentive. Uh, I've said all along, this was never about Andy, this was about the position, and I've got six or seven CPAs in my office, and I'm hoping one of them will raise their hand and succeed me in the future. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, Supervisor Holmes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Andy. As you know, I've been on the audit committee since its inception, back in when Kathleen Martinez was here, and uh, she sought me out for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, I really enjoy uh, getting those updates about what's going on in the county and the important work that you do to make sure everything is above board and that they're uh, accountable. And I've got a shout out to Cole Howard for her exceptional work. Uh, and so I just want to thank you for uh, the work that you do and your office does. And again, it's comforting to me to be able to sit on that and understand what's going on. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Holmes. Supervisor Gore. Um, thank you, Andy, for your update. And I, I just want to say how much I appreciate the work you and your team do with the JPAs and special districts, and I know just of late, right, two JPAs, a new one, and then another one sort of changing our model. Um, and, and having you there to help give us the direction about how to do this well has been very helpful. So I appreciate that. I know it's a lot of extra work, and then at the same time, uh, we, we need your services to do the work that we're doing with the JPAs. So it's just really appreciated. Thank you, Bonnie. Supervisor Gustafson. I just wanted to echo what they've said, Andy, your team and your attitude to addressing this. No one ever wants to hear the word audit, right? <laughs> <laughs> and yet your office approaches it in such a great manner and really trying to be helpful to the various issues you take on and appreciate that professionalism and honesty and candor. You always give me your opinion. <laughs> um, and I value that. I value that very much. So thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Supervisor Landon. I will also echo what my colleagues have said, um, especially what Bonnie mentioned with the with LISWA and with the Landfill Authority. I know that those are um, big heavy lifts, so we really appreciate your work. And I also just want to say you do have amazing staff that are super approachable, always willing to answer questions. and. Um, that's really a reflection on you as a manager, I would say, because um, they do a great job. And so uh, thank you for all of your work. Thank you, Supervisor Landon. <laughs> and Andy, I would like to say um, that you're doing a great job. Um, but you mentioned the tour of the treasurer tax collector. I want to see what's in the vault in the treasurer <laughs> tax collector. When are we getting our... When are we getting our tour? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's kind of a, but um, and I'm glad to see you were part. You participated in Meet the Firms at Sac State. I know I mentioned it to every CEO that I spoke with in the last couple months or so. So I'm glad you got to do that. It was very. It sounds like it was profit. It was a good good outcome. Yes, I mean we're. I think the goal is just to educate students that you can have a career in the public sector. It's something I didn't know when I was a student at Sac State. It was all about working for the great eight at the time, and now we're down to the final four. It's just a joke I make, and it is <laughs> apropos considering it's March Madness, right? Yeah, and I, I also have to thank you for being conscientious about, you know, uh, making sure we're a low risk um, for audits and such. That, that to be commended, and to commend you on your tenacity and your dedication to numbers. I've never seen anyone quite so 
motivated by numbers and and thank you for that because it means a lot to us as the county and the board of supervisors as well so thank, thank, thank you, you very Suzanne. much for your presentation and and uh, i enjoy working with you well i appreciate all the compliments it all the compliments should go to my team of 56 58 positions uh, they're tremendous they do they come in do the work um it, it is you know boring and dry uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we cut so many checks a year, but people count on those checks coming. Uh, so, yeah, I can't thank my team enough uh, for all the great work that they do. And thank you for acknowledging not only myself, but my office. Yes, and now that you mention it, please do pass on our thanks to all of them. And I think you do an amazing job with Workday. That's another huge responsibility for, for you to do. And so thank you very much, Andy. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a great afternoon. Uh-huh. You too. Okay, so I think we're up for another 10 minute break. We'll call it a, a necessity break, how's that? <laughs> we, shall, we shall return in 10 minutes.
<laughs> Hold on, who's got a timer? Let's give you two minutes for that. Now I am looking at the time, though. Thank you, Chair Jones, uh, and good afternoon to you and to the other members of the board, to Mr. Chatney and to Ms. Schwab. I'm Laura Van Buskirk, your Director of Child Support Services, and I, before I go any further, want to say how excited I am to have my entire executive leadership team with me here today. So to my left is Assistant Director Tammy Euler, but I also have two new ladies in my, uh, on my executive team sitting right behind me, and they have both been in their roles promoted to the executive team within the past year for one of them, the other within the past month. So directly behind me is Kristen Mendes, who's our program manager as of late last year. And next to her is Taryn Uggen, and uh, Taryn was just promoted to AFO last month. So wow. she's brand new, and I'm really proud of both of them for being here. I'm happy to have Tammy here with me, mm -hmm. but this is old hat for Tammy, uh, especially since she's been acting director previously. It's brand new for the ladies behind me, and I just want to acknowledge them and say how happy I am that they are here um, as a part of the executive leadership team. Well, welcome to your, your executive board. Thank you for coming in today. Thank you, Chair Jones. So we're gonna dig right into it, and to begin, this slide just very simply lists our core services in the Department of Child Support Services. Um, establishment of parentage, establishing court orders for the support of children when they don't already exist, ensuring collections of those orders, and then also customer assistance, of course, and partnerships and outreach. I will point out, and I think I said this last year as well, because it's really important to me, uh, that while customer service and the partnerships and outreach are core services, they really reflect fundamentally how we do the other items that you see up there, the paternity establishment, the establishing of court orders, and then collecting on them. We know it's really important to treat our customers like human beings with dignity and respect and not as simply a financial transaction. And we know that it's fundamentally important as well to have really solid partnerships with our community agencies, with organizations, um, the human service organizations that can assist our customers. And we'll talk a little bit about that more in the slides to come. I wanna talk about accomplishments though, and so we'll talk about collaboration. You'll see it there as a second bullet point, but what I really wanna take a few minutes to talk about is our performance, because I was thrilled to find out um, I want to say it was just last month, so generally it's late February, early March that we get confirmation of where we fall statewide in the federal performance rankings. Remember again that the Federal Office of Child Support Services has five federal performance measures that they use, and so they're used state, I'm sorry, uh, nationwide to assess the health and success of a statewide program, but then California also uses those same measures to assess the health and success of a local county child support department. And for the fifth year now in a row, your Placer Department of Child Support Services has ranked number one in those federal performance measures within the state of California. 
Yes, that's wonderful. <clears throat> but I think we also need to point out who got to start the ball rolling with our first in, in uh, when Tammy, you were acting as deputy. Absolutely. Right. Yes, that number one. So, Supervisor Jones, you're absolutely right. You're pointing out um, that I inherited a very <laughs> high-performing team, right? I am not uh, blind to that. I am very well wow. aware and very grateful for the work, the groundwork that was laid when I came in and was fortunate enough to be hired as your director of child support services. A lot of the work had already been done, and so kudos absolutely to the team. These three ladies who are here with supporting me today were all there and a part of that team and a part of the laying that groundwork, making the decisions, making some changes, right. uh, personnel changes, training changes, communication changes, I mean, a number of different things that had to be that had to happen successfully, and we know change management is hard always, um, but they got through that and really, and got us to a number one place when I walked in the door. Absolutely, thank you for But you took that. over the leadership reins and you kept it going, so congratulations to all of you. Thank you. I, what I wanna say about this, I appreciate so much your recognition. What I want to really emphasize what sets Placer apart is not just the performance and the first four performance measures, which look at the paternity establishment, the cases that get established, and then collecting on current support and collecting on arrears paying cases. Those four are the first four. The fifth measurement, though, that the feds assess and the state assesses is cost effectiveness. And what distinguishes Placer, I think, a number of things, we occupy this very rare place and this very unique place within the child support program, not just in the state, but across the country, where we're both high performing in those first four measures and still cost effective. I would propose to you it's much more common to have a child support program that performs really well in some of the performance measures or maybe even all of the first four, but then they're not cost effective. Why is that? The, the performance measures don't exist in a vacuum. And what you do to drive an increase in one performance measure may very well negatively affect another performance measure. And cost effectiveness is the trickiest one of all because if you think about it, you could have a really high performing program in those four, first four performance measures, but if they're overfunded, if they're overstaffed, and that's the price that you're paying in order to get that performance, then your cost effectiveness is gonna be dismal. Does that make sense? Because you're investing a ton of money to drive that performance. Conversely, you can have a program, a child support program that doesn't perform well in those performance, those first four performance measures, but they're really cost effective. Why? Because they're understaffed, they're underfunded. And so they're gonna be cost effective because they're not putting a lot of money and they may not be receiving a lot of money to drive their performance, but it shows in those first four performance measures because they just don't have the resources they need. Maybe they don't have uh, the time and the training that they need to make sure those case managers are doing their jobs well. Whatever the reason may be, what I propose to you is it's very rare, not just in the state, but in the nation, to have a program where that secret recipe has been <laughs> figured out, where you're performing well and you're cost effective. And I do want to take a moment, I appreciate the board and Supervisor Jones taking the time to acknowledge our performance, but I specifically want to take a moment to recognize my executive team who's with me today, but also all of the folks back home, um, our case manager who's in Carnelian Bay and Tahoe, and the rest of our staff who are in our Rockland office because they are truly the ones who do the work. The folks behind me, our assistant director, these are the folks who really deserve the credit because they're the ones who are driving all of the efforts to make our performance exceptional and also keeping an eye, particularly the two ladies behind me, on cost effectiveness and ensuring that we're not performing well at the expense of cost effectiveness. And it is a rare and delicate and difficult, I would say, balancing act. Going back to the slide though, we haven't just performed, uh, we haven't just focused on performance, we've also focused on collaboration. And so I mentioned uh, from that first slide that, that the collaboration, the partnerships, the outreach, that we recognize in Placer Child Support Services how important it is to have really strong partnerships. And it's an area that we're really starting to focus on even more and continuing to grow. We've made a lot of efforts to increase our collaboration. I wanna highlight 
something very exciting for us that you may have heard about if you've spoken with Jarrett in IT, and that's that we very recently, as in just last month, March, so lots of changes in March, we just merged with the county IT department. So for a number of years, we maintained our own IT staff and we were not under the county IT umbrella. It's a project that, again, to Supervisor Jones's point, this started way before I became the director here, but we're really happy that after years of, of identifying this as a change that needed to happen, that we've been able to implement it. And she may not like me calling her out, um, so I'm not gonna turn around and look at her face, but I wanna tell you that Taryn, um, who I mentioned, right? So after 11 years now, um, it, almost 11 years, I think in June will be 11 years, with our department, she just became our admin and fiscal officer literally last month. But Taryn, largely led the merger effort on our side. Now the IT staff, Jarrett and his staff, deserve a ton of kudos for working with us, preparing us, helping us to get to this point to make it successful. But if I had to narrow it down to one person in our department who led the effort on our side on child support, it was Taryn Nuggan. And due to her technical expertise, her attention to detail, her emphasis, and her awareness of the importance of relationships, and that that cannot be missed, when you're managing a huge change in communication, it was a tremendous success. We actually, as a leadership team, st uh, stepped back a couple weeks ago and evaluated the merger, and we talked with the entire department and said, how did it go? And then out of, I think it was scale of one to 10, the consensus was nine. For me, it was a nine and a half. Things are always going to happen when you have that large scale of a change, but I can't imagine it could have been better on our side and I really just want to highlight Taryn's um, expertise and just the incredible job. And I know that she is turning probably bright red right behind me. And I'm so sorry, Taryn, but you deserve kudos for the amazing job that you did. And I hope that you will have excitement like I do because watching her execute that change makes me so excited for her in that role and for the leadership team, the executive team that we now have. I know really exciting, really fundamentally amazing things are in our future because of who are sitting in these positions. We didn't just have the merger though, uh, we also continue to partner with our friends at Placer County HHS, which I'm really happy about because you'll hear me talk a little bit later about some of the challenges we have in collecting. So we are continuing what was initially a pilot that we, um, we kicked off last year to provide employment services to child support obligors who are unemployed or underemployed. So that collaboration continues. We continue also to share our Rockland office space with juvenile probation. That's an agreement that we entered into with uh, Placer County Probation in 2022. And let me tell you, I cannot imagine a better fit. Those folks from juvenile probation, I wanna say, you know, I've been in the child support program for almost 20 years, and I've been in both the private and the public sector, and I've worked in places where it was more than just one department under a house, right, in one office together. It can be tenuous just coexisting, right, with multiple departments. I would suggest it can be more tenuous when you have your separate spaces and then you merge together into one office space. Really tenuous. I can't imagine a better change um, in combination to bring juvenile probation into our space. They have truly become a part of our family. Um, and I wanna just give a shout out to the assistant director over in probation, Brian Passenheim, sent an email to me and to Tammy, I wanna say two weeks ago, and acknowledged this and said how happy he was to have their staff sharing a space with us and how well we all get along and that we treat each other like we're one big family. So there's, uh, and he also talked about the positive energy. I can't believe the positive energy in your department. That is such an amazing thing for a director to get an email from an assistant director or a director in another department and to hear that I'm not just making things up, I'm not just seeing it through rose-colored glasses, right, but that truly we are functioning really well, two county departments together in one office, doing our separate work, but working together as a team with dignity, respect, kindness, compassion, all of these positive values that we want to embrace. And they really have, they've just melded into our office culture and it's a wonderful thing to behold. There are some other uh, collaborations up there. I wanna just highlight the Eastern Sierra one because it's important to note 
that we are um, providing legal services for them, which means one of our attorneys on staff handles their legal matters, attends their hearings as their attorney, um, does a lot of the answering of, you know, and fielding of the legal questions that come from their case managers. Their staff actually also participate in our case management meetings. We just had an all staff and a case management meeting earlier today. And so the folks from Inyo and Mono County, they attend virtually so that they can learn the Placer way and participate and benefit from our services. And we also sent our uh, one Tahoe employee, Dale Abbott, who's based in our Carnelian Bay office. Dale just recently went down to Eastern Sierra to help them out. Their director was out of country for a week. And so she reached out because we have this agreement with them, this MOU for legal services, and asked for some help. And so one of our experienced case managers took the time and made the effort to travel down to Eastern Sierra to physically be present in their office for that week to provide some training, some support, and to be there to help answer questions as they came up. And it's really become, I think, a part of the culture that we have embraced and that we truly value in the department. And so when I say embracing the future of the program, that's not just about how we treat our external customers, it's also about how we treat our internal customers, one another. We've done a lot of culture work to make sure that we have built and maintained a foundation of trust. As far as our external customers, though, it is also a culture of working with those individuals, not telling them what they have to do, what they must do, but understanding that they're human beings and not just a financial transaction, not just seeing them as they relate to a child support order, whether, they're, whether they are the person paying support or the person receiving support, but seeing them as human beings and trying to build a relationship with them, giving them choices, um, inviting them to be a part of the process, certainly explaining the process because we know the legal process can be really complex and confusing but it's about working with them and being flexible and understanding that their life situations are unique to them. And it's important to us that we treat them with kindness and empathy, with dignity and respect, that we hear them and that we respond accordingly. And again, I wanna thank the entire department because we just talked about this this morning at the all staff um, and I heard some feedback afterwards from some of the case managers. They're the ones who have embraced this model of kindness and empathy and of helping people. For a while there, I had this um, silly little hashtag here to help that we put on our social media. And while that might have been silly and kind of kitschy, I really wanted to drive home the point that we are a helping agency, that we are here to assist folks and not to punish them. And it is a change. It's a change certainly from where we started many years ago as a federal program back in 1975. The employees of the department have, without exception, adopted that model and embraced that model that we help people. And I think that also shows up. That's also a secret to our success and why we perform so well because of these relationships and our flexibility and our willingness to see people as people. I want to share with you a comment that was received just this month um, by a person paying support to the case manager in our office. Actually, it might have been last month now that we're in April. I think it was in March. So this person's ordered to pay support. They have a child support obligation. Our job is to enforce against them. So you might think, mm, it's gonna be a little antagonistic from the get-go, right? This person said, and I quote, as always, I truly appreciate all of the help that I receive from your office. Every time I call, I always get the exact answers that I need. Another person paying support emailed a case manager just last week to thank the team for treating him with patience and kindness. This customer acknowledged that he does not always reciprocate in kind, he doesn't always have the nicest words for the case managers when he calls, but he said, and he took the time to email the case manager after the conversation and conveyed his appreciation for the consistent service, the patience, and the respect that he gets from our department. And if that's not enough, just this morning, I learned of another customer who had been served. So you think about that. I mean, getting all of us, I, mean, I can't think of any of us who think, oh yeah, I would love to be served papers, right? This person was served papers. He called the case manager this morning and mentioned how much he appreciated our process server, who we work with through an MOU with the district attorney's office. So shout out to Morgan and thank you to you and your staff for support of our department. He actually had a great experience with our process server and wanted to acknowledge it and let the case manager know that he appreciated the information provided. Y'all, that does not happen. I would propose to you, I could probably count on one hand 
the number of times in an entire year across the entire country, in the child support program at least, where someone receives papers and their response is, thank you. But it happened just this morning with Placer, and it points to the way that we are providing services. We are committed to building a model child support department in this county where empathy, kindness, and respect are values of the highest priority, and it's really showing up now in the appreciation of our customers, and it's something that's truly just marvelous to behold as the director. And again, it's not just me. I can take no credit for it. It's the people who make up the department who are embracing this culture and providing these services in such a dignified and respectful way to our participants. We are, however, not without our challenges. It seems like I say that every year. Uh, and I've listed here at the top of this slide our funding stream. This is certainly not new, but it does remain a challenge, and I dare say the challenge may be a little bit more stark even this year because of the state of the state budget. Um, and so I, I list that here just to point out and remind you that the vast majority of our funding streams through the state. So while we receive an allocation uh, that consists of 34% 34, 34 of state dollars and 66% of federally, federally funded dollars, we do have limited options for additional revenue. And so we are trying to prepare. We've been talking about this since January um, of this year. And as an executive team, the four of us here have had a lot of conversations about trimming back our budget and recognizing that we may very well, at best, not receive additional funding from the state come July 1. And at worst, we may actually receive a cut. And so we're trying to prepare for that. We're trying to be cognizant of how we're spending money now, and we've been doing that since January. Uh, and really, I should say, we haven't just been doing that since January. In general, our focus is to be very careful, responsible stewards of state ta of taxpayer dollars. But we've been more diligent this state fiscal year, or I'm sorry, this calendar year, recognizing that the writing is on the wall and that we're not sure what that budget's going to look like when we receive our allocation from the state. And salaries are a part of that, right? So staffing is the other bullet there on that slide. Uh, because we know the staff, the salaries and benefits are the biggest part of our budget. There are precious few areas in our budget where we can cut without seeing a negative impact on our customers. And I just told our staff this morning, and I will continue to tell them, and we've told them for a long time, that we will not have layoffs. It has to be not even a resort for me because they do such good work they're so important to providing the services that we provide to our customers that I have to protect them and their salaries. And I can't let them be punished because of a budget situation that we didn't manage. And it does put us in a precarious position because I can't control the amount of money that comes from the state. But I don't want my team to worry about it. That's what the four of us are here for, to figure it out. We did it a few years ago. Very soon after I came into this position as director, after moving from Wyoming, we got handed a 5% budget cut. And I looked at Tammy and the other two members of the executive team at that time and said, we're not going to have layoffs. We've got to figure this out. And we did. But we're committed that if we're going to expect our team members, our employees, to treat our external customers with dignity and respect and kindness, that we owe it to them to treat them in a similar manner. And part of that means letting them know we're going to figure out the budget situation in a way that doesn't sacrifice their jobs. Caseload trends continue to decline. This is a statewide trend. It's not just a placer problem. So the slide says 200 cases roughly year over year have declined from uh, this state, I'm sorry, the federal fiscal year, end of federal fiscal year 23 compared to end of federal fiscal year 22 we were down about 150 cases. So as of the end of federal fiscal year 23, which would be September 30th of 2023, our caseload was 6,027. As of last week, it was just below 6,000. We see this decline. You've heard me talk about it before. And yes, it's a trend on the state and the federal levels within the child support program. What I want to convey to you in part is you can trust that that number of our caseload is a true number. And what I mean by that is we're not going to fudge our caseload in order to draw down more funding from the state. 
The Federal Office of Child Support Services gives child support departments across the country a number of closure criteria that tell child support offices when they should close a child support case. And those reasons can change. The most recent changes were made in 2016 and became effective in 2017. But the idea is that there are some cases where you are not going to see a result, or you have some cases, especially with 2016's new reasons, where maybe you shouldn't be spending your time trying to enforce from this person. And so an example would be someone who is long-term incarcerated, um, someone who has entered a long-term care facility and doesn't have any assets, is not employed, these types of things. An individual whose sole source of income is uh, Social Security, so SSI or even SSDI. These types of cases, the federal government has told us, are not efficient and that we're actually harming people by trying to collect through those cases, and so they've told us we should close those cases. They don't always get closed in every county. We're gonna close them in Placer, and we're gonna close them because the federal government has told us you should close these cases because we don't want you trying to collect from these individuals for whatever reason, and we want you to focus on cases where there is a higher potential for collection, and so we're gonna do that. Honesty and integrity are critically important to me and to our department and to doing the job that we do. We are well aware that we occupy a place of public trust and we know it is fragile and it is tenuous and it's something that we don't take lightly. And that means with every decision we make, we have to consider, are we doing the right thing? Are we acting with integrity? And so we're not gonna keep cases open just because we can get away with it and draw down more funding. The result of that is that you can trust our caseload that when we have 6,027 cases as of the end of last federal fiscal year, those were cases that can be worked under the federal regs. My other concern with the caseload is coming from an outside source that's telling us when we should not even try to collect. And so we do, we see this change. You know, I mentioned this morning to my staff at the All Staff, I began in this program in 2004, so 20 years ago. I was an enforcement attorney in an area that was impoverished, that had a high population of incarcerated individuals, people uh, with mental health issues that were being not treated, folks with substance abuse issues that were undiagnosed and also untreated. And our only option, if people didn't pay support, was to throw them in jail. And it was incredibly ineffective. It didn't help anyone. It just helped further draw the divide between the parent who was supposed to be paying support and the person who was supposed to be receiving support and the child. We didn't realize at the time we were not helping the child, and it's supposed to be child support. So we've come away from that side of the pendulum, and I support that. Our entire team supports that. We recognize we want to work with people. We want to help people. It's about helping them to become sufficient so that they can pay not just their support, but also take care of themselves as adults. It is about helping them, though, to support their children. And I'm concerned that both at the national and the state level in particular, in an effort to make the program more attractive, in an effort to diminish that old reputation that we had of either, either you pay or you go to jail, I'm afraid we have swung way over here to the other side of the pendulum. And I think if we're not already seeing those effects, we're going to start seeing the impact. Yes, we have a reputation in this program nationwide of inflexibility, aggressive enforcement, throwing people in jail if they can't pay support rather than helping them. That's where we were over 20 years ago. The program needed course correction. And I've been one of the people at the national scale arguing for it, pushing for it, pushing for a program that's built on respect and dignity and empathy and human kindness. But as with many large scale system changes, I am very concerned that particularly in this state, our pendulum has swung so far that we are now limiting our collections capacity and we are making it more difficult for my staff to do the work that they do to collect support from the persons who are supposed to be paying it. Limitations have been imposed by state policy, by state legislation that hampers our ability to collect. 
And so it's through things such as liens and levies where we're told, oh, they have to have a certain balance in the account. Oh, they have to have a certain arrears balance. They have to fit this criteria, that criteria, and it's a policy decision. Or you cannot do a lien on that case. You cannot attach a bank account if they don't fit these criteria. So imposing these restrictions, driver's license suspension is not anybody's favorite enforcement tool. I get that. And it's important people be able to drive to get to work to take care of their kids. But I know that Kristen would tell you, my program manager behind me, driver's license suspension notices are one of the tools that we use to get someone's attention if they've been avoiding us for years and years and not paying their support. A lot of times that notice is the one thing that gets them to sit up and take notice and call us. And then we can build a relationship with them. Then we can talk with them about making sure they don't lose their driver's license, but that they also support their children. That enforcement remedy is being heavily restrict, restricted based on income. And so if the person paying support, or not paying support, but who's obligated to pay support, is at 70% of the poverty level of the average income in the area where they reside, then they cannot be certified for driver's license suspension. Just across the board, it won't happen. Even if they haven't paid their support for their children in months or years. It's simply been removed as an option. I just had a conversation, Tammy and I both, on Friday. We're at the Northern Region Directors Meeting for the Child Support Program in this state. And just became aware that there's talk about wanting to remove our ability to report delinquent obligors to the credit bureaus. I'm sad to say I was the only, correct me if I'm wrong, Tammy, I think I was the only director who spoke and said I do not support this. I don't want people I don't want to harm people. My entire department, the people who are here with me today, we don't want to harm child support obligors, but we also want to help make sure that children are getting the support that they need. And we recognize that while we do our best to build these relationships and try to be flexible and work with people, there's a small segment of the population who's not going to pay. And it's really sad, but it's the truth. I don't know of any office in my 20 years in the program who has 100% of current support collections for children who are under the age of 18 who need to be supported. It doesn't exist. And so there is this segment where we need some tools. And what really scares me is we are voluntarily in this state, and in some other states too, it's not just California, agreeing that we're going to completely remove these enforcement avenues. <coughs> we support doing the right thing. We support empathy and kindness. Hopefully I've assured you of that today and in my previous presentations. But we are the child support department. And I fear that in the efforts to rectify one wrong, to get us away from over here where we were 20 plus years ago, with that overzealous enforcement, we have overcorrected. And a new wrong has emerged. And now we're over here at the expense of children. Give you a moment to just let that sink in mm -hmm. while I get some water. Thank you so much, Supervisor Holmes. Going to our objectives and performance measures, despite the limitations being imposed, we do try our best to serve our customers as well. Our objectives and the performance measures mirror the five federal performance measures, and so I won't go over that again. You already know we're knocking those out of the park, ranking number one in the child support measures for the fifth year in a row in this state. Our cost effectiveness did decline from $4.14 to $3.88 this past federal fiscal year. It's important to note that that's also a statewide trend. And even with the decline, we still ranked number three in the state in cost effectiveness, with the number two counties' cost effectiveness exceeding us by only one cent per dollar expended. Remember just very briefly from that accomplishment slide earlier that I mentioned what a delicate balancing act that cost effectiveness piece is with the other four performance measures. Well, guess what? The county that ranks number one in cost effectiveness for 22-23 does not perform well in that other, the other four federal performance measures. They are at $4.14, but there's something missing there. Um, they may be underfunded or maybe just un not managing those resources well because while they're cost effective, they're ranked number 25 in the 47 local and regional child support agencies in the state. I also want to point out to you, I asked Kristen uh, earlier 
in preparation for today to do some calculations for me. And I asked her, Kristen, what would our cost effectiveness have been for end of federal fiscal year 23 if we had been allowed to execute on those liens and levies like we normally would do? Without those additional state imposed restrictions, our cost effectiveness would have been $4.01. Just 12, 13 cents per dollar below the most cost effective child support office in the state. So we're already starting to see an impact from those limitations on our collection efforts. Now I know I'm running short of time, so I'm gonna jump ahead here and just say that moving to our budget, our projected 24-25 budget is around 7.5 million. We have zero capital expenditures. So again, like I just mentioned, our working budget for 24-25 is $7.5 million. Keep in mind that budget figure accounts for all positions in the department. We do not fill all of those positions because again, we're gonna act with integrity and honesty and we're only gonna fill the positions that we need to operate and to maintain our exceptional service delivery. It's important to note as well, our final allocation, again, because it comes from the state, right? It's not finalized until a couple of months from now, a few months from now. It won't be finalized until after the governor has adopted the budget for the next state fiscal year. Typically, we receive our final allocation from Cal DCSS in late June. As I've spoken about the state budget, because of the situation, we do not anticipate an increase in funding from 24, 24, or for 24, 25. You can see in our expenses here, we are trying to decrease costs where we can Please trust that we are ever mindful that the state budget situation is precarious and it's important to us that we manage those taxpayer dollars responsibly. I don't have any major variances to report for 24-25. Um, as I just spoke to our FTE, so these are the funded positions that we have available, 47. As of the end of March, uh, CSS currently has 35 filled positions. So. 12 positions that are not filled. We are going to uh, try to do a recruitment. I just found out this morning that HR has approved our recruitment, so we're working on that to fill some of our vacant CSS positions. We have a senior CSS position that we're gonna fill very soon, but we are not going to fill those 47 positions. Number one, we don't expect getting the funding from the state, quite honestly, to be able to support those salaries and benefits. But number two, right now, given what our caseload is, we don't have the work to support 47 positions, so we're not going to hire for them. And the last slide, we have no supplemental requests of the board. I feel like I'm kind of ending on a sour note here with all this talk about the state budget and limitations from the state, but I hope I've left you with a, a picture, an honest picture of what it is that we're facing because we do have some significant and scary challenges facing the child support department. What I wanna leave you with though is of course the high note that this department, I assure you, is filled with dedicated public servants. They are truly trying to do their best to serve the constituents of Placer County and to do it with kindness and compassion. And it is truly my honor to be their director and to appear in front of you today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for bearing with me. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you for your presentation, Supervisor Holmes. Thank you, Laura. If this were an, a job interview, rest assured, you've got the job. <laughs> Thank you, Supervisor Holmes. <laughs> and I appreciate uh, sharing all your success with your amazing staff. That's, that's important and you recognize that they're the ones that are behind you trying to make sure that your department does what, what, five years in a row? Five years in a row now, yeah. yes, so at number congrats, one. Congratulations to that. So whatever you, you need, let me know. Thank you, Supervisor Holmes. <laughs> Any other questions, Supervisor Gustafson? Oh, I just, I wanted to echo what a great job your team has done. You make us proud. Um, our residents, our community is so um, lucky to have all of you being so dedicated to, to doing this to protect our children. I, um, on your outreach budget, you do have a function there on outreach. I'm always interested in how we get the word out to women who may not know or men. Right. That it's not just women, yes. Right. That there is help available um, because I myself went through a situation in which I had a, a father of my son who did not want to pay child support. And it was easier for me to walk away 
than it was to get the assistance I needed to, to fight. And so I was in a position where I could take care of myself and my son and move on with my life and get a career. But not everybody has that. And I really want to hope that our outreach efforts can help um, further the knowledge that men or women might have in those circumstances where they have to choose their child or the child support, right? That Absolutely. Was, that was the option I was given. We, so we now have an outreach, a dedicated outreach team, which is something we didn't have a few years ago, uh, who's working together to really take advantage of these opportunities to appear in the community, to work with other agencies uh, and organizations to make sure that our presence is known. There are a number um, of events throughout the year that we are now showing up at. Um, we did a trunk or treat. I think it was, yeah. was it Trunk or Treat that we did? Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of the Child Support Awareness uh, Month event. And we actually invited the public last year. We gave out, we had our usual backpack drive and gave those backpacks out, but we had a whole event in our parking lot with games for kids to play. We had snacks and treats. Um, we had the, so we had, I think there were three little puppies from, Anil, from Placer County Animal Services that really were the hit of the day among not just the kids who were attending, but among my staff. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a great event. And so I agree with you. We need to do more of that. And that's one of our focuses over the next year is to make sure we are active in the community, that people know that we're available and that we're here to help. I do think we had to lay some of the groundwork first of no longer being that punishing agency. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Because no one wants to be treated hostily. No one wants to be a part of a program where they feel like they're gonna be punished or berated for their life choices. And so we've had some important work to do there, but I really do think we are in that position now where we can continue to capitalize on our relationships with other organizations and agencies and engage in those events. The other thing I would say to you is please, if you have something specifically in your district please let me know and I will either come out personally or one of us here or some of our caseworkers will be happy to go out and talk about what we do. We do those events throughout the year, but we always do more. I absolutely agree with you. We know one of the statistics that I um, quoted to you last year was about the number of children who are living in a household with only one parent in this country. And it's the highest rate in the world. I believe it's, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe it's three times um, the rate in other countries, it was 25% wow. in 2020. And that's the, that's the only data I have in my head right now. I don't know if there's been research since then, but 2020, 25% of children in the United States were living in a home with one parent. I promise you we're not seeing all those cases come through our doors to receive services. But those are some of the cases where we want to reach out to folks. I do have concern that we can help people, but they either don't know that we exist or they are just willfully choosing not to access our services. And another part of that, for that last segment there, for the folks who, like you, are having to make a really tough choice, we are working toward being more flexible in the services that we offer. And that is, to the credit of the state, that is something that Cal DCSS is supporting as well. Flexible case management, so that it's not all or nothing. By signing your rights, you're assigning your child support rights to us, you're not saying, oh, do whatever you want. In the past, that's absolutely what it was. It was, here's the case, and then you all get to decide, and I have no say. So we are at an exciting place where we are understanding our parents who are supposed to be receiving support need to have more say. We need to be careful with that because we know domestic violence is a reality in our society, and we don't want to put someone who may be a survivor of domestic violence in the difficult position of being able to turn off or on enforcement so we've got to make sure that we have a staff who are really well trained to understand domestic violence, to screen for it, and to speak to our customers about it because we don't want someone to have their life harmed or their children's lives harmed by virtue of participating in the child support program. It's very complex, the number of things we have to think about and prepare for, but please be assured absolutely we are having these conversations and taking steps to make sure that we're engaged in the community and that people know we exist and that we're here to help. Well, I think a lot of the testimony you've provided today we can share in our newsletters and other opportunities where somebody might just read something and realize there is hope for them and they should reach out, so. Absolutely, Thank I you. love that. And whatever, if you need uh, a snippet, if you need a quote or anything yep. to share in your newsletters, please reach out. We're happy to help with that. Thank you.
Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, Supervisor Landon. Thank you. Thanks and great work to you and all of your team. I just have uh, one follow-up question to her question on outreach. Do you work with nonprofits and organizations like Acres of Hope and Stand Up Placer, those types of groups? And uh, I'm assuming you do, but just we wanted do. to check. We do, and we have. It's been a couple years now since we went up to Acres of Hope, but we actually got to tour the facility. We've worked with Kids First, Stand Up Placer, and those are areas where absolutely our outreach team in particular has identified them to not just continue the work that we've done in the past, but to really bulk up those efforts to make sure that they know how we can assist. Of course. Any other questions? I want to thank you all. Thank you all for coming and thank you for your hard work. I know it is, it, it has to be hard work and your accomplishments are really, they're wonderful. Can't thank argue. you so much, Supervisor Jones. Can't argue with success, right? But thank you for thank taking you. the time and your presentation and everything so much. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Have a great afternoon. So I was, um, we are having a little switcheroo this afternoon. Instead of HR, we're having um, libraries. So welcome. <laughs> welcome, Mary. <laughs> That's okay. Maybe last but not least. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, Chair Jones and members of the board. I'm Mary George, your Director of Library Services. Thank you for your time this afternoon as we celebrate the library's accomplishments and present the library budget. As we plan for the next fiscal year, I want to express my gratitude for the support of your board and for the um, expertise of both Dan and his CEO fiscal team and Daniel and his um, CEO team, thank you very much for all your help. A big thank you, most of all, to all the library staff who in one way or another diligently labor every day to transform the library fund into books, DVDs, streaming services, databases, technology offerings, excellent programs, inviting library spaces, and first-rate customer service. County Library Budget has one cost center and four programs. Collection services includes materials management division where library materials are ordered, delivered, and processed in library mobile service. Community services, which captures the time that staff dedicates to supporting the library's partners and stakeholders, including the Friends of the Library, Literacy Support Council, and the Library Advisory Board. Library services is the time spent by staff engaging library users by connecting them to materials, information, and programming like story times, book clubs, technology classes, summer reading events, and so much more. And then finally, literacy services represents staff-led initiatives throughout Placer County that reinforce efforts to improve literacy skills for low literate adults and their families. <clears throat> I'm very proud to tell you about several accomplishments that the library um, had this year. One is that we expanded public service hours in Forest Hill and Tahoe libraries. We added position allocations. The library added seven new positions to increase public service hours. Six employees were promoted, keeping department expertise and commitment to Placer County in-house while freeing entry-level allocations for the introduction of new faces to library services. All staff in Forest Hill and Tahoe had their hours of employment increased from part-time to full-time. Because of these efforts, we were able to extend hours in programming in Forest Hill, Kings Beach, and Tahoe City Libraries. Coming soon are increased hours in programming in both the Auburn and Rockland Libraries to include Mondays and half days on Sundays. Increased hours also means more opportunities to expand programming for all ages. Ensuring that the library in both Auburn and Rockland locations have enough staffing capacity to extend hours and programming is the library's number one priority in the coming fiscal year. The library also redesigned its website 
In October of 2023, the library's website was updated to a more intuitive and user-friendly customer experience. An improved website checks off several goals for the library, including it addressed a recommendation of the 2020-2021 Placer County Grand Jury to improve library website offerings. It reinforced your board's critical success factors for innovative and integrated county services by strengthening library IT's expertise and its partnership with both county IT and county communications who helped design, edit, and market the website. The redesign proved to be cost effective by utilizing internal staff and the county's software program, Civic Plus, instead of looking outside the county for an independent website designer. It supported an initiative in the library's current strategic plan. And finally, it involved library staff, friends of the library, and the library advisory board, as well as customers in the design and the evaluation of the website. Feedback from stakeholders has been very positive, including appreciation for improved content for the visually impaired and heartfelt thank yous like, it's a huge improvement over the old site, way to go team. Two weeks ago, library administration relocated and consolidated with system-wide divisions, including library mobile service, materials management, library IT, and executive fiscal team formerly housed in the Auburn Library. The 6,600 square foot lease facility in the city of Rockland is already proving to be more efficient. Face-to-face -face communication strengthens support for all seven library locations with administrative managers and their divisions under one roof. Efficiencies of the consolidation and move are also occurring in the Auburn Library where room is now available to house new staff hired to provide more public service hours. In the next two years, the Auburn Library will receive a significant infrastructure upgrade to improve services and accessibility with system-wide services now housed elsewhere that will be limited system-wide service disruption through the construction. And finally, the Auburn Library Building Forward Grant. The Auburn Library Critical Maintenance and Modernization Project made possible by a $4.9 million Building Forward Grant from the California State Library and matching county funds of 4.9 million invest $9.8 million into the Auburn Library infrastructure over the next two years. The investment ensures that the 50 year old Auburn Library building is able to move confidently into the next 50 years of library service. Library administration is working closely with capital improvements to identify project milestones, track progress and report to your board and the California State Library our successes and our next steps. On Tuesday, March 26, your board authorized the Director of Facilities Management to execute step two with consultants Hamill, Green, and Abramson for architectural and engineering services. As we speak, the consultants are meeting internally to kick off this schematic design phase of the project. Thank you very much for moving this project forward. <coughs> The library's emerging issues and department priorities. Recruitment and retention of staff maintains or is continues to be a, a troubling issue for the library. It doesn't exactly keep me up at night, but I know that it keeps other people on my staff up. Um, shout out to Kelly Heikala, who really deserves all of the kudos along with a heroic effort from the Human Resources Department for helping us move through these recruitment and retention issues but I just wanted to share with you a few um, statistics and some observations. In 2023, the library with human resources ran seven recruitments and welcomed 26 new hires. 46% of the library department was hired in the past 16 months. Hiring can sometimes feel like a revolving door, particularly at the entry level library clerk position. It appears despite a ladder of advancement that library clerks are no longer becoming career Placer County employees and instead are often choosing to move on rather than advance to library supervisor. 39% of library positions are library clerks. Out of 22 library clerk positions, 11 of them were hired in the last 16 months. The last clerical recruitment had 232 qualified applicants, 209 of them in South Placer and 23 in Tahoe. 
September held the highest vacancy rate for the library at 21%, and for the past six months, 25% of the library management team has been vacant. Thanks to an incredible HR support team and liaison in the library, Kelly Heikola, our vacancy rate is approximately 4% today. Whoops, sorry. Oh, now I'm just moving through slides like a crazy person. Okay, now, I'm, now I've killed everything. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the library um, facilities infrastructure. Thank you. Um, in the coming year, library administration will begin a new strategic planning effort for 2025-2030. One of the goals of the next strategic plan will be to add a library facilities um, master plan component. Thoughtful strategic and fiscal planning should assist the department with moving forward on some of the planning um, that we need to do with capital improvements and some of our maintenance needs as our facilities age. And then in addition, we, um, Supervisor Gustafson has said this many times, we need a Tahoe vision, some vision for the way that our library service can improve um, in the Tahoe area. Both Kings Beach and the Tahoe City Libraries really lack adequate space to meet um, our customer demand for service and programming. And the department will continue to work with the Tahoe CEO team and community to develop a vision for how to improve library services in the basin. <clears throat> okay, I think I need to be at my objectives and performance just go measures. Just go back. Okay, yeah, there we were. Gosh, I'm sorry. Okay, our objectives and performance measures. Um, the library's objectives exist to strengthen your board's critical success factors by prioritizing services that our communities value from their public library, including up-to-date collections, easily accessible e-resources, enriching and entertaining library programs, a robust and intuitive website, and increased public service hours. Our performance measures, library administration continues to strategically allocate the library fund to increase customer use and satisfaction with our libraries. Successes shown here are in increased programming offerings, visits to the library, and use of both physical and electronic resources. The library has an operating budget of approximately 10.5 million with no money budgeted for capital expenditures at this time. The library fund has relied traditionally on fund balance carryover, typically due to salary savings, to cover the gap between revenues and expenses. The $300,000 shortfall in the working budget seen on this slide represents the same gap between revenues and expenses the library has, has seen for a decade or more. Increased revenues are assisting and offsetting increased expenditures with a general fund contribution that remains flat. The major variances in the library department um, are special department expenses, where we budget for library collections, processing, programming expenses, and everything we need to serve our public. This year, we increased the library materials budget by $50,000 for a total of $650,000. Rent for the Warren Drive location in the city of Rockland um, shows the increase of $132,000. And then the next two variances are increases to staff to extend hours in most of our libraries. Finally, the library recognized an increase in estimated property tax revenues. There are 49 um, position allocations, or I'm sorry, 56 position allocations from 49 this year. Bless you. We have no supplemental requests. And I am happy to answer any questions you may have or mess anything else up that you would like me to mess up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your presentation. Supervisor Holmes. Uh, thank you, Mary, for your presentation. Um, 
it was last year we closed the Penryn Library. Have you heard any feedback? I haven't heard anything from anybody. Uh, I haven't heard anything. I'm, okay. I'm hoping that they're using library mobile service and I'm hoping that they're going to the libraries where we showed you that are close by them within yeah. that five, 10 mile radius. Okay. Yeah. Good. Our statistics prove that or show that a bit. Yeah. And um, in fact, I just heard that the Penryn Friends of the Library are, are dissolving uh -huh. and they're giving their funds to the Literacy Support Council. Oh, so good. they're continuing to support the Placer County Library despite the closure of their library. Good, that's good to hear because I, I haven't heard anything. And Yep. And neither is Beverly, so. Not good. All right. Good. <laughs> okay, Supervisor Gore. Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, thanks for your hard work and passion. It's great to see the Auburn Library um, project moving forward, and really good to hear that y'all are already in the new space in Rockland and that it's working well. So I think that'll make a big difference as you do the um, renovation, but that's really good to hear. And it looks like it, well, it sounds like it's a good space, so I'm pleased to hear it. It's a really nice space. I hope you can all come to visit us there and, and just take a, a peek. We also have a conference room that you can use anytime for MAC meetings or we're gonna have the library advisory board meet there for any county organization that would like to meet. And um, at some point we would like to open it up for public use as well. Okay, and Supervisor Gustafson. I, I wanna thank you, Mary, and your incredible staff um, transitioning, moving offices, trying to oversee a major capital project and increasing hours and filling vacancies. That's a lot of great accomplishments for a year. So kudos to you and your team and continuing to serve our public so well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for your presentation and thank you for your continued hard work with our libraries and everything. Um, as Supervisor Gustafson said, you, you've, you've done a great job with the libraries. And, Thank you. And so we're all very proud and, and happy to support you. Well, we've all done a great job. You all did a wonderful job of supporting us last year, and we just want to make you proud with the allocations and the funding that you've given us. So we will do our best this year to realize the things that we want to get done. I think you've worked a little bit of magic because you have increased hours and stuff, huh? <laughs> so that's a good. I just think those recruitments are incredible. You know, I mean, that's um, for a department to turn over everyone that works there, or at least half of the people that work there in 16 months is, um, you know, pretty heroic effort. So. Exactly. Well, congratulations and thank you. Thank you. For all your hard work. Thank you. All right. Okay, that brings us to the close of today's business. Mm -hmm. So and tomorrow we will be, we'll start at 10, I believe, and not nine o'clock, because we have the, the little pinning, the pinwheel ceremony in the morning. So anyway, thank you all for attending. Thank you. Our meeting is adjourned. <laughs>